IB Nation, welcome to the Irish Breakdown Podcast. We are live here on a Friday, one day away from Notre Dame taking on North Carolina State at 12 o'clock Eastern time, which means we're here for Friday. Free for all mailbag. Welcoming everybody in. Ryan Roberts, Brian Driscoll. Brian, of course, out covering the game down there in the NC. And uh, it's going to be a fun weekend. Notre Dame obviously has a big test in front of them. We dove deep into the game, including keys to victory, some game balls we gave out yesterday, did predictions. So if you didn't catch that show, make sure you go back to the stream or on your favorite podcast platform and give that a listen because we really broke down that game extensively. So make sure you get into that. But we don't want to waste too much time here today because we are starting the show. and We have upwards of 50-something questions already started. So it's going to be a busy day. It's going to be a long podcast. We're ready for it. I got my water. Brian's comfortable. Brian. I'm good to go, man. Unless you have yeah. anything you want to open us with. I'm no, ready man, to I'm go, ready to go. Man. I got like fighter jets flying over my head. Nice. I got it's just nice. been internet's been going in and out, man. It's just been one of those days. But you know what they say, Ryan? Rule number 76, man. No excuses. Play like a champion. So today we're going pod like champions. So let's get her yeah, done, man. Let's, yeah. Let's dive right into us, it, man. Huh? Getting uh, pulled over by cops. No internet. Nothing know, stops man. us here. But so, you know yeah. what? We're rolling, buddy. We are That's absolutely it. rolling still. So let's That's let's it. get this thing rocking and rolling. So you go ahead and turn your chat off, Ryan, so you don't get mad. And we're going to just get this thing rocking. And rolling. <laughs> as long as nobody brings up uh, what was what was the, the com- conversation yesterday it was quarterbacks, right? Yeah, yeah. it's always fun. Yeah, uh, Caleb Williams, he couldn't help Notre Dame. Yeah, oh yeah, he could. He Who wants Notre that Dame. guy? Yeah, agree. Yeah, he paints his fingernails. Jack with the super chat to get started today. Hey, can, guys. can I can I say something about that though, real yes. quick? Sure. This is why what he did was so unfortunate. Yeah, because there's this there like if you're a Notre Dame fan and your only experience with him is that game. You're sure. going to have an opinion of him that I understand is negative because it was sure. a very stupid, immature thing to do. And that's why I get so pissed off at, you know, like the coaches around him. Like, you guys got to like, hey, man, this this like I know that you need this like for motivation or something, but like write it in clear ink or something like that. Right. Like sure. because that's not everything that you and I hear about who Caleb Williams is. But this is why it's dumb to do things like that, because to a lot of people, that's the only impression you've left on them is that that immature, silly, petty act. And now you've got people thinking that that's who you are. And that's why people say the things that they say, and they don't realize like this is a kid that's donated tons of his NIL money to his teammates, to other people, to charities and all that type of stuff, who's known as a hard worker and a good leader and all that kind of stuff. But but it's his fault. He did it, right? Say, well, you shouldn't judge someone on this, but that's the, that's life, yeah. an impression on people. And how are you, what, what impression do you want to make? And that's the one he made on people. And it was a very silly, immature one. And so I, I, I did want to comment on that because I understand why some people feel that way. And to a degree, he brought it on himself. But the reality is, is that kid's an exceptional quarterback that a lot of people are going to be wanting on their team next year yes. in the yes. National Football League. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that at all. all. Right. You are now correct. we can rock and roll with these questions. <laughs> Sounds good. We had our first question, which was a super chat from Jack. Jack, thank you so much. That hey guys, would you ever consider having the wives of Irish Breakdown do a show on here? Give us a chance to hear from your better halves. Ha ha, go Notre Dame. My I wife don't, would never do it. She I don't think mine would either. Uh, yeah. My my wife likes when we talk about her. So yeah. like she uh, she was watching the show yesterday. She, she may be watching today. Hey baby, love you. I don't think she would want to do something like that. To be honest with you, um, nor nor do I think I would want her to kind of. You know, like I don't mind talking about my wife and all that kind of stuff, but like, you know, like there there's some stupid people out there, and I wouldn't yes. want to subject her to some of that stuff, nor would I want to su- subject your wife to that type of thing. It's funny because Caitlin would actually do really well on a football podcast because she actually knows football very well, especially mm-hmm. for a woman. Like she knows it very, yeah. very well. Um, but I don't think it's something that she'd be passionate about talking about, sure. right? So like maybe if she got invited on like a crime junkie podcast yeah. or like a teacher podcast or like something like that she might she might dig that but that's not really her 
it's funny because like she's not really the, the public speaking type either, which is kind of weird because she's a teacher, but uh, it's another conversation for another day. But my wife would actually do pretty well. Like she'd be able to talk to you about Sam Hartman and the other players on the team and talk to you about the importance of X, Y, and Z from a football perspective. Like she, she knows ball, but yeah, I don't think she would want to do it either at all. If you want to get to know my wife, you got to come to a podcast or you got to come to a tailgate. So yeah, she's an, she's an in-person only, only, uh, <laughs> Per, you know, meter. So, yeah, I, I don't think Caitlin likes the spotlight on her yeah. either, which is like another thing that she doesn't want the podcast stuff. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason Tom, Jason Smith said today's my birthday, and luckily I have a great girlfriend that knows Notre Dame has a big game this weekend. So supposedly people were trying to come over tomorrow around lunch to do a little party, but she shut it down. I would have been so aggravated. Um, th- that's awesome, right there. I mean, that's a good lady, right there, Jason. That's a really, really good lady. Uh, but happy birthday, man. Happy birthday to you. I hope that uh, Notre Dame can bring you home a victory this weekend for your birthday. You and Audrick Estime both had birthdays this week. And Billy Shrouth. And I think it was Leo Scheidler, one of the Scheidler brothers. I think it was Leo also has a birthday this week. So hopefully wow. they all get uh, birthday victories from Notre Dame this weekend. So yeah. there we go. I, I would tell Audrick Estime happy birthday in person, but he kind of scares me. So I don't think I'll say anything to him. <laughs> Wimp. <laughs> If I saw if I saw Audrey Gessbe just walk around a dark alley, I would walk the other way. And that's I'm completely transparent about that. Yes, your ordinary Joe with the super chat. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I've noticed that there are always a lot more of us watching than likes. Might there be any factors we can air out to assage whatever hesitancy there appears to be? I think it's a swage, a swage, swage? I think. A I'm swage? not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. Know. Never never seen uh, that word in my life. Some people just listen. Right. It's like, you know, we have 15,000 subscribers to the channel. We've told people, please sign up for the message board. We don't have 15,000 people on the message board. Uh, some people just listen and they don't interact at all. I mean, that's just kind of how they are. I, I, like the thing that, that gets me, it's like you listen. So you clearly like the channel. Yeah. You like the content to a degree, or you at least want the content to continue. Otherwise, why would you listen? I'm sure there are some people that listen because. You know, Ryan, you and I know that there are some people that listen because they want to jack our information. Other people listen because they dislike us and it brings them joy to, I don't know, yell at their screen or something. I mean, I, I know there's people like that. The vast majority of people are people that like the show. And if you like the show and you like, like literally if you like the show and then hit the like button, it's like that helps us a lot. A lot yeah. And and yet they just don't do it because some people just, uh, for whatever reason, those don't want to be bothered buy it to be honest with you so, but our number of likes is usually greater yeah than the number of people that watch it live the other thing too is the likes don't immediately tabulate right away so mm-hmm. like i'll see people say man there's only like 30 likes in there and then i'll go look at it and it's like no there's actually like 120 but for whatever reason it's they're not all showing up on yours maybe they show up on mine because i have the admin and i can see it but uh at the end of the day as long as you all keep watching that's the prime primary thing but yeah if you yeah. want to help us grow there's things you can do and hit the like button is one of those things but also commenting and engaging like that those are all yeah. things that drive the algorithm it's weird on youtube sometimes too because i have I obviously have the youtube app on my phone and i'm signed in on my laptop but sometimes depending what the link is it'll take me to the to the youtube but i won't be signed in anywhere so like you can't like and stuff on the videos because you're not signed into any youtube channel i guess or youtube account which is kind of weird i i I would say here too there are two very different demographics of people that watch podcasts sometimes or listen to podcasts there are ones that love the show to your point brian and the other ones that just like are like i hate these guys i want to keep listening so i disagree with everything which is just so funny that people do that but i really but if if we get like i think our let me see what the numbers were for our last post game show for example so our, our last post game show had let me go to the live. Our last post game show had let me see here. Where is it? That's the mailbag. Fourteen thousand views. The Tennessee State one had fourteen thousand views. I think we went over twenty on the. We were at nineteen for the one from before, in, in the Navy game. And so you look at those fourteen thousand views, and then we had on the fourteen thousand we had. Let me pull up the likes here real fast. This thing is. Is not going. So it had 615 likes. I didn't like it either. And now it's got 616 likes. Uh, the reality is, Ryan, is, you know, the majority of the 14,000 that watched like it, watched it because they wanted to be, you know, to hear whatever topic we were discussing. 
it's yeah. not necessarily everyone that is like a supporter of the channel. It's just they enjoy the content, which is something I it's okay. Like that's that's fine. So I just there there's the other thing is you just can't put all of it into one thing. Like if we do this one thing, we'll get the same amount of likes that we get. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Some people just sure like a product, but just don't engage with it at all. Or some people are, you know, maybe they're listening to it on their phone as they're driving and, and can't reach. I mean, if you're driving, I don't want you to reach over and try to find the like button, keep your eyes on the road. You can listen to us. Right. I mean, so at the end of the day, as long as you guys are still watching the content, I'm good. I'm, 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 good. I'm a very picky that. liker too. Something has to be excellent for me to like it. If it's just good, it doesn't get a like for me. All right. It needs yeah, to be excellent go. content. Well, that's which no is why I like every content is, video. Yeah, so. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there was one, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I wasn't going to like that we did this week, but uh, that wasn't because of us. So. <laughs> oh yes. I know exactly what you're talking about. I, <laughs> yeah. I have texted uh, someone that works at Irish Breakdown as well about that, which was hysterical. Yes. Hey, give me yeah. a good laugh though. They give me a good laugh. Yes. Uh, Big Hoss with the super chat. Thank you so much. Long time listener, first time commenter. Well, thank you. Just want to say how much I appreciate you guys talking about Notre Dame football. Weather update for tomorrow. And last I saw Ryan, and that was as of last night, uh, it was like 50% chance of rain. It'll be in the low 80s. I'm going to go check now and see if that's changed at all. Uh, the it said scattered thunderstorms last I looked as well. You know, it doesn't sound like it's going to be like a, just a heavy non-stop rain it, it look it's not going to be like it was in 2016 right i mean that's that's it's not going to be Thank bad God. and <laughs> like, yeah. the thing too is north carolina it's 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 not abnormal to have rain sam hartman's played in rain before the only the only thing about this one is it is a grass field so but yeah it says uh, it hasn't changed ryan scattered thunderstorms 44 percent between 44 to 48% chance of rain the entire game. And here's the key. The the projected wind is no more than seven or eight miles an hour, which is not strong. So those, those I always say this, right? I care more about wind than I care about wetness. And yep. the problem with the game in Raleigh in 2016 is it was during a hurricane. So it was very windy as well sure. as wet. Yep. So, and then we had another question down uh, kind of along the same lines, Ryan. It was about, um, you know, who from Irish one seven weather to Notre Dame's advantage or disadvantage this week, I always feel like the less talented team benefits. I've never really understood why people think that. I think it, it what, what tends to benefit is not so much the lesser team. It's if one team runs a style that is greatly more greatly hindered by weather. And we talked about this in the Navy game because there's supposed to be rain and there was some rain and drizzle and wetness at the Navy game and Notre Dame still ran the ball, threw the ball, did all those kind of things. I felt it hurt. Navy more because of the type of offense they run. And now if you're a team that likes to spread it out and throw the ball over the field and it's really wet and really windy and the other team is a lineup and play power football, then it's going to benefit them more than it is the team that throws the football. I, I think it has more to do with the style of play. Team. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're a small, fast team and it's a wet, really wet field yeah. and you're playing, you know, Notre Dame 1993, uh, yeah. advantage Notre Dame 1993. Right. I mean, that's just that's kind of how I see it. So, yeah. Yeah. It's it's always it's always weird because I always see people say that it it like it creates a like a more even playing field. The great equalizer. The teams. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I don't I don't agree with that at all, because if it makes fast people slower, it's also going to make slower people slower. Like that's just got it. You know right. what I mean? Like, I feel like it's always still going to be that. Right. Gap like if you're sub four nine, you don't stay yeah. sub four nine regardless of conditions. Right. That's exactly. why I thought it was funny when people say, you know, the long grass at Notre Dame really slowed USC down. What well, didn't it slow Notre Dame down? Like, is there like a right, certain exactly. 40 exactly. yard dash time that tall grass no longer impacts you? Yeah. Right. I mean, I just, I've never understood that. I think that's in people's heads. I think that's hundred yeah. percent people's heads in my opinion. Now so somebody can present an argument to show that I'm incorrect, that the, the faster you run, the greater friction that you'd create in a certain surface. And that's, and it, it tends to cause you slow you down more. That there may be a physics argument that someone can make to me. I don't know what yeah. that is, nor do I believe it to well, be true, nor have I experienced that. I think the other thing that's interesting is like maybe so if you are like that spread it out team, right? And you know, trying to work in space a ton and then weather conditions hurt that, you maybe would have to play a slightly different style of football, right? Than you're typically used to. So maybe there's discomfort for playing maybe slightly different. Like if I'm a I, I was thinking about like Steve Slayton, for instance, right? If I'm Steve Slayton and it's like today is not the day to run outside zone and to get on the edge. 
maybe I have to be more of an inside runner just because I don't have to, I'm not going to be able to outrun the corner consistently and then cuts. Maybe I have to be a little bit more, maybe that just kind of, maybe that is the great equalizer to preventing a certain style from being the style that you have to be that day. If that right. makes sense. Maybe. Yeah. But that, but know. that goes back to the argument I was making as well, which is it's more about the style of play you have more right. so than the lesser talented team. You know, that's that's why I've never felt like Notre Dame was has that's what made what Brian Kelly did in 2016 so stupid. Because it's like you have this big physical offensive line. You had Quentin Nelson, Mike McGlinchey, Alex Barr, Sam Mustafer, you know, four NFL players, and you decided you wanted to throw the ball about 30 times in the middle of a hurricane. Instead of just saying, Hey, let's line up and let's play big boy football. Got Josh Adams at running back, got Dexter Williams at running back, got Tony Jones at running back, got a 240 pound quarterback that can run. Let's just let's just grind it out and just um, eventually break off a big run because we got these talented guys and that's just what made that so dumb. I mean, because you had the you had the personnel to take advantage of what the conditions were and it chose not to to take advantage of it. So, yeah. We had another super chat from Raymond Harton. Thank you so much, Raymond. The I, by the way, Raymond's my dad's name, so it's a, it's a pretty cool name, I guess. The IB boards are the best. Thank you for all the hard work y'all put into them. You're welcome, Raymond, and thank you for. And Raymond's a message board member, as obviously as he said. So yes. we appreciate that, buddy, very very much. No doubt. We had another super chat from Tim Patrick, who said, first time catching a live show since last season. Irish by thirty. Let's go." I, I would be curious what the last game you listened to, Tim was to see what kind of good luck you might be for uh yeah. for the old irish but appreciate you man and, and, and Tim, I, why did you why did you leave so long for, for well a week? lot of people can't listen live because they're working and doing other things like i had a, a guy that i know yeah. jeff the monk put a chat in there or a, a comment in there he said hey you know i i can't listen because he drives a truck i know sure. jeff loves our show jeff provided uh buns for one of our tailgates last year brought the over to my house this big box of buns and and snacks for people to use because he supports Irish breakdown. But as I said, look, some people are driving a truck or, or things like that. They can't physically go do that. And then by the time the show's over, it's like, you know, okay, well show's over. And so I'm not listening anymore. So, I, so I get it. There's all types of reasons for that, but yeah, I appreciate Jeff. I appreciate you, Tim. I think Tim is also, if it's the same Tim, Tim Patrick, Tim is also a message board member, hmm. which we greatly appreciate. I wonder if this is the Tim Patrick that plays wide receiver for the Denver Broncos. It is Maybe not. Maybe just busy during the football it is not. season. I know this yeah. is kind of hard for you to believe, but sometimes yeah. people actually have the same name. So, nah. yeah. Nah, I don't believe yeah. it. Yeah. Crazy, right? Don't believe Crazy. It. Yeah. Oh, I can make Ryan Roberts my my Twitter handle right now. There'd be no other Ryan Roberts in the world. I don't know what you're talking about. Tyler sure. Evans with the Super Chat. I'm looking for the best. Sorry, I'm looking for the red zone defense. How can keep – Um, wait. I'm looking for the red zone defense to keep improving week after week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty good so far. It but has. again, it's like with everything, Ryan. It's, it's things have been very good so far for Notre Dame. It's just does it continue when the now that the competition is ramped up? Ramped up. That's going to be the question, right? And and, and I love the I, I love the confidence that Notre Dame fans have in this team. Like you know, you and I have said yeah. for it's a, it's kind of like this week has presented me with a very it put me in a very weird place. And you know, um, it's just kind of one of those things where I look at this week and I say, you know, look, these fans are excited and we're always trying to tell them to get excited, but man, the the dismissal of NC state is kind of also like, "Mm, but that's not really where we want to go. My whole thing is appreciate how good NC state is. So that way, if Notre Dame handles its business, you really understand how big of a win that is. Right. And now again, this, if they beat NC state by 30 tomorrow, it's not the same as beating Ohio state by 30 but it's still an impressive win over a quality football team. And that's what it boils down to. But uh, it, what we should all be able to agree on is this is certainly going to be a much tougher test than they've had the first two weeks. Not Even bad. if you think NC State's a 6-16, six and 16, this is a much tougher test than they faced the ter- first two weeks. And I, Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. think that's debatable. I do not right. think that, that part is debatable. And all. so if certain things continue to uh, thrive, then – you say, okay, this is more sustainable because you were able to do it against them as well. So if yep. NC State scores 21 points and Notre Dame wins 42 to 21, 
but they go three for three in the red zone, then we say, well, you know what? Like the red zone defense maybe maybe isn't quite what we thought it was, right? Sure. But if Notre Dame wins, you know, 42 to 21 and NC State goes two of three in the red zone and only one of three on touchdowns and, you know, and, and there are other scores come in other ways or something like that, then we can say, okay, hey, look, there, there's things to clean up and continue to get better on. But, hey, look, we can feel better that the red zone defense has turned a corner. And that's sure. what I love about this game, right? It's it's a measuring stick game. It's not the end all be all that that's going to come against Ohio State, Duke, USC, Clemson, postseason. But it's a great measuring stick game. I mean, really, where are you as a football team? Right. And that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, really enjoying this game, very very Agreed. much. We had another super chat from AST twelve three twenty one. Thank you so much. Would your projected winner of this game change if the team swapped quarterbacks? My score might change a little bit, but no. Yeah, I think, no, I think Brandon saying. Armstrong, surrounded by the talent that Notre Dame has and the defense that Notre Dame has, he'd be, he'd be still be pretty good. Now, do I think Brandon Armstrong is as good as Sam Harmon? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think he fits this particular team as well. Yeah, but they. I would say this. They would also look different. Ryan, you'd see more yes. quarterback designed runs and things like that as part of it. But no, they, I, my, my, my winner wouldn't change. It would just look a lot different. Yeah. yeah. It would look a lot different. Yeah. I, I, I think for me too, it's Sam Hartman is an excellent college quarterback, right? But with NC State's receivers, would he be great as he could be? I mean, there's some limitations there, right? Like I'm just not, I'm not big good on point. the NC State wide receiver. So I think that Sam Hartman would still be a very good player on NC State, but like, would the wide receiver talent, the skill position talent around him, hold him down a little bit as far as like the numbers that he could put up, the impact he could have? I think that's possible as well. So I think that it would be a little closer of a football game potentially, but I still think Notre Dame would have the upper hand there because yes, you wouldn't be able to do some of the some certain levels of. Well, I shouldn't say that. You could still do most passing concepts, but maybe just at a lower rate, and then you would add in some quarterback runs. So again, like you would, you would just move the ball differently, but you'd still be effective with Brendan Armstrong. It would just look a lot different than what Sam Hartman would bring. To this the is going to sound kind of crazy, Ryan. Yep. But as I sit and think about it, and I think about the matchup and the point that you made about the town around him, I actually think there's a chance the score could be even more convincing if you switch quarterbacks. And here's why: I think you nailed it. Sam Hartman would not be surrounded by a better supporting cast. He would be he would have an inferior supporting cast to what he had at Wake. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. think about that. Like yeah. you know, the offensive line's not really any better. The receivers are significantly worse and the running game is even worse than what Wake was last year. So, yeah, he'd have a better defense, but he, I mean Notre Dame would you know, like the whole thing that concerns us about NC State this week Ryan is is what? It's Brennan Armstrong's legs. It's not the same concern with Sam Hartman, where yeah. the Notre Dame offense would be able to adapt to Brendan Armstrong for this game and be fine. My thing is, I don't think Brendan Armstrong gives them a better chance to beat Ohio State, to beat USC, to beat Clemson, sure. to beat teams in the postseason. That's where I think Sam Hartman gives them the best chance to win. That's fair. And if you were to say, okay, what if you switch quarterbacks against Ohio State, would that change your score outcome? Absolutely. I'd pick Ohio State to win. Right. That, that, so it just, it depends on the team that you're going to do this switch with. Like USC, Sam Hartman could do some really fun things in Lincoln Riley's offense. Oh, no doubt. In my opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it would, it would be very, very, and there's some opponents that if you're saying, hey, if you're going to switch quarterbacks, it'd make me very nervous about playing that team if Sam Hartman was that team's quarterback. Right. That would, um, you know, you know what's the most interesting one, Brian? In my opinion, as far as like switching, as far as like what the difference would be, is if you gave Riley Leonard to Notre Dame and Sam Hartman to Duke. That would be an interesting one to me. Yes, that would be yes. very interesting. Yeah, that yeah. I don't know. I don't. I think Duke needs Riley's ability to run more than Notre Dame needs that. Agree. Agree. That would be my only concern. But he'd have a good offensive line and he'd have good skill. He wouldn't have the skill he had at Wake Forest, but he'd have good skill around him. Yep. And a better defense than he had at Wake Forest. There's certain no doubt about that. I'm going to read this one because this is about you, Ryan. Uh, Brian Chisanik says, Ryan is such a good hire. For example, flat out called the Clemson-Duke game and always has fair takes. By the way, Ryan, I told someone 
that uh, I'll tell you who it was after the show, but someone of uh, prominence about your prediction. I think they liked it. Uh, he says, I only predict more J love touches on the horizon. I wouldn't surprise I, me. Yes. Yeah. I, I would, I would not be shocked if Jeremiah love is the second lead rusher on this team by the end of the season. I would not be shocked about that, man. That kid mm. is special. We shall special. see. We shall see. I'm hoping that it's a nice little battle between, uh, um, Jadarian and Jadarian price. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping yeah. we see. I mean, all those dudes need to touch the football, but like, man, Jeremiah is just opening some eyes these first couple weeks. So we shall see. Yep. Here is a uh, super chat from Connor Grant, Ryan. Connor Grant says, what happens if Notre Dame wins out, Texas wins out, Florida State wins out, Georgia wins out, and a Pac-12 team wins out? I think Notre Dame would get in over the Pac-12 team. For strength of schedule. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. Because Notre Dame would would beat one of the better Pac-12 teams. Would have a win over over one of the Pac-12 teams. That's the nice thing that Notre Dame has to its advantage. I would argue this, Ryan. Like, let's just say that uh, Washington wins out or Utah wins out. Yeah, they would all have a much better resume than Georgia. All of those teams, Texas included, would have a and and Florida State included would have much better resumes than Georgia for this season on paper just on paper resumes i'm not talking about like talent and film and i'm just talking about on paper yeah but georgia has the advantage of they're the defending champs and and i've always said georgia would deserve to be in even though their resume isn't as good because again you're the champs until somebody beat you i believe in that now the odds of this happening are slim but guys i I don't care what the other power five teams do if notre dame wins out against this schedule they're in the college football playoff just i mean just I think so too. Yeah. There's no, there's no doubt about it. In my but opinion, there is also a little bit of mi- mixed context, Connor, just because like not all wins are created equal, right? And right. the resume isn't always created equal. I mean, you you always talk about the 2021 season, right, Brian, where Notre Dame goes, you know, 11 and one, but it's like that was not an impressive 11 and one. That wasn't right. Like, right. yeah, all those teams went out, but what does Texas look like against their best games of the year? What does Notre Dame look like against USC and Clemson? What was Clemson and USC and some of these teams, what were they going into that game as well? Like, cause we're just talking about what we see of them as of today. Right. But like, what do they end up being? How impressive of a win was that ultimately? So I would just need a little bit more, but I would say I'm very certain though, that if Notre Dame would win out, even in this scenario, Notre Dame would be in because in theory you're talking about if they win, if they beat Ohio State, Clemson on the road, and USC in one and season, Duke. and Duke that just yeah. beat Clemson handedly, like that's that's an impressive resume, yeah. man. <laughs> it's a very impressive yep. resume. So I say I still yep. think they would get in. Yes, agree, agree. We got a comment here from Patrick Bell. Patrick says, "American Notre Dame fan living in South Africa. I've enjoyed IB for oh. nearly two years. Great job, and keep up the good work, Team Go Irish." Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate That's that awesome. very, 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 very much. And we have one last super chat, and then we're going to get back to the top, Ryan. Okay. Tyler Evans says, "How would you guys rank all the Pac-12 quarterbacks?" Oh man. Well, Caleb Williams is at the top. Yeah. The question I would have for you, Ryan, is who would be your two and three? Like I would assume it's going to be Bo Nix and Michael Penix in some order. It probably be just, Penix and Nix, Penix right? And Nix for okay. me. Yeah. If Penix yeah. is healthy, yeah. uh, who else is in sort of that? Because I mean, who, who? Let's go through who the Pac-12 quarterbacks are. Obviously, when Cameron Rising is back, he's there. Yeah. You've got Jaden Delore at Arizona. You've got Jaden Rashada yeah. at Arizona State. Yeah. Uh, you've got Shador Sanders at Colorado. You've got DJ Uyunglele at uh, Oregon State. Yeah, uh, you've got uh, Cameron Ward at Washington Cameron State. Ward at Washington State. You've got Cameron yeah. Rising at Utah. You've got, I mean, it's basically Dante Moore is going to be their starting quarterback at at, at UCLA, right? Um, and then at Cal, you have Ben Finley, who probably is at the bottom of my list. To be completely honest with you, I, I was very surprised that Ben Finley yeah. started. By the way, I thought they were going to st- start the uh, TCU transfer, the Sam Jackson kid, but they yeah. ended up with him. So, yeah. yep. and then uh, and then you have Ashton Daniels at uh, Stanford. Ashton Daniels actually looked pretty good the first game. I know it was only against Hawaii, yeah. but he actually impressed me a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I I, 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 mean, I, I just got to see it against somebody not named Hawaii. Like that, that. That's my big thing. I think Hawaii is a terrible football team. Sure. Um. But no, he he has some physical tools to work with. 
that's yeah. that's what caught my eye. Right? Nice like, I didn't put a lot of stock in his his performance per se, but he's a quality athlete, strong yeah. arm. You know, he yeah. he did some nice things. So so uh, I would go based on kind of what we know. I would go Michael Penix two. I would go uh, Bo Nix three. Uh, right now, based on what we've seen, Shador. I'd, I'd go Shador Sanders next. You guys are going to not like this, but I'm not very high on Cameron Rising, so he's not going to be in my upper echelon of, of quarterbacks. Just to be completely honest with you, I'm not. I'm not a big camera. I'm not a big Cameron Rising fan. But I, this is going to sound a little nuts, but I, I'd probably go with DJ Uyunglele next because I think that system fits him much better than the one he ran at Clemson. And as we found out, you know, Saturday, like even quarterbacks that fit that system can struggle a little bit in that system. Sure. Um, would you put Cameron uh, Ward next, Ryan, or Cameron Rising next after uh, I would actually put, Bo Nix and Michael Cameron Penix? Ward, I, I would put Cameron Ward over DJ Uyunglele. I'm right. not saying as far as uh, compared to yeah. DJ. I'm talking about yours because you've said so far, you've said Caleb Williams, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, and Shador, right? Shador would be four, So I, yeah, my right next now. would be DJ. I'm asking who your next would be. My my, my next would be Cameron Ward, yeah. I, again, I, I know it was one game, but he looked so much better yeah. in the first game of the season than he did last just, year. I mean, he was we've talked, fantastic. Yeah, so. Ryan, we've talked about it all offseason. Like Grant Wells looked way better. Now, again, it was Old Dominion, but Grant Wells looked a lot better. Yep. At Virginia. Now, I don't think Grant Wells is as good as Cameron Ward. Don't, don't get that twisted. The point is, is that it's, it's, it's year two in a system, year two at this level, year two against this type of speed. I think it's going to have a benefit for you. Uh, as I said, Ben Finley's probably at the bottom of my list. Jaden Rashad is yep. probably next lowest on my list just because he's a freshman and he's not Dante. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably go Cameron Rising, uh, Cameron Ward, then Cameron Rising for me. I'd probably go Jaden Deloria next, Ryan, after yep. that. Uh, I'd put Dante next, just again, just a freshman. He's going to need some time. Um, i trying to see who, who have I missed. And then I'd have Jaden Rashad and Ben Finley at the bottom. Did That's I miss fair. anybody? No, I think, oh, yeah. uh, Ashton Daniels from Stanford. He's he's going to be near the bottom as well. I'd, I'd probably put him ahead of Jaden Rashada just because he's not a fresh freshman. But I just got to see more from him. It's, it's more of the unknown. Those guys at the bottom, not named Ben Finley, are more – Dante, Jaden Rashada, and Ashton Daniels are kind of where they are with asterisks. Yeah. Because it's just we need to see more from them. You know, where these other guys are more finished. Like like even with Sh- Shador Sanders, yeah, he's only played one game at the Power 5 level, but we now have that. We can now use that and measure what he did at the Power – at the Group of 5 le- – at the FCS right. level and say, okay, the skills he sh- – the production he showed at that level has translated, even if just for a game. So – even though we have a lot we have to learn about Shador, it's still more of a proven commodity to, than what Jaden Rashada and Dante Moore and and Ashton Daniels are, just based on sure. the fact that we, we've got one game of those guys. That's it. I, I, so that's I think the mid, the mid tier of that ranking is pretty fascinating. Like when you get to the Cam Reward, Cam Rising, like that type of tier, or DJ Uyunglele. I would actually probably go camera ward, then cam rising, then DJ, just because like I, mm-hmm. I want to see a little more from DJ. Yeah, you know, like, it's just been madly inconsistent. If he maybe he does what he did last game on a like yeah. a larger sample size, then like cool, we'll we'll re rank that and it'll be different at that point. You know Me I mean? ranking so, him where I ranked him higher is ba- is basically the confirmation bias. I'll be honest, the confirmation bias of what I think he's going to be in Jonathan Smith's system. It was one game sure. against San Jose State, right? Yep. But it's kind of like that's what I thought we'd see. Yep. But I think Ryan, I would what I would say is is I'm going to I'm comfortable with where I have him, but I think you have to put an asterisk by it, just like I did with the others. Cause like you said, we got to see it for more than one game. At that I, I will say, I mean, we I think we were both spot on on it being a better fit because I'll mm-hmm. say this. I watched some of that game. Oregon State's offensive line is real, folks. That is a yes. really good offensive line. And that running back, Damian Martinez, the sophomore, that kid is a stud. I'm telling you all and right now. He's him like throw the ball downfield. He's a long armed, not super accurate guy that you yep. can't be having run a million quick throws and RPOs. Yep. And so they are letting him launch the ball down the field. That's what DJ, you know what system DJ would have fit in great? Is like it's the old Steelers school, of the seventies. Well, or the, well, you know, along the old school Michigan offenses back in the day, where they were just run downhill, throw downhill. 
I mean, that's like what the they John, were. John Navars of the world. Yes. Like cats, yes. Man. Where they just, you yeah. know, drop, that was Gerba. They just drop back and launch that sucker down the field, man. They're just running yeah. posts and goes and digs and deep overs and all that kind of stuff. Like, that's who he is. Yeah. And Jonathan Smith yeah. is smart enough to play to that. Yeah. I'll say this, though, Ryan. It's a very deep league at, cor- at the quarterback position. It is. Because, I mean, we're talking about what, Jane Delara being like seventh or eighth? Like, Delara's a pretty yeah. good player. He's solid. Exactly. He's rock solid player. Exactly. You know? Like, he's not bad at all. So. And the guys at the bottom of the list are former highly regarded recruits like Jaden Rashad and Dante Moore. Yeah. You know, that, you know, well, top that's what I was going to say is, I think even with, I think even Ashton Daniels in that Troy Taylor system, like, could be a very good player potentially. Like, I mean, it's possible. There's tools at the bottom, which is nice. The only guy that I think doesn't have a lot of talent is Ben Finley at Cal. Like, I don't think he has a ton of talent. Like, Ashton Daniels is pretty talented. Shader Rashad is stupid talented, like stupid talented. And obviously Dante Moore is very talented, which we all know that at that point, at this point. So. All right. We had a super chat from Nathan Milton. Nathan says, what position matchups are you most interested in by a unit and or personnel for Notre Dame and and college football, i.e. Notre Dame offensive line unit versus Ohio State defensive line or Joe Alt versus Rook or Roro Roro. Why are we playing him against Rook or Roro Roro, et cetera? Isn't he an interior guy? <laughs> yeah, he, play, he plays like – I mean, he'll play like some 4-4-I four, four at times, but like, yeah, he's an interior player. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, if, if you're Notre – the funny thing is uh, some of these matchups, Ryan, we're going to get to see. Like, if I'm yeah. going to say, hey, how good is Notre Dame's cornerback groups? Well, let's have them go against the best of the best. Well, what is that unit? It's Ohio State. Well, guess what? They're going to get that test. You know, I mean, when when you think about some of the best – now, they didn't look – I didn't think they looked like a million bucks against Duke. They were good in the Clemson D-line, to your point. You know, how good are the name guards? Well, let's see how they do against Tyler Davis and Rook Ororo, right? I mean, let's see how they do. Yeah. Let's see how they handle those guys. And, and we're, you know, but even then, Ohio State is going to present them a very physical test. So there, there are tests on the schedule for Notre Dame, just where they are, that to me um, are going to let us know exactly who Notre Dame is. Like if you can go toe to toe with Ohio State's defense and move and work them, or if you can, you know, just keep Marvin Harrison and Mecca from taking games over, that's going to give you a lot of confidence that, hey, you know what? We can go against Georgia and we can go against Alabama and we can do those type of things. Sure. And and th- that's the thing that's been missing in the past, right? You, you made the point about the 2021 team. Yeah, they went 11 and 1, but they were never really tested because they're just, they were just way better than everybody else in their schedule except for one team. And that team outplayed them for 60 minutes, you right. know, Cincinnati that year. And uh, this, this team will, this team, if this team is standing at the end as a playoff team, it will yeah. be, in my opinion, the most battle-tested Notre Dame team since 2012, in yeah. my opinion. And this team, to me, has a, a much better top-to-bottom roster than 2012. Because in order for them to be 12-0, and Ryan, I don't think they can go 11-1 and or 12-0 and with star, without stars emerging. Now, we don't still don't know necessarily who some of those stars are going to be. You know some. Joe Walt's a star. Benjamin Morrison's a star. But they're going to need more than that. And we're going to know who those guys are by the end of the year if Notre Dame's 11 and 1 or 12 and 0, right? We're going to have those answers. They will have some stars emerge that I think will allow them to say, okay, yeah, we've got the top level talent. That's what sure. allows the depth of talent to shine through. Because that, that's the only question I really have ultimately about this 2023 team of, of whether or not they are capable of playing for a championship. Like, can, because like the stars can align for a team and you can still say, yeah, the stars align for you, but the best you're going to be is nine and three. There are teams like sure. that. The best you're going to be is six and six, and in the season went exactly perfectly for you. You know, is Notre Dame a team where if all the stars align, they're eleven and one, and you know, losing the semifinal, and that's the best this team is capable of, or is this a team where the stars align and they go out and compete and win a championship? Right. In order for that to happen, I think they have the depth of talent to make that happen. I still need to see that they have the star power at the top to yeah. make that happen. I, I think I think the Notre Dame Ohio State game is going to be one of the best for a couple different matchups. I mean, you mentioned the wide receivers, right? Like, let's see Marvin Harrison and Emeka Buka and Jaleen Fleming and the freshmen go against Cam Hart and Benjamin Morrison and Christian Gray and Jaden Mickey. Like, that's a really great matchup. Offensive line for Notre Dame versus the Ohio State defensive line is also a really nice one. I mean, they have a lot of depth on that defensive line, and mm-hmm. with JT and 
Jack Sawyer hopefully taking a step up for them and Michael Hall and Tyleek Williams and those cats. Like, that's a good matchup. You know which one I'm hoping to see in the playoff, Brian, because I think that there's a couple of really cool matchups that we can get out of it, is if Notre Dame played Florida State, that would be a fascinating yes. one. Because you want to talk about the Joe Walt conversation here, Nathan? Joe Walt versus Jared Verse is a fun time. Man. Yep. That is a fun matchup. And then also – Yes, I wouldn't say that the duo is better than Ohio State's as of right now, but like Benjamin Morrison and Cam Hart going against Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson, both at six foot four and six foot seven, like that's fun, man. That is some fun time. So Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame Florida State game, if they made both made the playoffs, would be a really mm-hmm. fun time with a couple of those matchups. Yep, and, and then also on the the defensive side for Notre Dame is that that offensive line that offensive line that Florida State has that's very well coached would say if Notre Dame's defensive line is legit it's going to we're going to know in that game if it's not legit we're going to know in that game because of how well they're coached they're not they're not super talented like they don't have a Joe Walt on their o line but they're very they're well coached players. and they get after yeah. it they're they're more like Michigan to me than past Notre Dame o lines would you agree with that Ryan like i don't know that there's like yeah. a a future top 10 NFL draft pick like Notre Dame had with Ronnie yeah. Stanley and, and and Quentin Nelson and Mike McGlinchey and guys like that. But like you said, as a unit, they're very good and they're very well coached. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, the best player on that, best player on that offensive line is, is one of the two tackles. They have the Robert Scott kid at left tackle who's a solid player. Then they have Jeremiah Byers, who's a pretty good right tackle, going to play guard at the next level. I think at best, one of those guys might go third round to fourth rounds you know what i mean like they definitely don't have a stud on that line where it's like that's a future first round pick i would agree there Mm -hmm. yep that's a good question nathan i like it i like how we just threw in rook rook in there just so that we can pronounce his last name though you know that that's the only reason that he put rook in that uh scenario but yep very manipulative, Nathan. Very manipulative. Uh, Connor Grant with another super chat. Thank you, sir. What would your college football top 10 be if you ranked each team with the criteria that on a neutral field, one would beat two, two would beat three, et cetera? And probably look like mine does now. Uh, the problem I have with this the, this narrative that we hear, and this is something that you hear from talking heads and on ESPN when it when when they're trying to advocate for a two loss Georgia team being in the playoff. Well, if they played so and so head to head, like well then why then they beat four and eight South Carolina head to head if they're right. such a great team, right? It is you are going to imply your own bias towards who you think would win this fictitious matchup, sure. right? And it's a it's a lot harder to come to a, any kind of rational debate about well who they are. Well, you know Bama should have got in the playoff last year because. If they play X number team on a on a neutral field, they would win that game. They couldn't even beat Tennessee and LSU last year. What makes you think that they could have beat Georgia on a neutral field, or Ohio State on a neutral field, or Michigan on a neutral field? Like it, it's your bias about who you think Alabama is, or or well, they have X number of blue chips and this team doesn't. Okay, well, that meant Duke should have had no chance against Clemson this past weekend. Whoa, it was on, at Duke. Yeah. Okay, is it like does Duke get magical powers? Like is this like Pac Man where then they walk out of their home a locker room they they get like the Pac Man power ups that they don't get on the road like it, 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 it's a basically the argument to to do that would is is entirely your preconceived notions of who a team is and that's why I say the resume tells you who you are well this Ohio State team is super talented they sh- they should be consideration and and with two losses remember that argument twenty seventeen. I'm like, well, if this team is so good, how come I would kick the crap out of them if they're that good? Why did Oklahoma beat them by 15 on their own field if they're that good? But yeah, but look at how many draft picks they're going to have. I'm like, that doesn't make you a great team. That just means you're a talented team. Right. Well, the 2015 Ohio State team should have been in the playoff. Over who? The Michigan State team that they lost to at home? Well, they would have done a lot better in a playoff than Michigan State would. You don't know that. They literally lost at home to Michigan State. It's like, well, this team, you know, I, I had to hear this from Browns fans my whole life. Well, we would have been better in the Super Bowl than the Broncos were. Like, you couldn't even beat the Broncos. Like, at your place. You know what I mean? Like, what makes you think would have been better? It's all about your preconceived notions of what you think a team is. That's ultimately what it boils down to, right? And I just um, I just don't look at it that way. And if I did, my own bias would be, well, I'd go based off of what the eye test tells me and what the resume tells me. 
well, the eye test says Bama's really talented. Yeah, but the eye test also told me Bama wasn't a really good team last year. They were just very talented. Sure. Because you can say, well, you know, they were a point away from beating Tennessee and a point away from beating LSU. And I'm like, yeah, they were also really close to losing to Texas A&M. They were also really close to losing to Texas. Right? I mean, so we can play this game all day long. The resume is what it is. And so that's how I would view it. So you say, well, but this team's talented. Yeah, but this team has shown they can't consistently win games that they need to win. So I'm not going to tell you that they would on a neutral field. Otherwise, just put Bam in the playoff every year. I don't care what their what their record is, what their resume says. Just put them on the field because on any given Saturday, they could beat any team in the country. Yeah, they could. Doesn't mean they would. And that's why you don't make rankings based off that, in my opinion. So, so, my so make, make, a, make a playoff ranking based upon the uh, blue chip ratio. Is that what we're getting right, right there? That's fantastic. Yeah. Right. Because I think I think they said Duke had one player uh, in their starting lineup on both sides of the ball. Yeah, that was a three on their entire roster. On their entire roster, yeah, yeah. three in their entire roster. And this, this was something wild. crazy. It was something like fifty-six to three, or something crazy like that, or forty-nine to three. I've seen. Oh, I did numbers. see that. I did see that number. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clemson crazy. has more of those guys in their freshman class than Duke. That's what people say. Well, you know, uh, Clemson needs to embrace the portal and NIL. And I'm like, guys, that's not why they lost to Duke. Right. Like you could say that maybe is true if you're talking about they got to do a better job of, you know, playing, you know, so and so and such and such and not getting whatever beat by this team. But it's Duke. Right. Right. I mean, did Clemson really need to go to the portal to beat Duke? Well, they got out coached and they got out executed and they got out hit. That's what happened. Yeah. They had the more talented team. There's there's something else amiss at Clemson right now that needs to get addressed. And and um We'll find out if those things do get addressed. Because I'll, I'll say this again, Ryan. We have way too many week one overreactions. Because I'll ask you this. Did Clemson look that much worse than Ohio State did when they struggled to beat Navy in the opener and they got their butts kicked at home by Virginia Tech in week two in 2014? No. But guess what that team was by the end of the year? Dominant. We, we, always, we always do the overreactions. I remember a couple of years ago when uh, it was the – Jacksonville Jaguars, I'm talking NFL for a second, but Jacksonville Jaguars won their first game of the season with Gardner Minshew. And I remember Minshew balled out. They actually beat, I think they beat like the Ravens or something. Like it was a really good victory. And everyone's like, oh man, this team's better than we thought. Minshew might be really good. And they proceeded to go one in 15 at the draft. Trevor yeah. Lawrence. I'm like, yeah, week one overreactions. Brother. Yes, like, relax. exactly right. <laughs> relax. Some of the, some of the responses I saw uh, today on, on Twitter from a, uh, about the last night's game, I thought were fascinating. Like you're seeing these people trying to down play the Lions win well they didn't play that great they did this 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 and this and this oh and Kansas City didn't have a, I'm like guys you, you realize you're not making the point you think you're making if you're telling me all these things about how Detroit didn't really play that well and they needed this this and this so, so what you're saying is Detroit cannot play their a game and still go on the road and beat the Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes like it'd be one thing if like they didn't have Patrick Mahomes I'm like but guys like you're not you're not making the own that you think you're making. And number one, that's number one. And number two, why are we overreacting to a, a game in the NFL? Right. The, a, a team, a t- some team is going to make the playoff with seven or eight losses. I mean, you know, it, it is kind of – but I guess we got, we got content we got to make to get people to listen and watch, I guess. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's have a – That was a weird game last night. It was night. very – It was a, you know what it was? It looked like an opener. Yeah. Teams trying to you, figure out who know, they are. You know what? So, you know what someone said. It was hysterical. Someone was like, because they were a lifelong Lions fan. I forget who said it, but it was hysterical. He was like, "I turned the game on five minutes after it ended again, just to make sure that the Lions didn't somehow blow it after the game." <laughs> That's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> That's great. It's like that you never know. You never know. All That's right. a great one. That's a great one. Uh, I can still see Dan Orvlosky running out of the back of the end zone, going zero sixteen. Yeah. I can still see it in my my mind. Yep. Yep. We had another super chat from Beef Eater and D08 says, Brian, if you need any security detail this weekend, my son and I are very adept at outsmarting NC State fans like Obi-Wan Kenobi versus a stormtrooper. <laughs> um, I'll let you know. I'll let you know, buddy. I appreciate that. Um, I would love to know the backstory to this. Beef eater, maybe you could put that on the message board. I would love to know the backstory to that of, of just, what you're I just referring can't think to. He has the Jedi mind tricks, man. It's crazy. Yeah, it's that's 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 hilarious. That's hilarious. All right, we can go back to the top here, Ryan, and uh, got through the super chats. Thanks, everybody. 
from Salty. What's up, Salty? Oregon State and Washington State are looking to absorb the Mountain West and keep the Pac-12 name. Assets and power conference status, how likely are they to succeed? I mean, this is such a a legal question, Salty. I mean, it just – this is all about contracts, whether you can or cannot get into contract out of contracts. I mean, if I'm if I'm the leadership of the Pac-12, I'm just going to repeat it again. I'm just trying to survive. Even if you lose your status as a Power Five conference, survive because I'm of the belief, and I could be wrong. That in the next decade, this whole thing's going to get blown up, and people are going to be going back to where they came from. It's very uh, possible. That, that's my belief in this whole thing. It, at the very least, from a non-football standpoint, at the very least, I think we're going to see something where all because there's a there's a I believe it's a lawsuit that's or or maybe it's just a statement that's going to then lead to a lawsuit of this group that represents students that say all these conference realignment of, for for non-football teams needs to be done away with. And you know, I could see something like that happening to where, but if you no longer survive. There's no conference to go back to. Now, here's the question. The Mountain West isn't just going to say, well, sure, we'll dissolve and right. go to the Pac-12. As We're a out league, of here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as a league, they're not just going to do that. So how, how do they merge those two while still maintaining? Like, so, you know, do they say, okay, well, we're going to take all the, all the leadership of the Mountain West and all the facilities and all that, and then we'll become the Pac-12, and then the Pac-12 as it stands dies. The leadership dies, which is it should. You let you oversaw a failed product and a failed entity. You let this thing die. You no right. longer deserve to have a position of power. So if there's going to be a merge, then you say, okay, the Mountain West will hold all contracts, and the Mountain West leadership will remain in place, and the commissioner of the Mountain West will become the new commissioner of the of the newly named Pac-12. So that would be the only way it would make a lot of sense for me. Because the Mountain West isn't just as a league isn't just going to let this happen. They're going to they're going to want to get their money, and right. I don't know that those schools because was like the penalty for San Diego State when they tried that was like really big for that yeah. kind of team, and uh, you know I I just don't know that that's going to happen. So it would it would there would have to be something along those lines, Ryan, where like Mountain West leadership becomes the Pac-12. Right, you know, like, and all we need to do is just create new signage and stuff at our build, building, but you know, we're not the ones that oversaw a conference that that, that died. Right, Mountain West well, is, had teams yeah. leave and they survived. Right, they lost teams, they lost Utah, they lost BYU, they lost, you know, and they survived. TCU, they survived. Pac-12 this didn't. Is, Salty, this is one of the reasons that I always push back on people when they're like, Notre Dame needs to join a conference right now, and I'm just like, why? We don't know what's going to happen right. yet. I still have no idea. Right. I mean, it's just such a volatile landscape of college football right now. I mean, like, could it be two super conferences eventually? Could it just be the AC and Big Ten when the others fail at some point? I guess. Could it be that the others just kind of hold on for dear life and that they're not able to just completely throw them out the window? I guess. Could it be possible that the whole landscape could just implode <laughs> at some point? Like, it's all possible, which is why I'm just like, if I'm Notre Dame as an independent, I'm just sitting back and just being like, all right, see what happens. And if it right. does get to that point where I, we need to make a decision, then we're more valuable 10 years from now than we are today as far as like how much we can ask for, right? And the bargaining chip and all that type of stuff. So, yep. yeah, man, it's weird. It's a weird landscape yeah. right now, and I have no idea what's going to happen, unfortunately. I wish I no. had that. If I want a crystal ball just so I can be Nostradamus on this one, but like I have no idea what's going to happen no. with college football. So, and anyone tells you that they don't exact they know exactly where college football is going to be in five or ten years is is yeah. not being honest with you. That or they're just in 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 fa- living in fantasy land. I I think it's more responsible just to highlight like the several different possibilities that could happen because there's right. a lot of different ways that this could go. In my opinion, I really believe yeah. that. Ryan, here's a a, a fair qual uh, follow up question to our ranking of the Pac-12 quarterbacks. 99 pros of BK81, which is still one of the probably the top three screen names. Definitely on the top show, five by the way. for yeah. sure. Top five. Very fair, but looking past the headlines, I am just curious why would you take Shador Sanders over Cameron Ward? It's a very valid opinion. I would just be interested in the breakdown of why. Well, number one, I, I I'm not sure if you're saying this, but I I would say it's it's improper to assume that we're making this declaration based on headlines 
like Shador Sanders has talent. I, I don't think he's an elite talent. I don't think he's a guy that all of a sudden becomes like a first round NFL draft pick type of guy. The question is, is what the talent he does have, does it translate uh, to the next level? I, I saw and, I, I saw a uh, headline, Brian. Sorry to cut you off, but it was okay. like you got to stop Sanders, doing that, Ryan. Sh- 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 Shador stop Sanders apologizing for cutting me off. This is what we do. It's a conversation. You're good. You just go, cut me man. off while I was cutting you off. Uh, right, oh, and I'm not happens. apologizing for it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the stupid NFL draft headline of a person that I actually kind of like as a person, but it's just yeah, he's got some bad takes. He was basically saying that Shador Sanders is going to be the next Joe Burrow, and I'm just like, guys. I mean, Can that's the stuff please? that it's like, that person doesn't believe that, right? Like, I don't I, think so I either. I promise you that person doesn't believe that. Oh, For me, what man. it comes down to, 99, is it just comes down to physical tools, right? I mean, you know, Shador yeah. put up really good numbers at the at the FCS level. And, and it's it's a different type of FCS, you know. But, you know, Cameron Ward put up really good numbers at the FCS level as well. It, 74 total yeah. touchdowns in 19 games, Cameron Ward, yeah. which is pretty wild. And he had uh, 71 of those were were um, were passing touchdowns, right? I mean, so yes. it's not like he was like running read zone stuff and all that kind of stuff. And you know, and and so when I when I look at what he did last year at Washington State, you know, he he, he was good, but I don't know that we ever saw him kind of have the kind of performance that Shador Sanders had in the opener. And sure. Shador Sanders is a guy that also had really good production at the FCS level. You know, his last two years at Jackson State, he also had 70 passing touchdowns and 79 total touchdowns in two years at at uh, at, at Jackson State. Now, he didn't have – you know, he didn't have uh, – I mean, look, I'll just, I'll just say it. I, I don't know that that level is quite the same, I, but I don't know enough about in the, the, the competition that Incarnate Word – played against but Shador's numbers were even better at the FCS level if you look at it he had more he had more they neither of them were, were runners I mean Shador in the last two years had 156 rushing yards uh Cameron Ward in his two years at the FCS level had 63 they're both passing quarterbacks I think Shador's to me got a little bit more arm talent uh Cameron Ward's a little thicker actually than Shador is um and and honestly, I think Shador also has a better supporting cast. To be completely honest with you, from a skill st- from a skill standpoint, than what Cameron Ward has at Washington State. Uh, although I don't think I think I think Ryan's right. Washington State's a team to, that's going to make some noise, and I, I think we're going to see that this weekend against Wisconsin. To be honest with you, Ryan, I've got Washington State winning yeah. that game. I, I do. I think they're going to win that game. But um, possible. If you were to tell me 99 that you like Cameron Ward better, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, dude, you're so wrong. You're way off. You're nuts. Just for me, it's just what we saw from Shador was, okay, he did really good things at Jackson State. So in, it, I'll give you the numbers. In two years as a starter at Jackson State, Shador completed 65.9 and then 70 point percent, 70.6% of his throws. He threw for 3,200 yards in 21, 3,700 yards in 22. He threw 30 touchdowns and eight picks in year one. He threw 40 touchdowns and six picks in year two. Last year, year two, he had 40 passing touchdowns and six picks, but also had six rushing touchdowns last season. And uh, Cameron Ward in his two years threw for completed 60.4 and 65.1% of his passes, neither as good as anywhere close to what Shador did. Threw for 2,200 yards his first year, 4,600 his second year. That 22 uh, was only in six games, though. In an right. Right, season, right, right, so. right. Get that. Get that. Because yeah. that was the COVID year. That was the spring. Because he's he a year. He made the transition a year. per game as a freshman than he did as a sophomore. But Yes. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. 7.9, 7.5 and 7.9 yards per attempt. Shador was at 7.8 and 7.7. Also very similar, because that's a number that I like to look at, because it takes out some of the attempt numbers. So, for example, Shador in year in twenty in his second year as a starter at the FCS level, uh, he threw for forty six hundred and forty eight yards and forty seven touchdowns. Shador's best year, he only threw for thirty seven hundred and thirty two yards. Cameron Ward was at seven point nine yards per attempt. Shador Sanders was seven point seven. Really, the difference between the two was numbers attempts. Like he threw a lot more passes. He threw five hundred ninety, where Shador threw four hundred eighty three. So again, when you look at it, Ryan, there's a lot of similarities. Shador's a little better here. Cameron's a little better here. I think Cameron to me or Shador to me just has more physical tools. 
is what it boils down to I, for me. I actually don't see that. I think yeah. Shador's actually just much I think he's a much smoother processor and he plays a position at a higher level right now as far as like getting through reads, foot being consistent with his platform. I actually think Cameron Ward has a hose for an arm. I think, I think he's got, got a strong arm, arm, but I think that's not the only physical tools that I'm referring to. You know, it comes down to accuracy. It comes down to being able to throw with good timing. That's all part of the physical process. It's can you get your arm, your 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 mind, your arm, and your legs to work together in one. That's a physical skill. But again, the point is, Ryan, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, dude, you're freaking nuts for thinking Cameron Ward's better than Shador Sanders. And oh, I don't think he's better. I, I think you would. Talented. I think you would be unwise to say the same thing in in the other way. So that to me is where it comes down to. But the whole point. That I would the thing that I would say is when you get past the first three, from about four to like eight or nine, there could be a lot of conversation about where those guys need to fit. Even a guy like Jaden Deloria, because a lot of what we're doing is projecting some of these guys ahead. But I'm going to look up his numbers, but I'm pretty sure Jaden Deloria had better numbers last year. I believe yes. Then Cameron Ward, from just a stat, from a from a um, yard standpoint, and some of those other areas. Yeah, Cameron Ward was at thirty two thirty one. Jaden Deloria was at thirty six eighty five. Um, four rushing touchdowns. So I mean, he's he can be in that conversation too. I just I think he makes too many. He turns the ball over too much for my liking. Jaden Deloria does. Uh, but that's the thing, Ryan, that makes it so good is just the depth of quality quarterback play in that league is yeah. really good, really good. I mean, there's a chance that by the end of the year, I mean, we could be talking about Cam Rising being like around like nine or ten. If guys can, like if Cameron Ward makes the jump that you make, if we're right on Shador Sanders, if Dante Moore is some is what we think he is, right? If I you go, just go down the list. Yeah. You're talking about Cameron Rising continuing to fall down the list. And that says a lot because you're talking about a kid who's won the Pac-12 two years in a row as a starting quarterback. Good point. You know, yep. it's going to be – it's a really – it's. I would argue it's the deepest league, just off the top of my head, the deepest quarterback league. And that's, again, why it's so unfortunate that what's happening to the Pac-12 is happening to the Pac-12 because it was going to be a really fun year. Well, it's going to be. There's no doubt about that. Wait, we, I, I, actually, we we kind of addressed this one already, right? Okay, gotcha. It's about the weather and who holds the advantage. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Andy Estimate Trucking LLC says, what would be your ranking of Jackson Arnold, Bear Bachmeyer, Tyler Buckner, Cabe Klunick, and Julian Sayan, who had the most upside at the same stage in high school? Who would you choose to lead this year's Notre Dame team? I mean, I'd, I'd have Jackson Arnold fourth or fifth on my list. I, you all know I'm not a big Jackson Arnold fan. <laughs> oh, man, people people were, were were bringing up receipts last week after we went 11 for 11 against somebody Arkansas not good. State. Like, congratulations. Yeah. People were bringing up receipts to who? You? No, he, they, someone was in the chat yesterday. It was I, literally when we were doing our show uh -huh. that said, oh, do you still not think Jackson Arnold's good? Looked pretty good to me. And I was just like, he went for 11-11 well, against Arkansas first of all, State. First of all. <laughs> Yeah. I never said Jackson Arnold wasn't good. I had him as right. a top 150 player. Yeah. If you're a top 150 player, you're a good player. Number one. Number two, are you going to say the same thing if he plays next week and doesn't play well? Like, again, guys, he came off the bench against Arkansas State. Come on. Come on. Let's let's not be children. Let's not be children. All right, let's go to the next question here from Brandon K. Brandon says, "Who has been the biggest surprise so far in these two games? The, the these first two games could be a good or bad surprise, and could be also be a coach or player." Well, in the first game, I was pretty high on the job that Pat Coogan did. I thought Pat Coogan did a really nice job in the opener. I, I was not as high on the job he did in game two, but I, I don't think you can overreact to those type of games. Uh, because, again, he's still making his first couple starts. If if Billy Shrouth would have played well in one game and not the other, I wouldn't be like, no, 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 ignore the second game because he played great in the first one. And I'd say, hey, look, he's got to clean some stuff up, but he's done some good things. I'd need to see him play a little bit better, in my opinion. Uh, but but either even with that, Pat Coogan has been better than I thought he was going to be. That's a pleasant surprise. 
uh, offensively. I, I don't know that anyone else has been a surprise. I, I, I'll be, okay, here's a, a one that not say a bad surprise because I think people are overreacting to what Tobias Merriweather's done so far. But I can also admit that I thought that by ga- two games into the year he had more, he'd have more than two catches for five yards. I mean, those things can also be both be true. I pointed out last night, Ryan, in, in, in a thread on the board, you know, people kind of, you know, just giving up on Tobias Merriweather already. And just the whole thing is just kind of kind of ridiculous, in my opinion. You can say, hey, he hasn't played well in two games and, and not go there. And, and I just reminded people that last year through two games, Audric Estime had 54 yards rushing on 19 carries. It's like, what, 2.8 a carry? And Logan Diggs through two games last year had 16 yards on 11 carries. Last year through three games, Jaden Thomas had one catch for eight yards. He was their best receiver by November. Chase Claypool is a true freshman, caught five passes. As a sophomore, he had three catches for 24 yards through his first three games. Miles Boynton, Boynton didn't make his first career catch until game four of his sophomore season. Kevin Austin had six catches for 98 yards through the first three seasons of his career. Right, like if you're writing Tobias Merriweather off after two games, you're mistaken. Now, if we get to the middle of the season and he's still not doing a whole lot, that's where I start getting a little bit concerned. I'll I'll actually say this: if we are through Central Michigan and Tobias hasn't started to flash, that's when I'll get a little bit concerned because he's—you don't just go from doing nothing for four games, most likely, to all of a sudden you're the guy we build the game plan around to beat Ohio State. Like I, he's going to have to come out at some point in time. But through two games, I'm not at all concerned. About especially when you break down all 22, Ryan. I could point to six or seven times when he was open for what would have been a catch, but the read didn't take Sam Hartman there. And then last week, you watched the film, guys. I'm telling you, they were not going to let them get the ball deep on Notre Dame or I mean on Tennessee. Tennessee State was not going to let Notre Dame throw the ball down the field. Yeah. And we we broke that down already. I just don't understand why we're in the world where like we're writing off a 19 year old. I I remember, um, why I mean, I made a comment on that post this morning i was just like yeah man i peaked at 17 as well so like you know like uh, that we're done growing at that point we're done getting better it's just hysterical i remember right i when penne sewell opted out of the season right the 2020 season i remember people were like oh how do we know he's still going to be good on the way i'm just like you know because people keep getting stronger and bigger and faster and to keep improving it's right. just it's so funny how people just kind of the minute something bad happens, it's like, that guy sucks. All right, cool, man. Yep. I mean, still got time. It's only 19 years old, maybe 20 at the most. So we still got time here. Just got time. Yeah. And hopefully Shout this weekend Tommy. is the breakout. Right, so we I looked at the chat again, and Tom, Tommy's starting with me already. I just can't. This is why me. I tell you to turn the chat off. We got I another know, one man. from Brandon K. Brandon K says, How would Notre Dame match up with Florida State? What you've seen so far. Furthermore, which college football team do you think we match best with or worst with? Oh, who they match up best with? Uh, Rutgers. Uh, I, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe it's college like, football playoff I teams know, is I what know. he's saying, I guess. I know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who the college football playoff teams are going to be. I think by putting in parentheses, I'm assuming he's meaning the, the, the normals, the normies, right? Bama, Georgia, uh, Clemson, Ohio, Ohio State. State. Those type yeah. of teams, uh, Oklahoma. I mean, Oklahoma I would be the TCU first one. is one of those teams now, yeah. I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, let's, yeah. Say, let's just go with teams in the last five years that have made multiple playoff appearances. You know, I, We'll find out how they match up against Ohio State. I, I think there's areas where Ohio State has an advantage. There's areas where Notre Dame has an advantage, and there's an area where it's strength on strength. Um, we're going to find out. I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to talk about Ohio State in that matchup standpoint, Ryan, because they've only played one game, Ohio State. Right. It wasn't pretty. But again, no. I'm not making week one overreactions. I'm just sure. not. So I need to see how they play. But from what we thought Ohio State would be, I think Notre Dame matches up better against this Ohio State team than they have any of the past Ohio State teams that Notre Dame's had to play against, yeah. in my opinion. As far as Alabama, this is pro- I'll say this, guys. If Notre Dame is who we think they are, and, and part of the problem with answering this question, Brandon, is I, I'm willing to admit that that – I have to remind myself, Ryan, that they've played Navy and Tennessee State. Because otherwise you get too much into the confirmation bias of, I think this team is going to be this. And they showed that in the first two games. That means they are that. And I have to remind myself, like, look, let's pump the brakes. Let's see them do it this weekend. That's why I'm so into this game because it's like, let's see them do it against NC State. If they do it against NC State, then then I'm, then I'm going to say, yeah, I think I might have been right about this football team. Right? Because mm-hmm. I don't want to be that team, that guy that goes out there and – because they dominate two incredibly inferior teams. We're like, yep, 
Bama, here we come. Like we've seen that before. Right. Remember when Vanderbilt started like three and one year and they were like, bring on Bama. And then the next week, Bama like absolutely murdered them. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, you know, you didn't really beat anybody to get to three and you might have wanted to keep quiet on that one. I just want to see kind of this team continue to develop. But just on what I think this team is and what I think those teams are, this is the best Notre Dame matches up with all those teams in a long time as far as the playoff versions of those teams. But I will continue to say, Ryan, that the team that Notre Dame best matches up with from a style of play standpoint is Georgia, and that's always been true, which is why the two times they've played Georgia, they've been close games. Yeah. Because they're very similar. Now, I don't know that – like 2021 Notre Dame would not have matched up well with 2021 Georgia. Uh, you know, last year Notre Dame wasn't in the same ballpark as Georgia. They, they weren't. I'm talking about the good Notre Dame teams. 27 was a good Notre Dame team. 2019 was not a good Notre Dame team, but it was a talented Notre Dame team, which is why they were able to match up with Georgia because it's like, look, I, I didn't think that team was coached overly well in certain areas, but you know what they had? They had dudes – on that offense, Chase Claypool, all right, Cole Komet, Liam Eikenberg, Robert. I mean, they had some dudes on that offense that they were able to, to have some success with. And, and so they were able to kind of, and they had really good athletes, NFL type guys in the front seven on defense. So they, and, and same in the secondary and, and all that type of stuff. So they were able to, to physically match up well with that Georgia team in 2017 to 2019. Other years, right. Notre Dame wouldn't have matched up as well. But when the talent is somewhat on the same plane, Georgia has always been a team that 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 stylistically doesn't present the same type of problems that like a 2020 Bama presented, like a 2018 Clemson presented to Notre Dame. That's that's my view. Yeah. Um, this Georgia team, especially, does not necessarily do that for me. That doesn't mean that I'm saying Notre Dame is better than Georgia. You just asked me matchup wise. I think Notre Dame tends to match up well against Clemson. I think Notre Dame matches up – I mean, Georgia. I think Notre Dame matches up well with Alabama in some areas, but I need to see Alabama this weekend because I want to see what their offensive line is. Because the one thing that would concern me about that matchup, this is a big offensive line. And that that kind of big offensive line would concern me a little bit. And I think Notre Dame has always matched up very well against Michigan. So – that 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 would be one. Well, so I mean, the first part though about Florida State, Brandon, Brandon, I would say this: I actually think that Notre Dame would match up really well against Florida State because I think Florida State's strengths actually play into some of Notre Dame's strengths a lot, right? I mean, because you talk about Keon Coleman, Johnny Wilson, they're going to make their plays, but I mean, you still have Benjamin Morrison and Cam Hart out there, right? right? So like, they're, they're not they're putting Deuce Chestnut out well. there, guys, right, right, right. And then offensive tackle wise. Versus Jared Verse, it's like, okay, Jared Verse is a stud. He's going to make some plays. There's no doubt. But, like, Joe Walt's not going to look lost against him. They're like, going to get theirs gonna against him, battle. too. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Blake Fisher and Joe Walt will be able to still withstand that. And I think that there are some parts of Florida State that you can take advantage of on both sides of the ball. I mean, one thing that we didn't talk about because of the end result, like, Florida State did not run the ball very well against LSU. Mm-hmm. Like, they didn't. I mean, they didn't get a ton of push in the middle. So, I like, I think that Notre Dame – could at least cause some issues inside potentially defensively that would be able to stop that run game a little bit, but at least slow it down to a decent degree. Florida state will still make some plays because they're very talented. I mean, Jordan Travis would get out of trouble a couple of times. A couple of those wide receivers would make some plays. Trey Benson will rip off a good one at some point. It would be a good, really good football game in my opinion, but I think Notre Dame would actually do pretty well. I, I think that Notre Dame would have a very good chance against Florida state, just because I think that a lot of Florida state's strengths Playing yeah. Notre Dame strength. So I think it's, it's a pretty interesting matchup, to be honest. Ryan, I have a question for you. Did you watch the all 22 of that game yet? Not fully, no. Okay, because I have not. Yeah. This is a, yeah. so this is this is an impression I got watching it live. And um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. I felt that if LSU's offensive line was better, there were some really good opportunities in the pass game for LSU. Now was, they yeah. they for yes, for LSU in that game. I now I thought Fentrell Cypress did a really nice job in coverage, but even he got beat a couple times, but the ball was underthrown or yeah. or missed. Now, does Notre Dame have the the talent at receiver that LSU has? Maybe not with Malik Neighbors, but I, I'm not blown away by the other receivers that LSU put on the field. I mean, they that. dropped a ton of so balls, they, man. Yeah. The Thomas kid and then yeah. Lacey had a night to forget yeah. a lot of yeah. drops. So. Yeah. There were opportunities there to throw the ball on Florida State, and I think that still exists to a degree. Yeah. Uh, so – 
um, yeah, I, I think that would be a fun matchup. And look, Notre Dame has seen Jordan Travis before. Uh, Sam Hartman has faced Florida State. Multi, he's three and zero against Florida State. So I mean, I, I think that they would, match, including beating them last year at Florida State by ten. Yeah. So I, I, I another big overreaction this past weekend, right? It's like Florida State's a really good team, but like they're not unbeatable guys. Right, this isn't like, 2013 Florida guys? State guys, exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. they're they're beatable. I believe this is and a I, team that that had some really dumb plays in the first half. I mean, yeah, they LSU was fortunate not to be down a bit more bigger because of Florida State's mistakes, and Florida State was lucky that their mistakes didn't result in them being down more at halftime. Yeah. I mean, it's a sloppy Agreed. first half, but yeah. but kudos to Florida State for turning it on in yep. the second half. Oh, they have some dudes job. on the skill position, man. The wide receivers, yep. the running back, Jaheim Bell played a pretty good game at tight end as well. Like they they got some guys, man. There's no doubt about it. You know, it's weird. I we always talk about the quarterback position in college football this year, as far as like Ohio State has an inexperienced one, Alabama doesn't have a proven guy, like all that. This is the first time in a long time, Brian, I look at like some of the best defensive back developers over the years, the DBUs, right? And I'm like, man, that secondary is not very good. I mean, like Florida State, no. LSU, Ohio State, like those schools don't really have good seconds this year, which is kind of weird. I mean, it's and, weird. And Florida some State of the, you can throw in there too. So. And, and, and if here's the other thing about the, the about that, Ryan. If you – I'll say this, Central Cypress, we've talked about him. Yeah, I've said two things about him. Number one, I think he's a pretty good player. Number two, I think some of this preseason first team All American stuff is a little bit too much He's for him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, still very good. But if you take him out of that secondary, that's a not a very good secondary, in my opinion. So even there, even the good thing about their secondary this year at Florida State, Ryan, is a guy they had to go to the portal to get. Right. It's like saying, well, Notre Dame's doing a great job developing quarterbacks because of how good Sam Hartman's doing. Right. I mean, yeah. to your point, they're not developing secondary really well right now which had been a strength for theirs for a long time. And, you know, even like last year, one of their better run defenders in the second year was a kid that they got from South Carolina. You know, so, I mean, it, it, it is kind of interesting how we're we're seeing a bit of a changing of the guard in college football. That's what's going to make this weekend fascinating, Ryan, yeah. with this Texas-Alabama game is, is we're seeing a little bit of a changing of the guard happening in college football. And it's been happening for a couple years. You're seeing Florida State getting back to – Closer and closer to saying no, we're back on top in the ACC. Now, can that can that can they fi finalize that this year in matchups against Clemson? Find out. But this is the yeah. most vulnerable Clemson has been to Florida State since twenty probably twenty fourteen, right? In, in that particular matchup, and and so uh, same thing in, in the SEC is is Alabama going to get back on track this year, or do they continue their slow descent? This weekend might tell us a little bit about that, Ryan. If they go out there and handle their business that. and whoop Texas pretty good, you're like, yeah, Bama's back to be in Bama. Right? Yeah. Last year was just a little blip. Uh, but yeah. if Texas beats them or at least, you know, kind of bloodies them in a big way, you're kind of like, hey, man, it's like, it's like the when USC lost a couple games late in the 2000s, right? Like they were still the best team in the Pac-12, but you're like, Oregon's coming, Stanford's coming. You could see it. You could see that it was going to happen soon. And that's what I'm very curious to see about. Because, again, Texas isn't just, well, they just lost to some Big 12 team. Guys, Texas is going to be in that league next year. Like, right. what kind of statement would that say about, about where the SEC is, is if Texas is able to go do that? So I'm very curious to see how some of these, these, these games pan out. Because, like, to your point, Ryan, people act like, well, this is just Georgia, Bama, and Ohio State are just going to dominate college football for the rest of eternity because that's what's happening right now. Like, guys, right. can we stop? I was I started watching Swamp Kings today, Ryan. I watched about the half yeah. of the first episode, and Paul Feinbaum made a comment, and he's like, "Dude, if for a few years it just feel like who's no one's going to beat Florida, and they, they won two out of three titles, quick. right? Yeah. It it can yeah. change super quick, man, super yeah. quick. And uh, you know, thirteen and fourteen, Florida State was really freaking good. Within three years, they were an embarrassing program. Yeah, I mean, it can happen really fast. Yeah, it sure can. So, I ended up hating Swamp Kings, by the way. I finished it, and I was like, oh, I didn't really like that that much. Yeah. <laughs> so, let, me, yeah. let me watch it first, and then you and I can yeah. compare notes. So I'm about halfway yeah. through the first episode, and I'm already wanting to punch Urban Meyer in the face. Yeah. So. I, 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 felt, I felt like they left a lot of stuff out, out of that uh, show to not paint the full picture, but we'll yeah. talk. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. <laughs> now, I'm, now, I'm, now I'm intrigued. Now I'm yeah. intrigued. God Country Notre Dame Barbecue says, what's your favorite game time food, both at the stadium and at home? 
well, at home, you- it's wings and pizza, traditionalist. At the games, I usually just do like a hot dogs and popcorn, maybe like something like that. I'm not. Well, actually, I I, I, I change. I take that. I'm outside of Philadelphia, so if I'm going to like an Eagles game or like a Phillies game, then I'll get a cheesesteak from mm-hmm. Tony Luke, something like that in the stadium. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, at the state, I mean, I'm always in the press box, so it's like whatever they serve. Notre Dame has always had a really good chili in the past, but apparently they're not serving that anymore. So all we have is hot dogs. Uh, but um, at home, I'm, Ryan, I'm a mood eater. It's like, what am I in the mood for? Sometimes in the mood for pizza, sometimes in the mood for wings. The yeah. one thing I really like for my wife to make when we are having uh, games is I'll either make like a nachos that I like. So I just put like some tortilla chips, a little bit of salsa, a little bit of cheddar cheese, and bake it. But Angela makes a really good bean dip that we made for, I'm trying to think which game it was. I think it was the. Was it the – yeah, it was before the Notre Dame-Navy game, which is really good. So that would be one thing that uh, whenever she makes it, I'll be in the mood for it. But when it comes like a main course, it just I'm, – I'm, I'm very much like what I'm in the mood for. I may say like right now like, oh, pizza and wings. But then like yeah. Friday, I'm like, yeah, I'm not really in the mood for pizza and wings. I want I want this, whatever the case may be. So uh, it's hard for me to say that. But at the stadium, it's just whatever they have. But I – I've always been a pretzel guy. I was like, if you have a good pretzel at a stadium, yeah. I, I'm going to get a pretzel. But I don't, that's, I don't think that's the question that he was asking. When I go to, out to a bar or something, that's always my go-to is a Bavarian pretzel with like the cheese dip, like yeah, yep. beer cheese. Like, yep. thank you. Yes, please. There's a place at Andra. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's like a Ben's or something like that in South Bend. They have one at the mall, Ryan. They have yeah. really good pretzels. So like next time you're in town, it's uh, University Park Mall. That's probably not very far from where you guys are staying, the hotel you're staying at, I would imagine. I don't think really so. Good. I'll, I'll, I'll really good. And they have a nacho Uh-oh. cheese dip, Ryan. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. I didn't think my – Angela got it for me because they didn't have the cheddar. So she's like, oh, I'll just get him the nacho cheese, see if he likes it. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is really good. Bre- yeah. Breaking news, it is storming – very much right now here in Jersey. So hopefully power doesn't go. <laughs> is that why your internet keeps popping out? I think some people thought I might've like it, kicked it, you out or something like that yeah. for some reason. No, no, no. People... That, that one, I thought it was the internet, but I accidentally hit the, um, my little hookup for my camera. So my oh, camera just froze. That's actually what gotcha. happened there. But gotcha. yeah, man, I just heard a big struck of, of, uh, not struck of lightning, but a big thunder that just went off into the distance. So we'll see how that's not out. good. Yeah, that's, that's not, good. not good. Well, let's Definitely get as good. much out of you as we can. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's use you as much as yeah. Yes. Ian Johnson with the question: Is this the most difficult defense we will face in the regular season? It, no, it's potentially so. the most schematically difficult that they'll face this year. Potentially, I, I could agree with that. But part. yeah, but I don't know that it's going to be at its peak. This is the whole thing I've said. Oh, I think they're getting NC State at the perfect time because. Tony Gibson's breaking in a lot of new players right. and they won't be running in week two the, the, or effectively in week two, the stuff that they'll be as a, running is effectively in week nine. So sure. if you're looking at it from a big picture standpoint, Ian, if we look at what NC state will be on the, in, in, in the entirety of the year, I could say possibly the reason I would say, if I had to give a yes or no, Ryan, the reason I say no is because as much as I love Tony Gibson, as, as much as I respect this defense, you made this point the other day. This isn't the same as last year's defense, at least not yet. Maybe it can be by the end of the year, but the linebacker play is much different this year than it yes. was last year, especially in week two, game two yeah. for them. But uh, I, I think you could make the case, and this is the case that I made, you could definitely make the case that this is the best coached defense they're going to face all year. I, I would, I would agree with that part. Yeah, I would agree with that part very much so. I believe that ultimately, this is my guess, is that I think Ohio State will end up being the best defense. Year two under Jim Knowles, front seven's all coming back. If the secondary is just solid this year, I think that's going to end up right. being a very good defense. Because so. like my my thoughts on, on Ohio State secondary is it's overrated for what people think it yeah. is. Denzel Burke's overrated. He's yeah. overrated for what people make him out to be. All American. He doesn't stink. Yeah, he's a good yeah, football no. player. He just he just yeah. not this elite corner that people make him out to be. Yeah. And that's kind of I how think I, feel La- I think Lathan Ransom's a good football player too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And their their linebacker, their linebacker. What makes Ohio State to me the the most challenging is I think that's probably going to be the best front Notre Dame's going to play all play all year. Yeah, 
Yeah. And that's I would agree. The, and when you talk about Notre Dame in the matchups, that's the groups that you get worried about. Because if they can, if they can, and this is what happened. Pardon me. What happened against Ohio State last year, Ryan, is they were able to win the battle in the trenches against Notre Dame, and yep. Notre Dame didn't have enough skill to beat them. That's what yep. it boils down to, and that's going to be true this year. If this becomes a skill on skill game, I don't know that Notre Dame has the ability to beat Ohio State. Sure. I, I, I don't know that they're there yet. Maybe next year when Jaden Greenhouse is a sophomore, Tobias is a junior. You know, maybe Tyree comes back for a fifth year and he's in, got an extra year under his belt. You get Cam Williams on the roster. You've got Rico Braylon James is going into a year or two, so he's going to be better. You're going to get Mike Mikey Gilbert. Gilbert. Maybe next yeah. year, Benjamin Morrison's a junior. Now Christian Gray's a sophomore. You're getting Leonard Moore on your roster. Jaden Mickey's going to be a junior. Maybe. Maybe then. But right now, Notre Dame has to be able to win, win with where their strength is. Sure. And that's the O-line. And they can't afford to get beat. M- maybe yeah. if it's a stalemate at times and then they win other times, sure. But – and that's what, that's what the fear for, with Ohio State is is yep. that they're able to beat you in the trenches and so, have success. I, 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 watched, I watched a little bit of their defense in the first week from Ohio State. I'll say this. I think the ends are a little bit overrated. I think JT is a good player. I don't think he's the elite player that people act like he is as of now. I think Jack Sawyer is super overrated. Yes. He just do it for me. But that interior is good, man. Yes. Like they got Ty Leak, Michael Hall, Ty Hamilton's a solid rotational player inside. And then Hero Canoe made some plays in that yeah. game, man. I'm like, oh, buddy. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so they're they're like four deep at defensive tackle right now. And they're all pretty yep. good players. All well, and all they ever talk about are the edge players. But to your point, yeah. Ryan, as far as top to bottom, I think yeah. the inside's better. And I think that was true yeah. last year as well. I think their edges have been – Jack Sawyer is incredibly overrated. Yes. And Zach Harrison was never developed the way that Zach Harrison should have been developed in my opinion. No. I, I mean, because I'll put it like this, Brian, is that he still got picked in the third round, Zach Harrison. He played better last year than he had the year before. There's no doubt, but he still didn't reach his ceiling. He got drafted in the third round off of physical tools. Yes. The fact that Ohio State wasn't able to turn him into a first-round pick is a black eye, in my opinion. That yeah. kid's a freak show athlete. Yeah. He never developed into that guy. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, that's, a kid, that's a kid that is six two hundred seventy pounds and in high school – and he has like 36 inch arms and he in high school he ran a 10, eight and tennis shoes. Yeah. Like that's a freak show, man. And you weren't yeah. able to get the most out of him. Not even close, Ryan. I mean, not yeah. even, he had a couple, he flashed a couple games last year, but even last year, which to your point was definitely his best season yeah. at, at Ohio state guy had eight tackles for loss and three and a half sacks. He never, uh, yeah. what was this? This is a kid. He had let's see three and a half, five and a half, let's see eight and a half. This kid had 12 sacks for his entire career. Isaiah yeah. Foskey had almost as many sacks as a junior in college and as a senior in college individually that Zach Harrison had in his entire career. Yeah, That's not good development. Larry Johnson is still living off of what he used to be, not what he is, in my opinion. So, But that's a different conversation for a, a different day, my friend. Yes, yes. And the S trucking LLC with Gabriel Rubio out. Who, what would be your ideal defensive tackle combinations in short yardage? And who would you want in passing downs? Short yardage. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, right? Like is the other team coming out in short yardage, 13 personnel. I'd probably want Rubio and Mills in the game. If you're coming out in 13, you know, if you're coming out in even maybe 12 or even like 11 personnel and it's third and two, I want Howard Cross in the game because I want him shooting gaps. It just depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to hold up at the point of attack, you're going to want your bigger boys in there. If you're trying to shoot gaps and penetrate, and like it, there's two schools of thought, Ryan, and, and it all depends on your personnel. But for this Notre Dame football team, if it's if it's a goal to go situation, I want Howard Cross in the game because I want him shooting a gap, getting low, shooting a gap, getting underneath their pads, and and stop having a tackle for loss. He's he's playing good ball too. Yes, man. yes he ball. is. Yes, he is. So. You know, I, I don't think Notre Dame – Notre Dame's like Rubio and Mills are not guys who are just going to come off in a goal-to-go situation against Bama and just hold their ground and not get moved, right? Yeah. They're they're still going to be a team that needs to penetrate and shoot gaps. And right now, Notre Dame doesn't have anybody that does that better than Howard Cross. And, you know, so it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to have guys hold space so you can shoot your backers and get them free, then you're going to you're gonna want Rubio and Mills in there or maybe even Aiden Kaunana. It just yeah. depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But if, if it was what I wanted to do, it's Mills and Rubio. It's Mills and Cross because I want to p- penetrate. 
Yeah, that's what I, I think the pa- the pass rushing part of the question is also it's also unique too because like, am I running a three man front? Or am I running a four man front in an obvious passing situation? Right. If I, if you're asking me what two defensive tackles would I want in there if I had to keep two on the field in pass rushing situations? It would probably be Riley Mills and Jason Anye for me. I mean, because they both are incredibly long and both explosive. Like they could both kind of bend the track a little bit, which I think is very interesting. So it would pay, probably be Anye and Mills would be my pass rush duo. But Howard Cross could do that stuff too, though. I mean, because right, who had the biggest pass rush against Tennessee State? It was Howard right. Cross. No. Now that was in more of a base down, though, if I yeah. remember correctly. As opposed to, because the other thing too about being in a in a passing situation, Ryan, is sometimes it's not always about your pass rush. And this is, I believe, what you were getting to, right? It's yeah. not always about your pass rush. It's what if they're trying to get rid of the ball quickly? You want those six four, six five guys with long vines getting their hands up. Well, that's one area where Howard Cross is never going to make a huge impact, no, no matter how good he is. But he's it, such a unique that. player because he retraces his steps against screens and quick yeah. throws. He also is plays with incredible incredible motor man like he, that is the one kid that if i was showing tape tapes to a defensive tackle of like how to run to the football consistently it would be howard cross like that kid doesn't take a play off man he flies mm-hmm. to the football i love watching that kid play man. <laughs> i bet you that he lasts in the nfl for a couple years just based upon efforts and his ability to shoot a gap just based upon those things like a Sheldon day type of player. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I guarantee how across the last couple of years in the NFL, just because of that. Yep. All right. Let's here's an interesting comment from a, we have an NC state fan in the house, Ryan, and uh, has this stat line, which is we've known about. And it's very interesting. Yeah. Falcon eight to eight. What's up, man? The stat, no one is talking about NC state is 13 and one at home in the last two years. Go Wolfpack. Quick comment. Yeah. Uh, I believe that stat is correct, Ryan, and because I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at 2020 because they beat Clemson at home two years ago. It's not a very good Clemson team. Yes, yeah, so they have not lost a home game uh, prior to last year. They have not lost a home game since losing to Miami in 2020. Okay. A couple things about that. Number one, their, their one home loss in that stretch was against Boston College, who a week later got beat 44 to nothing by Notre Dame. Just saying. Uh, number two, who, they had a really good home win over Florida State last year. But if you remember watching that game, Ryan, Florida State handed them that game with all due respect. Yeah. I still don't know what they're trying to do on that punt. Still, I still don't know. It's like Kirby Smart's fake against Bam and the SEC. I still don't know what he's trying to do. So, still don't understand oh. what he's trying to do. Oh. They beat Charleston Southern, Texas Tech, UConn, Florida State. They beat a really bad Virginia Tech team by a point. They did have a good win over NC State, and then they lost to Boston College at home. 2021, they had a good win over a not very good Clemson team by six, beat Louisiana Tech, Furman, South Florida, Louisville, Syracuse, and a good win over North Carolina. Right. So, with all due respect, and and it doesn't take away, because look, here's the fun. I've, I had a couple NC State fans like post on the thing, they're like, talking about how like we're not respecting the NC state, NC state defense and i'm like if you're watching our show and you're coming away with the impression that we're not being respectful to the NC state defense you're just some strange person who who doesn't understand what anyone is talking about like we've we i've caught so much flack from Notre Dame fans this week for how much i've praised NC state's defense which is fine i mean it's part of the fun of doing this is is the debate part about it right Sure. But it, 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 but we also have to, you know, let's not overhype it. And that's not exactly like a juggernaut of a home stretch, you know, no. last season. It's not like you, they beat, they, oh, they beat Clemson. That's, well, it's a good name win, but let's not forget who that Clemson team was in 2021. Right. right. I mean, oh, they beat North Carolina in 2021. Yeah. It's a good win. It's a good win. Uh, North Carolina went six and seven that year. Right. Right. I mean, you know, Clemson barely beat Georgia Tech the week before they lost to NC State and barely beat Boston College the next week and barely beat Syracuse the next week and lost to Pitt the next week. I mean, that was not a very good Clemson team. I, I And, again, the I last say, time Notre Dame played Clemson at home, they beat them by yeah. third, 21. I, I, hate, I hate these stats sometimes, too. And, again, this is all due respect intended. But, like, 
it doesn't matter anymore what 2022 NC State did. It doesn't matter anymore. 2021 NC State, it doesn't matter. We're talking about the 2023 team. Right. Are they the same team? I mean, is Drake Thomas still playing? Is Isaiah Moore still playing? Is Devin Leary still playing? Is Devin Carter and, and Thayer Thomas still at wide receiver? Like, these are different football teams at this point. So I, I believe that Notre Dame is going to win on Saturday because I think that they are the better football team. That's mm-hmm. it. That's it. I don't care about the right. trends of they've won 28 straight ACC games. I well, think that there are better teams than NC State. It does matter because it gives context, right? Sure. And what's more impressive, the no, the 28 wins that Notre Dame has racked up or the 13-1 and one that NC State has, right? right? Because lost in the conversation about Notre Dame's, uh, you know, record at home or record against the ACC, you know, last year, let's see, they went 1-2-0 two, two and oh on the road mm-hmm. against the ACC last year. They went one, two, three and zero oh, the year before. Beat Florida State, Virginia Tech, and Virginia. Okay. Twenty twenty, they went one, two, three, four and zero oh, on the road in the ACC. Beat North Carolina, who was good that year, by fourteen. Beat Boston College by fourteen. Beat Georgia Tech by eighteen. Beat Pitt by forty two. Uh, you know, in, in in those road games, I should have mentioned last year they beat North Carolina by thirteen, and it wasn't that close, and they beat Syracuse by seventeen. Uh, and so, again, some context to how convincing those games were. Beat Louisville on the road by 18. Beat Duke on the road by 31. Uh, those were the road games. 2018, they played Wake Forest on the road, beat them by 29. Played Virginia Tech on the road, beat them by 23. Played Syracuse on a neutral field, beat them by 33. So if you want to go back to past seasons and bring in that context, Ryan, like he's doing, what's more impressive what NC State did the last two years against the teams that we routed off or the fact that Notre Dame has not only won, has not lost a road game against an ACC team since 2017, the majority of them have been double-digit wins. Right. I think I think I did this fact. In, in Notre Dame's 28 road, uh, regular season wins in a row against the ACC, 22 of them have been by double digits. Yeah. I Some of those stats sometimes, man, are just so like – Guys, I heard one this morning. This was a great one. Cal has won three straight games against SEC opponents because I think they're playing an SEC team this week. And I'm like, well, I don't it's think like, that really yeah. matters. As and much. when was the last <laughs> time they beat an SEC team? Did they mention that? It was like since 2007, I think, was the three games or something like that. Like, it's a long stretch. Come on, guys. Just, yeah, some of like, these what are we talking like, about here? <laughs> right. So, yeah, we have given all due respect to NC State, but the fact is is they have not played a team at home like this one. Now, if they beat Notre Dame this weekend, that's a huge win for NC State. Oh, no doubt. Because this is a very good Notre Dame team. Yeah. But, yes, there's there's a okay. reason they're a seven-and-a-half-point home dog to Notre Dame. Yeah. Thank you for coming into the channel, though. I was yes. appreciate when and this is a very respectful fans. comment. A very respectful comment. I mean, I got no problem yeah. with it, but it's just it, it just lacks some context, in my opinion. We had God Country Notre Dame Barbecue said all time offense include quarterback, two running backs, tight end, and three wide receivers, O line unit, use all college football teams. Wow. I mean, again, I can only go with with what I've seen. Yeah. And, you know, with what I've seen at quarterback, if I can make a team for a year yeah. with the offense that I would run, I'm, I'm Joe Burrow's my quarterback. So yeah. Um, who would my would running backs be, be? I would also I, be Joe Burrow at quarterback. Yep. I would also be Joe Burrow. I would have Derrick Henry would be one of my running backs. The other one would be my starter would be Barry Sanders for my two running backs. Just because I want that the reason I get Derrick Henry is I want that big physical just punisher to complement with Barry Sanders. Yeah. And his last year was silly too, over yes. two thousand yards. So, yes. Yeah. My three receivers, and again, this is the offense that I would run. I'd have Randy Moss be one of my receivers. I would have Rocket Ismail as one of my receivers. And I would probably go with probably Calvin Johnson. So I'd have Calvin Johnson as my boundary. I have Randy Moss as my as my Z. And I have Rocket as my slot. And my tight end would be Kyle Pitts. That would be my team. Now, because why am I going with that team? Well, I'm going to spread you out because that's what Barry Sanders thrives in inside outside zone out of 11 personnel and I'm going to throw the heck out of the football when I'm not handing it off to Barry Sanders and Derrick Henry. 
that's that's what I would do. Now, there's a lot of other tight ends you could you could consider for that conversation. There's been some great tight ends over the years. You could go with Michael Mayer if you wanted more of a a bigger bodied guy. I mean, there's just been tons of. I mean, T.J. Hawkinson was a heck of a college tight end. There's been plenty of great tight ends. But building the team that I the way I would that would be what I would have. My offensive line, Ryan, and this is just off the top of my head. Orlando Pace is one of my tackles. Jonathan Ogden's my other tackle. Quentin Nelson's one of my guards. Um, I'm biased here. Jeff Fain's my center. That's pure bias. I'll admit it's pure bias, but I love Jeff Fain. He'd be my center. Who my other guard would be? I'd have to think about that one, Ryan. Just nobody's popping off the top of my head of, of another just great college guard. I'm sure, sure I'm missing somebody, but that that would be kind of where I would go with that. So of players that I remember – vividly mm-hmm. not just seeing highlights of it would be joe burrow at quarterback my two running backs would probably be adrian peterson at oklahoma which i mean his freshman year especially he was just stupid man like, he was mm-hmm. so good i'd probably go adrian peterson second running back is a little tough man like derrick henry did pop into my mind i probably want a guy that could catch the ball maybe it, christian mccaffrey at stanford like, what about reggie bush dynamic oh that oh yeah that's a good one Reggie Bush, honorable mention, all purpose to Christian McCaffrey as like my receiving running back. If I couldn't have they, Barry Sanders, Ryan, because let's yeah. say that was before my time, then I would take Reggie. Reggie Bush would be my replacement for him. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah, Reggie Bush and Adrian Peterson as running backs, wide receivers, just based on college teams. I'm not talking NFL here, but one would be Justin Blackman for me. 100 percent would mm. be. Yeah, you've Dude, always been very high on that nuts, one. Nuts, man. He was nuts for a couple years there in college, man. Absolutely nuts. KB1, Calvin Johnson would be another. And then I'll throw the, the Notre Dame bias in here, and I'll say that Will Fuller is going to be my deep threat, a wide receiver. I assume you, you never really saw Randy Moss play is what you're, what you're saying. No, nah, just, just the you NFL. Said guys so. that you've seen. Makes, that's fair. Yeah. That's yeah. Fair. I, I definitely don't vividly remember Randy Moss at Marshall. Yeah. I definitely don't. So that's fair. Those three. Tight end. This might be a low recency, but like – I'd be Brock Bowers for me. <laughs> like Brock Bowers is really good. Man. Yeah. <laughs> a really good player. Um, I'll do him. Offensive line. would uh, Quentin Nelson would definitely be one of my guards. There's no doubt about that. I would go Joe Thomas at left tackle. Right I never tackle. really saw I never really saw him in college a whole lot. Yeah, to be oh, he's with. great, man. He yeah. was just like one of those. He's like he was like he's like what Joe Walt is now. It was just like which he's he getting criticized rest. for. <laughs> yeah, What's that? just does his job every oh, single man. time. Just, did not I, lose reps. Some man. some of the takes Ryan I'm seeing on Joe Wall. He just he doesn't have dominant film. I'm like, then you don't know what dominant film is. Oh uh, yeah, Joe don't don't pay attention to that former NFL yeah. scout guy. He well, he's not the only one that I've seen him. Like that's the crazy thing. I've actually seen other people make like Dane Brugler made a somewhat similar comment, which kind of floored me a little bit. But anyway, that's please continue. I'm sorry. No, no, that's a, that's a weird one for Dane. That's very strange. Another offensive tackle. Oh man, it's tough. There's been so many good ones that mm-hmm. I remember. I mean. Not Alex Leatherwood, huh? Hmm. I'm surprised that one's not just coming yeah. to you right away. I, I I remember saying for the draft, I was like, Alex Leatherwood is not going to go in the first round because the NFL sucks at, at evaluating offensive yeah. tackles. Even worse than quarterbacks, in my opinion, by the way. Yeah. But that's another conversation for another yeah. day. Man, offensive tackle. There's just so many guys, man, that I could pick from. Like, I would love to go Orlando Pace because I remember him with the Rams, but I don't remember him at Ohio State. I've just seen highlights of Orlando Pace. I can't really – pick him in this scenario yeah that's a little bit i mean that was kind of back in the similar to the randy moss era it was the same kind of era yeah man i, I might have to pass on the other tackle for a second i can't i can't even think of another one that was like, like you said there's been guy. a lot of good ones though i mean yeah. um even just recently even the last five years there's been some really really i mean seven eight years yeah. Trent, oh, Stanley. I, I, I'll, I'll throw trent williams at right there tackle when he was at oklahoma let's throw trent williams at right tackle quentin nelson at guard David DeCastro at Stanford was it? Yeah, he was pretty good. Dude. <laughs> he was yeah, he was pretty dude. good. Center, give me Tyler Linderbaum that just played at Iowa. That kid was phenomenal. He was so, pretty good. Um, DeCastro was pretty good in the NFL before injuries. It wasn't it? Oh, wasn't he also pretty good in the NFL he, before the injuries? He's, he's probably gonna be one of those guys that's like a borderline Hall of Famer in the yeah. NFL for several years. He's yeah. gonna be one of those guys. He was fantastic. Yep. All right. Here we go, Ryan. This I'll, I'll ask this one because you can answer it quickly. I, you actually have an uh, Ryan has an article that was published on uh, IrishBreakdown.com within the last ten minutes that addresses yep. some of the Notre Dame recruits that are visiting other places. That's now a new feature we're doing, by the way, that Ryan's doing every week, where we'll have the article of who's visiting Notre Dame on weekends of home games, but he's also kind of putting in where top targets are visiting 
uh, other places as well. But Ian Johnson asked Ryan, are there any recruits we're targeting to be at the NC State game? Yeah, yeah, there's there's two actually that are Notre Dame has offers out to. They're both North, North Carolina guys. One is Jordan Young, safety in the 2025 class, who is a I, I, I put in my article and I believe this. I think that he's the best safety in the 2025 class, yeah. just my opinion. He's been to Notre Dame obviously this past offseason, but yeah, momentum's just kind of died a little bit, right? Like you need to start to impress him a little bit. And I think seeing Notre Dame in person is gonna be pretty big for Jordan Young. The other one is Isaiah Campbell, who's a defensive lineman out of the state of North Carolina. Well, he's listed between 6'4", 6'5", 265, 275, depending on what platform you look at. So he's a bigger body kid. He put Notre Dame this offseason in his top 10, but he's never been to Notre Dame. So, like, maybe seeing him in person will continue to bolster that interest, hopefully. So Jordan Young, safety out of the state of North Carolina, and Isaiah Campbell, defensive end, defensive lineman out of the state of North Carolina as well. I'm surprised they're not having more guys be at, at their game this weekend, like more of the bigger name it was, guys. It was a very small list, man. It yeah. wasn't even that many 2025 kids in general, and those are the only yeah. two that had Notre Dame offers on that list, so it was weird. Yeah, I, well, I have You know why? Because there's a stupid list for the Texas-Alabama game. That's, like, that's, that's also true, stupid yeah. list. <laughs> That's also true. It's also yeah. true. Ugh. Right. Next one is from Ian Johnston with back to back. What do you anticipate being the bigger game with the most ramifications in the regular season across college football? I mean, I I can't tell you just one. I, there's a few games yeah. to me that could have big ramifications this season because again, this is a potential. And, and Ryan, you and I have been hinting about this all off season. There's a potential for a power shift in college football this year with yeah. just where teams are. And I'm not talking about like Georgia not repeating or not three peating. I, I I don't expect Georgia to win it all this year. It's a you can't win it every year. That doesn't mean Georgia's still not an elite team because they're going to be right back at it next year and, and and all that type of stuff if they don't win it this year. What I'm referring to are sort of like some of the recent dynasties just not being that anymore, right. or some teams that if you don't step it up this year, you could find yourself losing a lot of luster. And those are the games that I look at. And then there's also teams like Notre Dame and Florida State that have the chance to kind of have that we're back moments, right? And and those are teams that I kind of look at. Like, so Clemson, Florida State in three weeks. Well, it's now two weeks from tomorrow. That's a big one because if, if Clemson doesn't get a lot better in a short yep. period of time, that's a huge, huge paradigm change in college football. It it could it could signal the end of the Clemson dynasty for what it is. It's already dying because they just haven't been the same since 2019, right? And but this could be the end because this could be Florida State saying, no, we're back to being the power in the ACC. So like now, not only are you not a power for a championship, but you're not even a powerhouse in your you're not even the power in your league anymore. I think that's a big one. I think the Notre Dame Ohio State one is a is is one of these. Because again, it's it's Ohio State can have that don't count us out yet moment and and that game. And then I would also throw Ohio State Michigan as one because if Michigan beats Ohio State for three years in a row, that that then it's true. It's no more of well, just Michigan just happened to have their number for a couple years. It's now a a, a, a paradigm shift in the Big Ten. Ohio State is no longer the top team in the Big Ten because I'll still say, look. I know that they beat them two years in a row, but that to me is no different than when Ole Miss beat Alabama two years in a row back in 13 and 14, or was it 14 and 15? I forget what the year was. Remember that when Ole Miss beat Alabama like back-to-back -back years? That was oh, yeah. nothing but a – okay, you had that just kind of that fluky two-year stretch, but Alabama was still the team. Right. But if Michigan beats them three years in a row, that to me is a, is a power shift in that league. And if that's coupled with a loss to Notre Dame – the, I, I think we're going to see a major change in how Ohio State is perceived around the country, in my opinion. But if Ohio State wins those two games, then that sends an, an equally powerful message that I think Ohio State then uses to build off of, right? You, you know what I mean, right? Like, no, 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 yeah. we're fine. We had a couple years where we weren't ourselves, but we're back. Yeah. And we're going to show you all who we are. I, I think. I think that's one. I think set tomorrow could be one, Ryan, Texas and Alabama. Uh, could I, be. If Texas goes on the road and beats Alabama, I will not have a Texas back 
conversation. Because one game does not mean you're back. Texas would have a lot to prove. It would have it would say more about Bama to me than it would about it would say a lot about Texas, but it's like, okay, Texas, that's fine, but let's see you do this, 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 and this. Right? Let's see how you respond to success. But it would say to me, Ryan, a lot about Bama. A that's lot great. about Bama. That would be like a Bama's still really good, but they're not what they were anymore. Yeah. And 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 they're officially no longer that team. That's what it would say to me. So I think the, off the top of my head, Ryan, I mean, there's other games we can look at. Those four that we just kind of mentioned there are ones that pop in my head. And I think you could make a case that depending on on how Florida State does the rest of the year, we could look back at the LSU game and as, as potentially that, depending on how those two teams do rest of the year. I don't think it is right now because I think LSU is overrated. But if I'm yeah. wrong about LSU and they're actually going to be as good as people think, but Florida State was just that much better, then it, it, the story will be different. The, the Florida State LSU story has not been finished yet. It, it's going to be finished by how those two teams traject the rest of the year. I mean, you, you you get what I'm saying, Ryan? Like if if LSU gets back on track and just goes on a run, you say, "Hey, man, that, that Florida State win is looking really good right now." But if they like lose to Bama again, you know, lose end up losing like maybe three four games again, you're like, "Yeah, LSU just wasn't who we thought they were." And, and right. Brian Kelly will be right. We're not the team I thought we were. And I think he is right. They're not the team everybody thought they were, in my opinion. But sure. that could change. So I don't have that game in there yet, but I could retroactively add it depending on how those two teams play. Any other games yeah. that kind of pop in your head, Ryan, for, for that type of uh... – I mean, you met, you mentioned the two that were on top of my head, but Ohio State Michigan's one that's annually, right, and then especially with Michigan winning back-to-back years. I mean, is it – because if it's a three-peat, you have to start to look like, huh? I'm a state might have to change something here. I'm not talking about changing head coaches. I'm talking about changing something though, about how they're running the program. If you lose to Michigan in three straight years, there needs to be something there. Michigan, Ohio state's a big one. I also think, I still think Clemson, Florida state's going to be a pretty big one, man. Like yeah. I think that that has a lot of relevance to this. Like is Clemson yep. recover after this? And are they that team? It would obviously be a lot more impactful today if they had beaten Duke. Right. But like, I think that one still matters though. Yeah. In the end of the day, I think it really does. So, We'll see how everything kind of shakes right. up, but I, I really, that's those are the two biggest games for me that have really like popped in my head, honestly. Because to your point, Ryan, we've seen Clemson do this before, guys. Yeah. I mean, a year where Clemson won a national title, they lost at home to Pitt, right? And yeah. another year where Clemson was the number one seed in the college football playoff, they lost on the road to a four and eight Syracuse team. This is not like, oh my God, Clemson's never had a game like this before, right? It was, right. if if to your point, Ryan, if they go, if in three weeks they'd smack Florida State and then go beat Notre Dame, it's like, yeah, they had a bad first game. It, it is what it yeah. is. We've seen it. It's no different than when Ohio State lost to Virginia Tech. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think they're going to run the table, but it could. But to your point, Ryan, the Florida State game will say a whole lot more nationally than what the Duke game does in either direction. If they beat Florida State, it's like, this is why y'all don't react to one week. But if Florida State goes to Clemson and beats Clemson, that's sort of a – we've seen a shift. We've seen a changing of the guard in that league, which then has Cape national Cl- ramifications. The Cave Klubnik stuff is pretty wild too, man. Like the, it's, it's like Tobias Merriweather that we just talked mm-hmm. about earlier. It's like – it just took it made a second start in college football, guys. Like, right. how do we how are we gonna just kind of sit there and be like Cape Klunick stinks? He's not gonna be good. It's like maybe he won't be great. Maybe he'll be great. I don't know what Cape Klunick will end up being, but like it's way too early to have that distinction, in my opinion. Way it reminds me he's getting the Marcus Freeman treatment. Yeah. Because remember all the people like, Marcus Freeman lost his first two games to Oklahoma State and the Fiesta Bowl and and uh Ohio State. And then lost to Marshall, and it's like he's not that guy. And I'm like, well, can we let him coach like just one full season before we, you know what I mean? And uh, you know, he we're still learning about him, just like we're still learning about Kate Klubnik. But uh, it's just, it's going to be interesting, right? Speaking, we of had Clemson, a question from Salty who says, "Is Dabo Sweeney a dinosaur in today's college football, and is Clemson's dynasty over?" I mean, I, I I just really dislike that sentence because Dabo doesn't want to do it the same way everybody else does. He's a dinosaur. And I saw somebody else like, the players don't react to, Clem- to Dabo. That's, you know, part of the reason why Dabo doesn't have to go to the portal is really lose guys from the port- into the portal. I mean, who was the last guy that Clemson wanted to keep that they lost in the portal? I'm trying to think of somebody. I really can't think of anybody. 
Um, like, I mean, some of the guys that have left of guys they wanted to leave, you know, Ches right. Malusi was buried in the depth chart, right? Like, right. they haven't really lost a lot of guys they wanted to keep. Le- Levante Bellamy, did they want to keep him? I know he transferred. He had, he was, know. he was again, was not playing a ton. Yeah. So, I mean, Dabo's problem is not to me the, 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 the port. Now, do I think Dabo should embrace the portal the way that Notre Dame does? Sure. I think he should. Does he need to to adjust the manner in which he discusses NIL? I believe so, because I I think and I I think Dabble should be fighting leading the charge for NIL being done the right way. Right, that's what Dabo should be fighting for. If you believe in in certain things, Dabo about about you know players and all that, and I think Dabo is coming from the right a, a, a good place because he does care about his players. That's why so many of his former players coach for him now. Yep. You know, is is there, there? There's a lot of loyalty for Dabo. I know a lot of people that don't like Dabo don't think that. Oh, kids don't want to play for him. Yeah, they do, clearly, because they keep getting really good players. Um, but he's got to be willing to say, "This is where life is. This is where I think it should be." So I'm going to embrace these things, but I'm going to do it the way that I think it should be done. And that's where I think Dabo's missing the boat a little bit. Is he should be talking about NIL in a way that's right for college football. Be that leader. Right. Don't just say this whole thing and just throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, which I'm very curious where that expression came from. But, uh, you know, th- th- those are the things, Ryan, that it's like, that's where I don't disagree with his stances. I disagree with some of the ways in which he is expressing his stances. Uh, right. Is the Clemson yeah. dynasty over? I think so. But I don't think. A couple years. Ago. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it was over in 2021. I think it was over when Trevor Lawrence left. That's because, yeah. and you and I have talked about this, Ryan, since you got on the show. I've been saying this for for years. I've been tweeting about this for years. Once Trevor left, I've said this. He mat him and Travis Etienne masked holes in that program that were already there, right? That they were able to kind of overcome. And once he wasn't there anymore, they got exposed. And and. um so I think it's been true for a while. I think Dabo had a really nice run of about five years, uh, and I don't think they're that program anymore. But I don't think it's because he's not embracing NIL and transfer portal because I think they're, they're, the end of their dynasty was was before that became a thing. Right. I think this has maybe expedited it a little bit. Yeah. Maybe. And that, now it's an adjustment period for Dabo in the program, right? right? Like what are the steps to be able to get back? Cause it's not going to be the same for each program, right? Like what works right. for Alabama and Georgia and Clemson and Florida state and every other team that is trying to make that jump is not going to be like, it's just not, it's not usable for every program, the thought process and how you build something. Right. So how Clemson built it, it worked because you had two elite quarterbacks in right. that, process as well I, I would argue three it, just because i think that taj boyd taj laid boyd. the foundation that led to deshaun White. he wasn't in their same level ryan but i think right. taj beating ohio state and taj beating florida state for the first time and taj beating lsu to me is the thing that that set the stage for deshaun and then trevor but to your point he still had that dynamic player quarterback and he hasn't been good when he hasn't had that kind of guy Sure. To your point, I just all I would say, Ryan, is just add that one kid to it because I think I don't think Taj gets enough credit for being the the sort of the OG in this this era of really good Clemson football, right? Nice player. Um, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. so yeah, I, it's interesting. We had a question from Brandon K. He says, "What's the most creative play you've seen from Parker so far this season, Jared Parker?" Hmm. Most creative play. I think we saw it in the first series of the game. Honestly, Ryan, I think it was that screen pass to Audric Estime, the, yeah, the blitz beater screen on the first play of the game. I mean, it's just like yeah. you ran right it's inside like a of the slide first. screen. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, that was that hit right outside the blitz. I mean, yeah, it just nice that, that was probably the most creative play that we've seen. We haven't seen a ton of creativity, but that's okay. I, I don't need to see you inventing, reinventing the wheel. I don't. You see a lot of that. diversity, but like nothing that's like, oh yeah. man, what an incredibly right. drawn up play. Like, yeah, I, agree. I think creativity can be very overrated. I've said this before. I, I think it can be very overrated. You need to be able to do what you do, but find ways to do it that allow you to take advantage of your strengths and the opponent's weaknesses. That's that's what play calling and play designing is to me. It's not let me invent this thing and that nobody else has done. 
I think the most – I'll say this, Ryan. I think the most creative play callers are guys that are very creative in the screen game. That's something I very much enjoy about Lincoln Riley. The thing that I watch – when I watch Lincoln Riley's offense, the only time I watch and I'm like, wow, that guy is, does some stuff, is his screen stuff. I mean, he's got some really inventive screen stuff. The rest yeah. of it's like, yeah, that's pretty much what uh, somebody else is running and that's what somebody else is doing and, you know, and that's what somebody else is doing. And, yeah, it looks good. Because I would say that that – Lincoln Riley to me is is no different than any other great coach. When he's had really really good quarterbacks, his teams have been really really good. When he hasn't, like when he had Spencer Rattler, they weren't that good. Right. Right? So, um and that's not a shot at him, Ryan. That's just true of just yeah. about everybody in college football for the, except for uh Kirby Smart. I like I like watching the run game from Chip Kelly. He's a very creative player in the in the run game. Very, you know what's funny is I, I was watching the Chiefs obviously last night. I remember there was a story about how every week Andy Reid allows the players to put in one play, and it's always like some cra- crazy creative <laughs> plays. Like, all right, we'll run it this week. Why not? So like they do a bunch of like you know shovel passes and like all this type of stuff, which is just funny out of different looks. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Got a couple from Salty here, Ryan. So he says, are you a fan of argument sports talk on TV, e.g. example, Stephen A. Smith, and do you watch shows like First Take? No and no. I, I, I like debate. Those aren't debate shows. Though I think he used the word argument appropriately. Like I, I watched this exchange I, ran a, I mentioned on the show the other day between Michael Irvin and, and, and Richard Sherman, and I'm like, this isn't – conversation this is just shouting at each other because neither guys like yeah. like richard sherman wasn't listening to what michael Irvin was saying and, and i understood what my, i mean michael Irvin was correct in what he was saying but like richard sherman what they were just yelling at each other and and Keyshawn, i think it was Keyshawn was like trying to like Keyshawn johnson was trying to be the voice of reason think about that for a second right he's like yeah. guys calm down like this is what michael's trying to say they're just yelling at each other and and they do it because that's what people want it's the show i don't like that it's like I watched the Republican debate a couple weeks ago and it's just like, this is so childish. They're just like screaming at each other and just like no one's having a grown up conversation right now. I can't stand that. I like debate. I like you make your case. I'll make my case and we can have a back and forth and there, there needs to be a level of civility to it. That doesn't mean civility does, doesn't equal a lack of passion, Ryan. It doesn't. I, I like passion, but I just can't stand like the screaming each other. And the other thing about these argument shows, Ryan is, Nobody's intellect, like very few people are like intellectually honest. Like, you know, people are taking views that they don't believe. Lou Samoji and I used to do a thing on the magazine and it was called a point counterpoint. And the thing that Lou and I always agreed on is we'll never pick a topic that we don't genuinely have a difference of opinion on. We would never pick a topic and you'd say, okay, you believe that. Well, I kind of agree with you, but I'll make the argument in the other direction just to have a counterpoint. If that was the case, we'd pick a different topic. And, and that's the thing is like you just like with Skip Bayless, especially he's the worst because he just comes across as the most disingenuous to me. Yeah. And and that's just kind of what like like with Stephen A. Smith. I mean, it's 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 show. He admits it's show. But I never I've never in the times I've watched him felt like he was making a dishonest argument, like he didn't actually believe what he said. He might be hyperbolic. He might be doing this. But like when I watch Skip Bayless, I'm like. That dude doesn't actually believe that. Yeah. Babe. Like, there's no way he actually, it's just, a. Sh- it's nothing but the show. To me is, I believe this, but we're going to do it in a way that's fun and entertaining. Okay, I can live with that, whatever. But these argument shows, man, I just, I get nothing out of that. For me, I get nothing out of that. Yeah. That's not debate. That's just shouting at each other and playing to people's emotions and just feeding the, the lowest common denominator to me. I just, that's not for yeah. me. We'll never I, be. I haven't, I haven't watched those shows since I was in like high school, I think. So it's yeah. been a long time. So yeah, I don't watch those shows. I did see the one clip of, it was a few months ago. Skip had said something disrespectful, and Shannon Sharp had like legitimately got angry at him. Yeah. Like he was like, "Move, let's move on. Like let's move on." I was yeah. like, oh, that's yeah. tense, man. That's pretty tense. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say this: some of those guys have a little bit more self control than I do because some of the stuff's yeah. like, dude, if you ever talk to me like that we're gonna have a problem like did you see the thing with benjamin watson on espn a few months ago like some dude said something about like benjamin watson's wife or something trying to be funny and it was like they they played it off like it was a joke but i was like i think benjamin watson because the guy the other guy that said it wasn't on the segment when they came back peter burns i think so it was okay and i was like i bet you they had some words in the break 
Like I would oh, mess with Angel Watson, man. That's a pretty big guy. Nope. <laughs> That's a pretty nope. big dude. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. He was a crazy right. actor. You remember when he uh, yeah. hawked? Who did he, was it? Champ Bailey? He hawked down at the sideline coming from across the field. Javan Benjamin Watson. There was an interception. And he hawked someone down. I thought it was Champ Bailey. I could be wrong, but it was a crazy play. For I think it was. I think I think you are correct on Champ. I'm actually, yeah, it was Champ. Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember that because, yeah, I think it was Champ. Benjamin Watson could run, man. That kid yeah. could run. Yeah. <laughs> Yeesh. He's from Georgia, right? Yeah, he's a Georgia tight end. Yeah. Yeah. That kid could fly, man. Wasn't that great of a receiver, but, like, he yeah. could run. Uh, Jacob Saylor with a super chat said ran into NC State fan down and is it Napanee, Indiana? Is that how you pronounce it? I guess. Napanee? Yeah. Okay. He was confident in their quarterback and unworried about us. What would a 21 plus win, 21, 21 plus win do for Notre Dame in national conversation? I don't think it does anything for Notre Dame in the national conversation other than just get people to continue to talk about, like, maybe this team is better than we think. But, but we still need to see it against Ohio State. Bingo. Like, yeah, what I think it does is it – every time Notre Dame does this, all it really does is just change the perception of that particular fan base for a period of time. That, yep. That's really all it does. It would it would have a big impact in what the, national, what the ACC media thinks. And uh, like I, the, the the whiny takes from ACC media in the last several months about Notre Dame's place in the ACC and all that it's just hilarious. So I'm always rooting for Notre Dame to just pound teams because I just I just those tears just make me kind of laugh. It, it it all it changes is it's it solidify. If you already thought Notre Dame was good, it just okay. Yep, confirmation. If if like Joel Klatt's not gonna like, did you see his ranking this past? Or Josh Pate and Joel Klatt both had like really. Joel Klatt released like his, you know, he does his top 10 and then like the next in line and he didn't have Notre Dame in, yeah. even in the next in line. That's if Notre true. Dame goes and beats NC State, guess what? NC State's not on Fox, so it's not going to change Joel Klatt's opinion of Notre Dame. Just sure. not. You got to wait for the Ohio State game to do that. To people that, the the people that already think Notre Dame's good, it's confirmation that they're already good. It would d- dramatically change what ACC fans think of Notre Dame. They, none of them think Notre Dame has any skill on offense. They just think Notre Dame's a bunch of big physical dudes are going to beat them up. That's what they think. So if Notre Dame goes out there and they hit some home runs and they throw the ball all over them, then they're going to kind of be like what Georgia fans were when Notre Dame played Georgia. Like, wow, Notre Dame's a lot more athletic than we thought we were. They were, you know, like, you know what ACC fan base treats Notre Dame with the most respect that I've experienced? Clemson, Clemson yeah. fans, because they're like, you know what, this team, this team is like giving us some games. Like I've met Clemson fans that will sit there and say the same thing we do about that 2018 playoff game. That game was a lot more competitive than the score indicates. And, and they have a lot of respect because they've seen Notre Dame go toe-to-toe with Clemson time and time again, and sometimes Clemson gets the better of it, sometimes Notre Dame gets the better of it. But there's a level of respect for how good Notre Dame is that you don't see for other ACC teams, which is weird. You know, like, like Notre Dame's beat Florida State three times in a row. Florida State fans have zero respect for Notre Dame. I don't understand it, like, but it's just it's just weird. And um, so this the game doesn't change any of that. And my, it, it'll just change the opinion of NC State fans. It's about I'm, it. I'm so sh- it's so strange to me that that NC State fans would think that like cool. You think Brandon Armstrong's good? It's great. Cool. You're not worried about Notre Dame at all? Like seriously? That's a take that's out there. That's so yeah. strange to me, man. I, I don't understand yeah. that at all. Yeah. Uh, it just. Yeah. All due respect, but Notre Dame has more of a reason to not be worried about NC State than NC yes. State does not to be worried about Notre Dame. 100%. Like, that's crazy to me. 100%. Crazy. It, right, because the last time NC State had a really good team, like I would argue that the 28-17 team was Dave Dorn's best team, in my opinion. I, I, I would make that case. I don't know if you want to like pound on the table for a different one, Ryan, to be his best team. I need to think about it. I need to look at Ross. But that was the like, that 2017 team was the team that won nine games. They had Bradley Chubb. They had, you know, they had all those players. They had uh, they had um, uh, Ryan Finley was their quarterback. They had Naheem Hines on that football team. Like, you know, Jalen. Uh, uh, they had Jalen Samuels on that football team. Kelvin Harmon was on that football team. Jacoby Myers was on that football team. Uh, Justin Jones, Contavious Street. Uh, we talked about this. Jermaine Pratt was on that football team. Like that was a really good football team, and Notre Dame beat the absolute crap out of them. So, like, I don't understand why NC State fans don't have more respect for Notre Dame. 
but this weekend will give them a chance to to prove that. But it, it, a lot of it just comes down to the the laziness of analysis. People hear what they they hear the lazy analysis about Notre Dame nationally, and they just buy it. That's the reality of it. But there are some Notre Dame fans that have kind of bought into the lazy analysis about NC State, in my opinion. Sure. So it, it, it happens. Had our next question was a super chat from Tommy to, Tommy Tony Spicali. Thank you so much for the super chat. Go Irish. I live in Raleigh and this is a very winnable game. I will be there tomorrow. Nice. Enjoy Jealous. it. Enjoy it. I'm hopefully I'll bump into some of y'all when I'm walking in. Got a big super chat here from Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Wow. You guys That's are great. Go Irish. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate Brandon. that very, very much, man. Appreciate that very much. Help pay for gas on the way down to Raleigh tomorrow, man. I appreciate that. It's a, it's a gas is expensive, man. Lucky Ducks, 512 with the Super Chat. Thank you so much. Baby out with the baby water comes from a German proverb. Das Kind mit dem Bob. I'm not reading that. Ach, Earliest shooting. record came. Yes. Yeah, you, you can read that. Earliest yeah, record came in Appeals to Fools school. by Thomas Murner. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Appreciate that. There's a lot of weird sayings like that, man. Like, yeah, yeah. I, so I was like with my mom pig, yesterday. Even pigs don't have sweat glands. Like, yeah. Kind of stuff. Like I, uh, I was, I, I was with my, I was actually was talking to my mom or my wife. I forget. I think my mom in the car yesterday. And I said, you know, can't don't count your chickens before you hatch. And I kind of paused and I said, that's one of the few old expressions that actually makes sense. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just like that one I get that one I get. Yeah, there's a bunch that don't make any sense though. <laughs> Fighting Irish fan 91 with a super chat. Thank you so much. Says, I know you're skeptical of using a spy, but if you had to pick, who do you pick? Tim Priester said, Marist, I worry he may not be assignment sound enough. I I mean, I, I get that concern, but he's also the longest and the rangiest. And yeah, I would that, use Marist it, as well. <laughs> if you're gonna use a spy, Ryan, you've got to use the longest, rangiest guy if if all things are equal. I yep. I I just that makes the most I sense. I actually I talked about this on Monday, I think, but I actually wouldn't be opposed to using a spy at times in this football game because explain the at times. Yes, because I believe that a spy is an interesting use. One, if your linebackers aren't great coverage players and two, if you have the ability to play some more zone than man, because the issue that happens with spies is when you're playing man coverage and the spy isn't able to make the play, then all oh, snap, right. son. Everybody's back's turned. That's not good, right? But it, against NC State, I think you can mix in a lot of zone if you felt like if you were Notre Dame because I just don't trust the wide receivers to be able to take advantage of zone covers. Like, I just don't. I don't think that there are guys mm-hmm. that I look at and say, like, they're going to seams, they're going to find space specifically. Like, I just don't have a big opinion of them. And then also, I think mix and matching zone coverage is good against a scrambling quarterback obviously, right? To keep your eyes towards the line of scrimmage. So I would not be opposed to a spy occasionally, not an every down spy against Brandon Armstrong. It's not that serious guys. It's not, but if you want to mix and match it, if he's hurting you a little bit and you want to throw a spy in there occasionally and run some zone coverage behind him, I'm good with that, man. Because at the end of the day, there could be a situation later on the football game where if it's competitive, Brandon Armstrong is your worst nightmare in that type of situation. It's comparative to, the rest of the skill position. I'm just not scared of the wide receivers. I'm not scared of the running backs. Brendan Armstrong hurt me with my feet is the one thing that I'm like, I'm a little tiny bit worried about that right. potentially. Like I'm a little tiny bit worried. I said the other day and I, and I stick with it. This is just my philosophy on a spy. I'm good with it on third and long and it makes sense on third and long. I'm not a fan of it in base downs. I think the only time you go to it, Ryan is to your point is if somebody's hurting you with it and you need an answer, like, that this thing for me, as far as the, the the zone versus man thing, everything you said makes sense, Ryan. I just feel like with this Notre Dame team on first and second down, they're just that you'd have to go away from who you are. But Notre Dame does a pretty decent job on third down of mixing up, mixing up, <laughs> mixing up zone and man. That's when they do a right. pretty good job to that, which fits into what you're talking about, Ryan, which is in those third down situations. That's what I'm most concerned about. Brandon Armstrong is him extending drives on third down in those situations, and he may think, "Hey, I've got man here." And so let's do this check, and and he's going to think I can either hit this throw or I can take off running, and then next thing you know, Notre Dame's not bringing man, and they're they're zone dropping Maris to the middle of the field, and he takes off running, and Maris is like, gotcha, boom, downhill right. make play, right? Exactly. Like those are the times when I'm okay with it, especially in the third down situations. So um, 
I, I, yeah. I think we're, we're, we're a lot closer on our view of the spy than I thought yeah. when you first started explaining well, it. And I, I would say this too, Brian, is even if Notre Dame wanted to stay more in the man looks that they typically run, they, they, they blitz back or so often. Right. And a lot of times it's not effective. So like what's the difference between just spying a guy rather than blitzing his head against the yeah. wall? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it just, that might actually be more effective. Like if Meryl Sloyfeld isn't blitzing and just running into a guard down his chest, right. wouldn't it be more beneficial to actually just kind of mush rush a little bit and then have space to work with a little bit? Yeah. I don't know, man. What I'd say is just drop into coverages and then have them rally to the quarterback when he takes off running. Like to your point that so, like what they were doing last week where the, they would come and hit the line and they just kind of stand at the line. They did that crap last year. And I think that's so stupid. What, what, yeah. what are you doing there? Because if that guy gets outside contained, you don't have a linebacker athletic enough. I don't care who you have, unless you got the reincarnation of Jalen Smith coming to your football team. Yeah. You don't have a Mike linebacker, a will linebacker that can crash the line, just stay there. And then if a guy breaks contain outside, can go chase him down. You do not have sure. that guy. And yet we continue to see him do it. And I just, it, it just won't make sense to me. It'll never make sense to me, to be completely honest with you. But it is. I'd rather, I'd rather get creative and like put some guys off the slot at times yeah. or like do different stuff. Bring Benjamin like, Morrison on a corner fire, right? And drop Harris under, you know, drop even, board, man. Like, Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. We had from Salty Virginia Peanuts who says Pat McAfee debuted on ESPN with Aaron Rodgers, Peyton Manning, and Adam Schefter. Is Pat McAfee now the face of sports talk in America, and does ESPN hurt or help? I have no idea about Pat McAfee. I have no clue. I've watched his show once. To him. That's all I know. Yeah, I watched him once. Um, it just wasn't my cup of tea. Going to ESPN, it's going to be kind of like people that are, are are part of his groupies, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. Are going to follow him wherever he goes, but there's going to be a it's going to be a part of his audience that is just not going to follow him over because they just don't like ESPN, but that's going to then get negated by the people that are just ESPN people that will just start watching a show. Right. right? And so as far as see the face of, I don't have a no, I don't have a clue. I, I no right. idea. I don't, I he, didn't ask. I didn't, I've never listened. I don't listen to him. I don't, I don't know anyone like literally, I don't know a single person that I know that I talk football with. It's like, did you hear what Pat McAfee said about this? I think that's more for just the normies and the people who just like, like, I think it's the show and the way he, I, I, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I think I, it is. I think his fans going to hurt Matt McAfee a little bit, to be honest, because to the question though, sort of, I mean, a lot of people listen to Pat McAfee. They do like a lot of people love that show and cool. Whatever. If that's your, that's, that's your cup of tea, that's your cup of tea. The one thing though, Brian is that, like, he's got some vulgar language though, man, yeah. of his shows. Like he speaks very, like he's not going to yeah. be able to do that on ESPN. So well, he, they, they said that he's still going to say those things. He's just going to try to not to say them as much. That's what they huh. said. And then he put some kind of disclaimer on the show yesterday and it's just like, okay, whatever. It's not going to be one of those situations where like they're bleeping them all the time. Right. Is that where we're going? Well, with this? I read like, some <laughs> tweet yesterday that they're going to talk. They're actually going to play his quote unquote live show on a bit of a delay to try okay. to, um, but I'm like, but, but like to him, I'm like, but why do that? It's just a, it's a money grab, which, you know, I'm, I'm, whatever, man, go do what you go do. You worked hard to build your brand up to where you could capitalize on it. I got no problem with that. I really don't. Right. I really don't. But just, just know that you can't be you anymore. Like the, not to the degree that you were before, which whatever. I yeah. think he's going to be crying all the way to the bank, you know, with, uh, with his big giant checks. I think he'll be fine. He'll be fine. It's just, and I got no beef with Pat McAfee. Respect to him. It's just not my cup of tea. I just and salty. They the ESPN is definitely counting on him being the face of sports. Yeah, talk because that's why they give him that contract. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I just feel like the ESPN. They're just throwing stuff up against the wall and trying to find something that sticks. I mean, that's just really what. It comes. But the problem with ESPN, to your point, Ryan, I think you nailed it. Is they keep bringing in these entities that are popular and they're not letting them continue to be. Like his sh his shtick's right. gonna die a little bit, right? right. Like it's not gonna be as authentic as it typically is. I mean, say yeah. what you want about Pat McAfee, I don't agree with a lot of the stuff he says. I think it's very biased. A lot of it, like he was trying to convince people before the season that like West Virginia is gonna be a good team this year. I'm just like Pat, mm -hmm. no man, you don't believe that. You just went yeah. to West Virginia. That's the only reason you're right. saying this, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't agree with a lot of this stuff, but like he is entertaining at times, yeah. right? Because he's kind of like uppity, he's kind of like super like you know, stands up and like moves around and all that type of stuff. He can't do a lot of that stuff on ESPN now, right? Like the yeah. shtick's gonna die a little bit. So the authentic authenticity of him, I think, is gonna be pulled back a little bit, which is yeah. gonna hurt him as well. 
the 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 thing for me, Ryan, is like, I don't know. I just it's not my cup of tea. But I have nothing. Nothing. Look, I have no. I have no lack of respect. I don't lack respect for people that work hard. I respect people that work hard. And yeah. Pat McAfee has seen to it has worked hard building up his brand, and he did it in a way where he was true to himself. Yes. Now his self is not my cup of tea. That's okay though. That doesn't well, it's, make it's like, it wrong or bad. It's just not for me. It's it's you like busting with the boys with um who's it Taylor Taylor the one and then the the yeah. linebacker that Will used Compton. to play in the end. Yeah, Will Compton. It's like yeah. they worked hard. Good for them. I don't yeah. personally like the At all. flow of that show. So like At that's all. not me. But like you know, yeah. if people like it, they like it. That's cool. Whatever. Yeah. It's like to me, it's like it's the it's the meat wad show, right? Yes, like just yes, that yes, that yes. that typical stereotypical male that just drinks all the time and does stupid things. It's like the football version of jackass kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, just, it's just not my thing, but more power to them. You know, they've built yeah. their brand up. I have no pro. What I don't like is people who get falsely propped up. Right. That, that I don't particularly care for, but I don't sure. I don't believe that was happening with Pat McAfee. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, he's earned it and props to him. It's just not my, it's not, I, I, look, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I like stats. I like, debate i like discussion i like getting into the weeds of matchups and x's and o's and all that and that that's that's what i like and there's not a lot of that out there that does that which is why we do it i mean that's right you know it's part of it coleman smith said thoughts on chip kelly's comments on the clock didn't see what his comments were yeah let me, sure let me see if i can find it because i've heard a couple people talk about this and and from what i have been told about it i i kind of i kind of like what he's saying let's uh he says kelly spoke forcefully against the new okay he blasts the new clock rules let me find the quote from chip kelly okay. uh, he said um these rules these new rules are crazy we've had four drives in the first half hope you guys are selling a lot of commercials and, and he has gone on to say other things about it like look this is the thing that drives me nuts and this is exactly what we said was going to happen the games aren't that much shorter time wise there are a lot less plays but what you're seeing, Ryan, is like the Notre Dame game was like, what, like three hours and I think like 15 minutes against Tennessee yeah. State because they just there was a period of time where they had three commercial breaks and two ran two plays. Did you say like three hours three and plays. 15 minutes? It's it like three hours and 15 minutes Yeah, is the time that the game went. Gotcha. And you're like, why? Because they just they just added, hey, the time we're saving from football, we're going to add commercial breaks. That's what they're doing. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's a, it's a and ploy to make the more most, money. And we all knew that that was what it was about. We've like, here's my thing, Ryan, to say, I'm not going to get into randoms. I just wish you guys would be honest about stuff. Just say, Hey, listen, guys, we've got to do this. Cause we've got to, we've got to find ways to get more commercial breaks. Otherwise we can't keep paying people what we're paying people. We can't, we can't afford these TV contracts if we're not able to find new revenue streams and by shortening games and doing this, we can make more money. I would actually respect that more than just them pretending it's about player safety. Like, cause it's not, it's not about player safety. It's about making more money. Oh no, it's not about player safety. It's it's like going back to the, um, the edge that ended up committing to Texas over LSU. Right. It's like, he was honest. I yeah, Colin Simmons. Honesty all day. He's like, Look, Colin Simmons this is, is like, cool, I'm man. setting my family cool. up with this decision because cool. the thing that I felt from what he said was, is like, look, I was torn between these two teams. So why did I pick this one over this one? Cause they're basically yeah. offering me more money. It's going to help me yeah. set my family up. Dude, love it. And, and if these, and if these networks like you don't you wouldn't love it, but like if they were like guys, like honestly, like commercial revenue is like a big part of our model, right? Like we need right. more commercials built in. And, okay, fine. Okay. I'm not gonna watch the commercials, but like right. okay, I understand right. now. Thank you for right. being honest. Like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Had our next one was from I think it's getting pulled up. It's not pulled up. I just want to say this last thing. I, I said to my brother in law yesterday. I said, it's funny that they're shortening all these games, but they're not lessening ticket prices. So I have less baseball to watch, less football to watch, but I'm now I'm still paying more than yeah. I did before. You're still yes. raising ticket prices, even though there's less of a game for me to watch. Correct. So make makes that sense. make sense for me. Yeah. John A. What with the question? What's up, John? Haven't seen you today yet, brother. Tobias Merriweather versus NC State over under two and a half catches, 44 and a half yards. What stat line would you take on him this game? I'm going to go over on both, Ryan. I hope, I'm going to go over, I hope on, it's both over on both for those. Yeah. Yep. 
I'm gonna go over. I hope so, man. He needs he needs that game. He needs that game. So I hope it happens. This is an interesting one. I think I know your answer, Ryan. Uh Iris Gordy not remove one pair from the universe forever. Pizza and cookies or burgers and pie. This would not be easy for me to do, but I'd have to go with burgers and pie. Just because I feel like there's nothing that I enjoy more in an in an instance than a really well done burger, but I couldn't eat burgers every day. I just I couldn't. Whereas I I I could eat pizza every day for me. I, I just I could. Man. So it's actually very difficult, man. Yeah. I, I I don't think this is a slam dunk. I, I would probably take pizza and cookies out actually because I love a good burger. I love a good burger. And pie, I think, is a little I love pie. And I think mm-hmm. pie can also be a little bit more diverse than cookies at times, mm-hmm. right? Like a lot of different flavor combinations there. So I don't really eat cookies or pie that much in general, but like if if you ask me, hey, you can have a dessert tonight. Do you want a really good pie or do you want a really good cookie? Hundred percent. Take the pie. <laughs> I'm gonna take the pie. If you were to say, okay, I have to get rid of one of the main courses and one of the desserts, I'd go burgers and cookies. That's I'm not a big cookie. cookie. My mom asked me this: "What's your favorite cookie?" So I'm not really a big cookie guy. I've got to be kind of in the mood for a cookie. I like I like cookies, yeah. but I also oatmeal feel like raisin is mine. By the way. My favorite. I like oatmeal raisin. I like yeah. that's actually one of my more. I, I know I'm like an old man with my taste sometimes, but I like oatmeal raisin cookies. I like carrot yeah. cake. Like, yeah, man. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm not. I'll eat a cookie if I'm in the mood for it, but I'm just not a huge cookie guy. I'd much rather have a good pie for me. Yeah. Especially my grandmother's making it because she like when I, when I was a youth pastor, Ryan, we did like a uh, like a pie. We like auctioned off pies and desserts and stuff to raise money for this trip. My grandma had a pie that went over for a hundred dollars. Like, yeah. Cause they all know, I made sure everybody knew who made the pies. Cause my grandma had been in that church for decades. And I think it was a lemon pie went for like over a hundred dollars. So we had a, we had a New York cheesecake from Texas roadhouse that I was auctioning off. And that went for like 25 bucks, but my grandma's lemon pie went for like a hundred dollars. It was crazy. Interesting. It was very crazy. We had another question that was from Brandon K. You said, if you were controlling the NCAA 2024 football game, how would you design an IL system? Okay, here's here's some things I would do. Number one is it would be it would be illegal and it would be very, very, very punishable by severe by severe financial penalties for any sort of uh, school related collective to offer a high school player money. Anyone that wants to pay a high school player needs to be willing to pay him wherever he goes to school. You can in no way influence where a kid goes to school. That's number one. I want all my NIL money going towards, as far as like collective stuff, going towards current players. I would create a system in which collectives can raise money, but you have to distribute that money evenly to your entire football team. There would also be a national cap on collective money, collectives, on what goes to scholarship players and then obviously non-scholarship players, there'd be certain caps on it, whether it's 50,000 or whatever the case may be. So some schools may not get to that cap because they can't raise enough money, but the ones that can, you know, you, you would go to that. And then what the, then the other, the second part of NIL where I do not believe in caps is the NIL that revolves specifically to the name image and likeness. So the collectives to me is almost like my end arounds for, for sort of pay for play to where we're giving players a cut of the revenue but it's not one where quarterbacks are making this amount and this guy's making this amount. It's something that, hey, we're going to take care of all college football players and we're going to put a cap on it. And you're, Every college football player is guaranteed to make, you know, let's say $60,000 if you're a scholarship player. You're guaranteed to make $60,000 from collectives at your school, right? Um, but then the NIL part would be if a, if a company believes Sam Hartman's worth a million dollars, then they can give him a million dollars, right? But it's basically, it's got to it's gotta have a legitimate exchange of services, Right. So if I'm going to pay you to, 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 you know, a million dollars to do this, then you've got to do certain things. You've got to, you know, use your social media to talk about things. You've got to show up for this number of events a year, like you would any normal influencer. There's got to be some sort of, hey, this is what a standard, this is what your contracts look like for other influencers that are not college athletes. Then the contract for college athletes needs to be similar. You can pay them whatever you want, but there needs to be some sort of exchange. It can't just be, Hey, I, I work at Nike. I'm an Oregon guy. So I'm going to pay this guy $3 million. And then he shows up for one little meet and greet for 10 minutes. And he, that's no, that's not how it's meant to be. In my opinion, that's you buying a player. That's not you 
doing an, a, a legitimate name, image, and likeness exchange. So I would set it up that way. That's the way that I would do it. So that way you're making sure that everybody gets taken care of to some degree. Uh, and then beyond that, NIL is basically about what you're worth, what your value is. And your value is basically what people are willing to pay you in that regard. My only, my only requirement for NIL, Ryan, when, in the true form of NIL, is it has to be a legitimate exchange in place where – I'm hiring you to be an influencer because of your status as the quarterback at Notre Dame or USC or whatever. But I'm going to ask you to do the same things that we ask of other influencers to peddle our products, to do these different things. And I'm totally fine with that. And if you think a quarterback at Notre Dame is worth a million dollars, then pay him a million dollars. I am very anti-caps for that type of NIL. I am I'm for caps of the collective money because I want to spread that part of it around to the, all the players, to make sure all the players are, are being taken care of to some degree financially. And then there'd be other things I would do. Any any jersey sales, I don't care if you want to try to be you know get around it by putting the year on all the jerseys and you only sell 23 jerseys, that's fine. But I'd take a cut of every team's jersey sales and I would distribute it evenly to the players. So like if the school makes $10 million selling jerseys or a Fanatics makes $10 million selling college football player jerseys, whatever the case may be, then you take that money and Georgia takes however, if they made $10 million, they take their cut of that $10 million and they distribute it evenly to the, all of their all their scholarship players. The other thing that I think needs to be passed, and if I if I had, if I was, you know, the college football king, the other thing that I would do is I would pass laws. I would fight with Congress to pass laws that any entity that is making money off gambling, off college games, needs to give a percentage of that to be distributed evenly to college football athletes. The fact that, th that this is a billion-dollar industry, this gambling on college athletics, and if a kid does anything to benefit off of it, his career's done, as he should, because you're destroying the entity of the, the, the integrity of the game. But I believe that there should be passive. Hey, if you want to bet on college sports, go for it. But just understand, whatever you make, you're giving a portion of that back to this whatever, and it gets distributed evenly with all fo college football players. That's something else that I would do. So there'd be all types of ways that I think we can get players a bigger cut of the pie without turning them into employees. That's that's really where I'm at at this I, point in time. I took this question completely differently. I thought Brandon was asking in the 2024 video game, how would you implement oh. an IL? You know what? <laughs> I, was, I, was like thinking, I think I was you're like, right. I was like, I was like, that's a lot of great ideas. You know Brian, what? Like, how would you show I that think in you're the video right. game? <laughs> this, uh, that, that, I think you're right. Yeah, that's not the question he asked. But I still love my answer. It was, no, it was a great answer. But I was like, I was thinking, I was like, wait, but how are you going to implement all this? Honestly, into the Ryan, video game? I wouldn't. <laughs> to the question, yeah. I wouldn't. I think it would make yeah. it way too complicated. I would not have NIL as part of a thing. I would. You, not. you know what would be interesting is so like franchise mode, right? Like a dynasty mode when you're controlling recruiting and everything. After the recruiting, it would be interesting if there was like an NIL center on like the console thing. It's mm -hmm. like these companies are offering these to these players and then you can control the player to pick which entity yeah. you want to sponsor them like that would be the only thing for me i don't want it to be a part of the recruiting pitch at all in in the game because that's like very improper yes. benefit and that's not like my bag so you know what would be interesting is if you know how you have like dynasty mode or like you can be like the head coach is if you could like pick a player dynasty and yeah. like I'm the I'm I'm the quarterback at so and so, and I'm playing it through like he's the sort of the the main. Well, you, thing. you could do that, couldn't you? Wasn't there like a superstar mode or whatever it was called? I forget what it exactly was sure. called. I'm I not thought sure. there was, or you could like but, be a quarterback or be a yeah. whatever. And, but then yeah. you then get your offer. So and so wants to offer sure. you, you know, individually out and that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I guess that'd be fun, but for me, I just I would want it to not be part of the game. It will be, but I would want it. Like remember that, when they made the transfer? Like I did actually like that. Remember when they made the transfer portal in the yeah. the, the last the the early games, like where you lose guys and you'd have to try to convince them to stay and all that stuff. Like I thought that was actually pretty cool. It, it was funny because you could put so many points into talking kids to come back and stuff. And I always remembered like I would think like, what are these points representing? Is this like money? Like I'm so confused on what this is. But like, sure, yeah, let's get it back. Road to it glory was the is strength was of my argument yes. to stay. That's what the yeah. points were. How strong. I'm giving you a six point argument or whatever the case yeah. may be. Ten that, point that argument. That should be fun. In like a road to glory, though, if I'm like a quarterback yeah. and I go somewhere, it's like these companies now want to 
pay you for like yeah. image likeness and like that'd be yeah. cool that'd be interesting in the franchise mode though like in the dynasty mode just leave it separate from recruiting please like i just yes. don't want to be in the recruiting thing where it's like yep. oh this team's also going to set you up with this company it's like no no that's not how yep. that works actually so please don't do that that would not be good i don't like that yep. at all so yep we'll see all right here's some more I, brandon i'm sorry i completely misread that question <laughs> completely misread the question you, you were going in depth, but I'm like, wait, yeah. but how would you show that in a video game? I yeah, don't know how like, you dude, that. that's a really complex. No, totally misread it. Totally misread it. That's my bad. That's my bad. Yeah. 99 Promise of BK1 says, it's only week two. The question itself is a bit punctuous, but based upon the limited results so far, do you think this Notre Dame team is on par with Georgia and Alabama in 2023? Having a quarterback is a big deal. Well, I mean, Ryan, I felt that they were – in a position where they could go toe to toe with those teams coming into the season. And I've seen nothing from any of those three teams to make me think otherwise. I mean, there's just, like you said, it's too early. So if you thought Notre Dame could hang with those teams coming in, I don't think the Notre Dame's done anything to make you doubt that in my view. And if, and if you didn't think Notre Dame could compete with those teams, I don't, I don't know that they've done anything that, that should change your mind. Like it, it'd be one thing if like, let's say Chris Tyree came out, or and Tobias Mother Merriweather came out and they were just ripping people up the first two weeks. I'd be like, okay, no name's got some perimeter weapons, boy. It was yeah. a bit of a I, I like the talent, but I need to see if they can step up coming into the year. Sure. It's still a question, right? In that yeah. regard, you know what I mean? So I don't know that I've seen anything from Notre Dame that changes my view of who this Notre Dame team is, but that I had high expectations for Notre Dame. I had them in the playoff. They haven't made me do anything to make me think they're not that good. And they have made me think that, like, dude, they're gonna get to the playoff and they're going to be a problem for everybody. Uh, this week will give me a better sense of that. And and I liked what I saw from Bama last week. But, again, it's Middle Tennessee, right? I yeah. mean. A lot, lot of challenges really ahead. But I, I've said this before, but this is the first year I can remember in several where I'm like, I think Notre Dame can beat any team on any given week. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they always will, but I think that they have a chance. And that's very unique. I mean, there were some games in the past where I'm just like, convincing myself i'm like psyching myself up like you know what no one could win this one they could do it but like in your mind you know that your heart was speaking with that knowledge right like that was kind of more pushing that way so i think Notre Dame has a shot man this year i really do i have people like sending me messages about uh, baby with the bathwater, and i appreciate everybody explaining that to me it, it is helpful because i i mean you say it and you know what it means but you just don't know where it comes from and i was always interested yeah. by that so i appreciate everybody that's reached out with those things truly <laughs> Truly, I'm not. I'm not saying that to be funny. I really thank you for sending those to me. John A. One says, "Which combo needs to be more dominant versus North Carolina State? Joe Walt and Pat Coogan, or Rocco Spindler and Blake Fisher?" I, I don't care, I, honestly. As long as a side dominates, I don't really care which one of those two sides it is. It doesn't matter to me. If yeah. to Ryan, to your point, if it's both, then they're going to destroy NC State. But you need I, at least I, one side, and I don't think there's a benefit to one side being over than the other. I, I, I still have my, I still have my reservations about Pat Coogan a little bit. So I'm going to pick Pat Coogan and Joe Waltz, which sounds a little funny because I think I just have a little bit more trust in Rocco Spindler yeah. and Blake Fisher right now than what like Pat Coogan, for instance, right? And I will say this too, is that especially against undersized defensive line, right? Mm -hmm. And what you're going to see, because you have one kid that's good size, 6'3", 305, and C.J. Clark, but then you've got 6'2", 280, 6'2", 290. It's a little bit of an undersized defensive line. I would be surprised if Rocco Spindler is not creating some movement at the point of attack. I would right. be very, very surprised. So I think I just have a little bit more trust that that will happen on the right side. So, Left side, I want to see a little bit more So dominance. what you're saying is, Ryan, it would give you more confidence in the line as a whole if the left side dominated, was dominant yeah. this game. Okay. I think because when you say dominance, right, I think of run blocking, especially, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I just have more trust in Fisher Spindler as a unit being better run blockers than Alt and Coogan. And that's more obviously to do mm -hmm. with Coogan. So if Coogan and Alt are, are setting the world on fire in the run game, I, I feel really good about Rocco Spindler yeah. moving some people up front. Like, I, that's what I feel. To, so. to your point, Ryan, if I were to say pick a side of which one is more dominant would make you feel better about the projection of the season going forward. Another reason that I, I think, think that in that instance, if you're going to take that criteria, the, another reason is, is my big concern with Pat Coogan is can he play against the better athletes? This sure. is a pretty quick and penetrating D-line and linebackers that are going to shoot gaps hard. That's my biggest fear with Pat Coogan in this game. 
it, it's not lack of toughness. It's is he athletic yeah. enough to handle this guy, these guys? And so if he does, that gives me confidence. So if I'm going to pick it the way that you picked it, Ryan, that makes a lot of sense. That even adds to the left side being it to your to your point because I think the right side was dominant in the opener. Yeah, they weren't very good last week, but we know they can be. I still yes. don't know that Pat Coogan can be. It's very fair. Yep. We had a question from Salty. Salty had a lot, a lot of questions. The NCAA de- denied his Walker's eligibility waiver at North Carolina after delaying any after delaying any action. Does the NCAA serve any useful purpose in college football, or are they harming it? I, I honestly can't couldn't tell you what what useful purpose they serve anymore. Like they used to serve <laughs> as a, somewhat of a borderline deterrent to cheating. They don't even do that anymore. They don't yeah. plan the postseason, right? They don't run the postseason. The college football playoff committee does, like the playoff committee, playoff group, whatever it is that runs the playoff. Uh, they don't. They do it. The NCAA has like what? What purpose does the NCAA serve right now? None. They're they're cowards when it comes to pushing back at schools. But any chance they get to screw over an individual player, I feel like they take it. Like this Tez yeah. Walker situation is just absurd. I mean, and here's what's absurd about it: like it's not as cut and dry. It's just like he wanted to leave Kent State to go closer to home. If that was true, he wouldn't have taken so many visits to other schools that weren't in sure. North Carolina, right? But here's the simple point of it. He didn't play at the first school he was at because they canceled the season because of COVID. And number one, North Carolina Central. Right. Yeah, he didn't yeah. play there. Number two, North Carolina Central and Kent State both supported his petition for immediate eligibility. That alone should have said, let the kid play. Kent State didn't yeah. protest. This kid shouldn't be leaving. This kid shouldn't be eligible right away. NC Central didn't say, hey, we have a problem. This kid was a headache. This kid was a problem. This kid got in trouble. This isn't a kid we should be rewarding. There, there's no reason for it. And so so this you want to get down to the letter of the law on? You're letting tampering run rampant in college football right now, but this you want to get to the letter of the law? It, it, it's it's um, I, I'm not going to go off on another rant. It's just disgusting, and it just confirms what I've already said. The NCAA's usefulness has died. The era of yeah. the NCAA needing to exist is gone. It just no longer serves a purpose when it comes to major athletics, major college athletics. It just doesn't, and I'm ready for it to die. Now, we may not like what it was replaced with, but the NCAA has become utterly useless. And the only things they do, Ryan, tend to be wrong and harmful right. to players. That's that's like I'm still trying to remember that kid that transferred to Virginia Tech and his mom legitimately uh, had the center yeah. and his mom Brad had like – Yes, had like legitimate health issues. The school he left, I don't believe, even fought him leaving. And yeah. it was just like, and they still said no. It's just, you know, you're going to let Justin Fields get immediate eligibility because someone said something and hurt his feelings, but Luke Ford can't get immediate eligibility when he's trying to go to, to, to Illinois. The whole thing's a joke. They're absolutely useless, and I'm ready for the NCAA to go away. Uh, simple very, very, very inconsistent these transfer rules as well too right mm-hmm. like it's incredibly inconsistent i i just hate that they 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 held it against tez walker that his season got canceled at right. nc central i'm just like that should not even have counted as a transfer right. it's like he came in didn't play a single snap was a true freshman they canceled the season he's like okay i need to go find something else to do here I'm like this play. is not this right. is not a part of the deal that i signed up for here right so like right. As an undergrad transfer, Kent State to North Carolina should have been his one. That should have been his one free yep. transfer. That should have been the case, but that's just my opinion. And the fact that they waited so long. Yeah. Like, they should have Until said to this the beginning, like, like, hey, man, you can't do this. Go back to Kent State. Right. You know, like. It, it also hurts North Carolina because all offseason North Carolina is like, Tez Walker's going to be our guy, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're like. Well, they're not our guy now. Like that's why he, he should he he would have petitioned months ago, and they should have yeah. they should have answered it months ago. Because if they would have answered this like in April, Tess could have said, "Okay, I'm going back to Kent State." And guess what? The Kent State coaches would have done. They'd have taken him back with open arms. Oh yeah, 100%. he'd be playing football yeah. right now. Yeah, you know, like that's just even if you didn't want at this point, right? Even if you didn't want to grant him this, you should have done this months ago. Right, months ago. Agree. And it's just an absolute joke. Yeah. Poor kid, man. Yeah. Poor kid. 99 problems became one overreaction. Is this season already a little bit of a make or break for Tobias Merriweather? 
The current freshman studs and the incoming ones seem to be more of the same. They won't want to sit. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Is it a make or break? I mean, no, no, but like, I understand why you're asking the question sure. in my opinion. Like, cause yes, the there Army... are more talented players coming from behind. So anytime that happens, there's yeah, sure. He's got three career catches, right? That's three more than Javon, than, than, uh, uh, Javon McKinley had through his first three years of college. Yeah. He's got three catches. That means he's halfway to where miles Boykin was by the end of his sophomore season. Right. Like he's halfway to where Kevin Austin was at the end of his junior season. Like, no, it's not a make or break season. Uh, we're overreacting. Now, how now here's what I will say. It's not a make or break season because if Tobias goes out there next spring and plays great, then he's gonna still be getting his opportunities. What I will say is if Tobias does not play well this entire season for the most part, then that's gonna make me question about whether or not my evaluation of him was correct. Right. Like and, and here's the other thing is is he just a guy who's more of a practice player? Right? Is he the opposite of Deion Colsey, who's not a good practice player, but every time he gets a chance at games, Deion steps up and makes plays. Right? I mean, that that's well, he Deion has some of the worst drops I've ever seen from a, a receiver in practice. Just like, dude, how do you drop that? I've never seen that happen to him in a game ever, and he's made some tough catches in games. Right? Um, so you know, is Tobias the opposite of that? I don't know. What I do know is having an opinion on that after two games is just to me not where I'm right. going to be. But we're, we're getting to the point of the season where I'm a couple games away where if he doesn't start to step up, I'm going to say he's just not going to have the impact this season that I thought he was going to have. Right. This Does is that mean he's not going to have an impact down the road? Not saying that, but it will tell me a lot about, you know, I, I'm not going to count on him to go help you beat Georgia because of how well he played if he can't go out and make plays against NC State and Central Michigan. Right. Right. That that, that, that I will say that. I will say that. Yep. We had our next one from Salty. Salty with a lot of good questions today. Yeah. Is Ole Miss at Tulane an upset alert? Well, what's um, I'm, I'm trying to find the spread on that one, Ryan. Uh, two Ole Miss is a touchdown favorite. Could are they a could touchdown Ole, at Tulane? Wow. Yeah. Could Tulane win that I game? I would take Tulane yeah. to cover if nothing else, personally. Yeah. But that's just me. I won't be shocked if Tulane beats Ole Miss. I don't know that I'd predict I it. I haven't really thought a lot about who I'd pick in that game. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I mean, look, I just I got to see Tulane be able to run the ball without Tajay Spears. That's that's my big thing, Ryan. That that's that's still my big thing. But their receivers looked pretty good in the opener against yeah, was South Pratt, Alabama, Pratt right? Good too. Yeah. Lawrence Keys had a big game. Did you see that? Yeah, like hundred yards, right? Catches, or ninety yards, almost. It was like ninety something. Yeah. Five catches for like ninety some yards. It was good to see I him have some success. He's a good kid. Very good mom too, by the way. Yeah, Pratt, you're right, Brent. Pratt, Pratt looked good. Like again, the competition sucked, but I just I thought he was going through his reads well. I think you know things that I had concerns about him in the past. He's getting the ball out quickly. He was being accurate with it. Stuff that he struggled with in the yeah. past, even against some of the inferior teams. I thought he looked good on Saturday. Yeah, I think that game could be a pretty high scoring game, even though I think Tulane's defense is pretty good. But I think Ole Miss, yeah. Tulane, or being I want to see if Jackson Bart's legit or not because he looked pretty darn good. He looked in the great, first game. In, the first well, game. Yeah. great yeah. in the first game. Great in the first game. He really sure did. did. Coleman Smith with the question. He said, what are your thoughts on the current stages of NIL? Hearing NIL more with 17-year-olds that have never stepped foot on campus than 21-year-old college football players. I'm glad does, Notre Dame does it the right way. I, I don't think that – I think that's indicative of how the, how the NIL is covered, Coleman, is more so than – I'll say there's a lot more college players getting NIL deals than high school kids getting NIL deals. It's just that on three covers – the recruiting aspect of it and two, four, seven, those teams, they cover the recruiting aspect of it, right? That that's what I would say. There's a lot of kids at Notre Dame. There's a lot more kids on the percentage on the Notre Dame team getting NIL deals than Notre Dame recruits are getting NIL deals right now. Right. It's just, it, it's like with a lot of things, just because something is talked about more doesn't mean that's the reality of, right. of what's actually happening. Would you agree or disagree with that? Ryan? I would disagree. Uh, the NIL and tr I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I would agree. I did not mean to say disagree. My apologies. Oh, um, I thought, would agree. I thought we were on the same page there. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we were. I'm sorry. I do agree with that. I was just, man, like the we could ask a million questions about the NIL and the transfer portal. Like, there's just inconsistencies about just everything in college football right now. It's just very, very crazy. And I really think that like the 17 year old side of this question, right, Coleman, it's just. 
when you start involving money with that age bracket, right, the more and more likely that improper stuff is happening, right? Like, yep. is there a world where like some companies are just coming and, and making that happen? It's just such a sleazy business right now, man. Like I, I know a lot of sports agents, a lot that have dug into the NAL space now with everything going on. Guys, there is a lot of impractical things that are happening right now, <laughs> like so much. A lot man. of lying not- going on. A lot. I mean, yeah. like, did yeah. you see that deal that that kid Deception. from um, Florida signed? That he's not, you know, uh, mm-hmm. what's his name? Uh, Gervin. Oh man, but Gervin you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Gervin and Dexter, like, yeah. part of the deal is he's gonna that that they gave him what, like four hundred fifty thousand, something like that. Yeah. Yep. And it's like an investment firm. They're trying to say it's not an NIL deal or whatever, but it's like. He he has to he commits to them fifteen percent of his professional revenue for yep. the entirety of his career. It's like what? Like that's the yeah. whole thing is th- these these should these should not be allowed to happen. These things should not be part of this process, in my opinion. It just shouldn't. But there's nobody out there I, looking out for these kids. That's the problem, Ryan. There's nobody fighting for this. Shouldn't be a thing. And you know, man, it, it, one thing I've learned, Brian, over the last few months. University of Florida does not do NIL right, man. There's been a lot of bad stuff with the, with Florida right now oh with NIL, God, man. Mess. Think about like Jaden an Rashad mess. debacle and everything. <laughs> like what? It's an absolute and, – and, and that's the half of it. Talk to Brian Smith about some of the stuff he's heard, and it gets really interesting. Really interesting. We got a couple more of these from – three more of these from Salty, so let's just get these out back to back to back. Let's do it. I hope you guys don't hear a bunch of rain in the background because it is pouring where I'm at right now. Salty says, is Appalachian State at North Carolina on an upset alert? I don't think so, Salty. No. That, App State, that, that App State team last year, they lost a lot, man. I know Ch- yep. Chase Bryce wasn't a great player, but like you lost your starting quarterback. Cameron Peoples at, at running back is gone. They lost two wide receivers. They lost Nick Hampton, their best pass rusher from last year. That App State lost a lot of players. I think North Carolina would actually be a better overall team than they were last year. So yeah. I, I don't think that's not said well. Do I think or North Carolina's defense is going to go through the rest of the year and give up 17 points a game? No. Could this be partly confirmation bias because I thought North Carolina was going to be better on defense coming the season? Yeah. But I just – you know, I, I look at it, Ryan. Sometimes losing talent, if it's the right, if it's the wrong kind of attitude, can actually be beneficial to you. And the perfect example is think of some of the players that Mike Norvell has chased out of Florida State, right? Because yeah, they had talent, but they weren't the right kind of kid. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I think Mac did a little bit of that this off season, right? I think and so too. and it's going to make them better. Now they're not going to be as athletic at set in the secondary, but I think they're going to be more disciplined and more effective. Now. And I just don't, to your point, Ryan, I don't think App State's that good. And here's the thing. Last year, if Drake May would have played in a game the way he did against South Carolina, yeah. where he was good but not great, they had no chance at winning. No chance at winning. This team is just better defensively. They just started. Didn't yeah. they give up like 24 points in the opener to like a to a Florida A&M team that like had like 20 yeah. dudes suspended in the game? Yes. yes. Right. Like, and they still yeah. gave up like 20 some points. Like, yeah. And then they went out the that? next week and, and gave up a whole lot to App State with the 61. next <laughs> Yeah. Yes. yeah. Gave up 28 to Georgia State. You're like, yeah, yeah. they're not very good on defense. I, I'm, ho- I'm hoping, I'm hoping second year under Gene Chizik because what I think Gene yeah. Chizik's a good coach, right? Like, a a, like from, from a mind yeah. perspective. Yeah. And also, North Carolina's got a lot of talent on that front seven. I mean, Cedric right. Gray's talented. Power Eccles is talented. Miles, Miles Murphy is talented. Yeah. Cameron Rucker is talented. Yeah. Like they are talented. They just haven't put it together at this point. So yep. hopefully. Yep. I heard um from a buddy, because you know how bad North Carolina's offensive line has been over the past couple of years. Apparently mm-hmm. they looked real good in the opener. So hopefully their yeah. offensive line is a little better too. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because remember how good they were a couple of years ago? And it's just yeah. And then it's they like, man, what, what the heck hard, happened? Man. I've, I've, like, I know some people that that are, are like kind of know people in that program. And, and the thing that I heard is a big problem that North Carolina had last year is there was just not a lot of faith in in the offensive line coach. And they just – Phil Paul Longo, Phil Longo was just a guy that, yeah, he's smart, but he just rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, just not a guy people wanted to play for. And yeah. that it's just a, a better environment. Like the guy they have now may not be as like – scheme smart as, as Phil Longo, but it's just kind of like, but there's more buy-in. And that is, Ryan, you know this, man, that's so important in football. 100%. So yeah. important in football. Yeah, it, it really is. So I, I do not see that as being a potential upset alert game. 
Agreed. Salty also said, is SMU at Oklahoma on upset alert? I think so. I don't think it's going to happen, yeah, but but I exactly. think it's I, I think LSMU could do that. I, I liked what I saw from I watched a little bit of that game last week, Ryan. And SMU is is trying to be more committed to being balanced. Yeah. Under Rhett Lashley. And they ran for over 200 yards and it was against Louisiana Tech, but it's not like it was some FCS team. Uh, yeah. I like Preston Stone as a quarterback for that level. He's a solid quarterback. They've got some decent weapons. They got LJ uh, LJ Johnson, who was a highly yeah. recruited kid at yeah. running back now too. So yeah. there's some guys there. There's some guys yeah. There. So I mean, could it happen? Sure, it could happen. Am, am I predicting it to happen? Uh, no. They also got that Knighton kid that transferred in from Miami, Ryan. He had over a thousand career yards at Miami. Remember Jaylen him, Knighton. Jalen Knighton? He's on that team He's too. A player. Um, a player. It, am I predicting it to happen? No. Could it happen? Yes. Yes. And. And if Oklahoma beats SMU and it's a competitive game, that's not a that's that's a quality win for Oklahoma, in my opinion. Like, I like to bang on Oklahoma, but this is the kind of game early in the year you're like, hey, we got a good test from a quality team and we handled our business, right? right. That's that's. But could yeah, I see we, them upsetting Oklahoma? Absolutely, I could see it happening. I'm just not. I'm not putting money on it. That's we, all. We, I was we see. We see it very similarly. I, I think that it could happen, but I would not pick right. SMU to upset them. But I, I don't know what the spread on that game is. But if it's anything outrageous, I would definitely pick SMU to cover the spread because I think that that will be a competitive football game. For, uh, if I most remember part. correctly, it is a big. It's a four, 14 and a half. That's actually not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. 14 and I a half. I would still probably take that 14 and a half for SMU to cover. But yeah, I, I, it's, yeah. it feels like. If Oklahoma most likely is going to win like 34 24, like something yeah. in that ballpark, to or even like, 34 20, which is under yeah. the spread, it, you don't cover yeah. at that point in time. Yeah. yeah, right. I agree with you. And then last one here, Ryan, this is a very interesting one. This one right here. Um, there we go. All right. Salty's last one is Arizona at Mississippi State and upset alerts. Possibly. Yeah, I can see that yeah. one happening. I don't know who Mississippi State is yet, Ryan. I, I, yeah, I, yeah I, just, I don't. I really don't. I mean, they, they had a, their, their a blowout win. Their head coach is a defensive coordinator, right? Like that's yeah. Who that is now. Yeah, and yeah. they've kind of gone away from Mike Leach's, Mike Leach's version of the of the air raid. And, you know, they ran for 298 yards last week against Southeast Louisiana, who's not very good. They uh, ran for 298 yards last week? Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and Will Rogers Arizona. went twenty of twenty nine for two hundred twenty seven yards. And yeah. um, Arizona's got some talent offensively yeah. as well. I mean, we talked about Jane yeah. Delora earlier. Michael Wiley is a nice running back. Tanner McLaughlin is a good tight end. They have the McMillan kid, the sophomore, the tall kid. He's like Toronto McMillan, I think is his name. Hmm. They also have the Jacob Cowing kid that used to be at UTEP, who had like a thousand yards last year. Even though they lost the kid to USC, like they. Got some guys, man. They got some yeah. offensive firepower, so could be. McMillan's a kid I loved coming out of high school, man. He was that kid's talented, oh man. He's gosh, talented. He's, so he's a Servite yeah. kid, right? I think. Mm -hmm. Yep, he was early on. I think he might have transferred at one point in time, but he was he was early on a serve. Notre Dame offered him early. Now he, they liked him a lot. Man. He just he's not a he's fit for long. Notre Dame. But yeah, gotcha. They've got some gotcha. talented players there. You're, there's no doubt about that. I just I do think Mississippi State has. One thing that that I felt in the last couple of years, they had upgraded their the the depth of their town on. I mean, they've always put out NFL players on defense, but yeah. they would be in, they'd have some like Montez Sweat and Chris Jones, but then there'd be like That's other sad. guys. That guy should not be playing in the SEC. You know what I mean? I think they're improving their depth of talent in the on defense. I think they've got a chance to be a pretty good defensive football team. I thought they were a pretty decent defensive football team last year. Yeah. That the air raid sometimes hid just how good maybe they could have been on defense at times, you know, a little bit. Uh, Zach just, Arnett is the coach, right? The yes. Coordinator from yes. Last year? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I like what he's done. It's going to come down to if they can't shut Arizona Arizona down, they will lose because I don't love the off. I don't love Will Rogers running that offense now, in my opinion. But I could also see this game being a lot like it was when uh, Mississippi State beat NC State a couple years ago. Yeah. Where their offense didn't do a whole lot, but they didn't need to because they couldn't sure. score on that defense. It was like 24 to 10, something like that, a couple years ago. I could see something like that. I would love for Arizona to pull off this upset. I would love it. It's possible. And yeah, it's Will Rogers possible. is definitely an air raid kid. He's definitely yes. an air raid kid. Agreed. He was made for the air raid. <laughs> That's just who he Agreed. is. Agreed. You know, Mississippi State had the two leading tacklers in the SEC last year. Um, 
Johnson and what was the other kid's name? Jet Johnson and somebody somebody else. But they had the top two tacklers and middle line and inside linebacker, which is kind interesting. of interesting. I didn't yeah. know that. I'm actually going to look I, at that now. Who, I forget who the other were. kid's name. But they had Jet Johnson, and then there was another kid that's a like uh, a Nathaniel Watson. Yes, yeah. Nathaniel Watson. Interesting. Him, like Boogie Watson or something like that. He's got some yeah, kind the, of nickname. 116 and 114 each. Yeah, interesting. Man. Good players last year. Yeah. Yeah. They're both gone. No, they're both back. Okay. I just, I'm looking here. They're listed as seniors on the thing here. So interesting. Bama had three and six. Vanderbilt had four. Anthony Orgy was, uh, was number four. Drew Sanders was five. Uh, Mm -hmm. let's see here. Uh, solo tackles, Mississippi state, those two Mississippi state kids finished eighth and ninth in solos. Interesting. So they're, they're around the ball a lot. Yes. So they finished one and two in total and one and two in assisted tackles. So interesting. But yeah, I could see Arizona upsetting them. Again, I would not pick it, but yes, I could see it. Next question is from John A1. who said, if Nebraska beats Colorado this week, would you consider it an upset? Would it be a great statement win for Matt Rule? I would consider an upset when you consider how, how poor Nebraska played in the opener and then how well yeah. Colorado played in the opener. I would consider it, would it an upset. Definitely be a great statement for Matt Rule after all oh, the. Yeah. I mean, all week we've been hearing about how whoa, Colorado's a lot better than we thought. Like they're really, oh, you know, yeah. they got everything going right. And so if Nebraska beats Colorado, it'd be like that's a really nice yeah. win for Matt Rule. Good job, right. man. They're two and a half point underdogs, so it's not like yeah. oh my gosh, earth shattering right. upset there. Right. Uh, but yeah, it, look if if Matt Rule could take that team to, to Denver and or to Boulder and beat them with Jeff Sims. That's a really nice pickup. Or, I mean, really nice win, I should say. But, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd consider that an upset. And oh, could yeah. Nebraska beat Colorado? Eh, sure. I, it surprised I so. me. It would surprise me, though. I just – one thing that I saw from Nebraska is just an, an absolute lack of uh, skill talent. You know, like yeah. thing about TCU is TCU's got a lot of problems, but TCU's got a lot of skill talent. Uh, it's A lot of it's new and transfers and all that kind of stuff, but – you know, Jojo Early, Imani Bailey, like we, we talked about his big playability coming into the game. is like eight yards of carry last year. Wasn't he like over 11 against Colorado? Yeah. And like TCU yeah. had some athletes. I don't see Nebraska having that same type of athletes. But I also think that Nebraska is going to give – here's the thing I'll say this looking at it from a Colorado standpoint. This game, if Colorado wins, right, is going to tell us a completely different story than what the win over TCU told us because they're going to have to – they're going to have to beat – here's what I do know about Nebraska. Two things that are I believe are true, Ryan. You tell me if you agree or disagree. Number one, they're not as skilled as they need to be to be a really good football team. They don't have the physical – they don't have the athletic skill. Number two, they have already adopted Matt Rule's personality. They're going to be physical. Yeah, they're going to compete. Yeah. They're going to battle in the trenches. They're going to hit hard. They're going to do all those type of things. They may not be disciplined. They might not have great skill, but they're going to fight you. That's the complete opposite of what TCU was in the opener. So it's yeah. a completely different test for Colorado. So if Colorado says, hey, we can get into a shootout and we can get into a trench game, and either way, we come out on top, that sends a, a statement about Colorado that I that I don't think that maybe we're talking about a whole lot sure. as well. Um, sure. And, yeah. But, yeah, I, th- I think Nebraska could certainly beat Colorado. And, again, I'm just not putting my mortgage on it. It's just I'm not betting on a whole lot of games this early in the season, right, because we still don't know about a lot of these teams, right? I mean. Nah, not yet. Yeah. Especially because, I mean, Colorado beat a – I mean, we talked about this before, but, like, they beat a TCU team that lost a lot from last year, yeah. man. Like, it was a lot. And played so. bad. I mean, yes. I mean, we said this before. I'm not taking anything away from Colorado, but they nah, took advantage of the mistakes that TCU made. But TCU made a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. We have a question from John A1. It said, Jane Thomas leads the Notre Dame wide receivers in catches and yards. Does that change the ceiling of what you thought this wide receiver could, core could have been? Would it change your outlook on this team? Uh, no, not really. As far as against I, NC State, I thought Jane Thomas was one of the top front runners to be the leading receiver this year. I mean, like I didn't. We, think we that both was said outrageous. that we thought he would lead. I believe we both said this, right? I think we both said we thought we wouldn't be surprised if he leads the team in catches. Yeah. I'd be a little bit more surprised if he leads the team in yards. Yeah, like the reality is, is. Chris Tyree, Jaden Greathouse, Tobias Mayer, they're one big game away from catching him in yards. I mean, again, we're two games in, and he's had 
almost identical stats in each game. Four catches for like 63 and 68 yards, something like that. 63, 65, something like that. Um, what it would probably tell me is that Jaden Thomas is, is better than I th- even better than I thought. Is probably what that would tell me, Ryan. It, you he know, looks it, good, it, man. But it, really good, it, so. there's context involved, right? Like, is he leading the team in stats because the other receivers aren't playing well? Or is he leading yeah. your team in stats because he's just playing better than we thought we, he was? He's that I mean, guy. Yeah. yeah. It just would depend on why. What What's the he's, reason he's leading the team in catches? But he, He's looked very good through two weeks, yeah. so we shall see. Agree. Man. We shall see. Agree. I'm going to ask this one, Ryan. You may not know the answer. Uh, John Roosman says, with Deuce Knight leaving Lipscomb Academy and going back to George County, can he immediately play or will he have to sit out the rest of the season? I'm not 100% sure, but I think there's some level of sit out that he has to happen. I think is it 30 days, 60 days. There's probably something like I, I, I would be surprised if he was immediately eligible. I, I would be actually shocked if that was the case, but I'm not 100% sure on it. Yeah. Um, This is an interesting question. Irish Gordy not sure says, how much we're going to touch this one. Irish Gordy not says Thanos snaps his fingers and removes the concept of football from the minds of all humans. What do people hypo- hypothesize is the reason for these groups of people being together? I have no idea. What? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of confused. What do pe- people hypothesize is the reason for these groups of people being? I mean, oh, look, so like watching a football game or something. Is that what they're saying? Is that what he's saying? I mean, look, I sporting events like this have been going on. For since from the beginning i mean people have always had this desire to compete and you know i mean you find ancient drawings of indians and you know people in south america and asia and all that there's some sort of sporting event that brings people together Um, in america we tend to like american football in other uh, parts of the world it's soccer in other parts of the world it's cricket and you know what i mean like in other parts of the world it's rugby Uh, there's always a desire for sport Maybe they're just at a party too, man. Like, you know, tailgating, yeah. you're drinking probably, yeah. you're eating food. Like, I mean, well, it's been I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you look at the revolutionary period, we talk about history a lot. I mean, people gather together all the time to talk about politics, to talk about the events of the day. I mean, people, there's a, there's a, a desire in, in humans as a, as a whole. Now everyone's different. I'm, I'm a bit more of a, I like to kind of be by myself, right. When I'm not, doing this. I like to kind of, I'm a homebody a little bit, but just as a species in general, there's always been a desire to gather and to, to be part of a tribe, you know what I mean? And, um, that's always been a a yearning desire that's I think ingrained to us by how we were created by God. So they would find something, right? The passions of the early Americans was not baseball or anything like that. It was, it was getting around it at, at, taverns and bars and and meeting rooms and talking about whatever issues of the day were going on. I actually kind of wish we did more of that. You know what I mean? I wish we, I love the fact that sports matters, but I wish people were more engaged in, in civics, to be honest with you. But if sports wasn't a thing and football wasn't a thing, that would be something that as a society we'd probably see more of. Or some other sport would, you know, we'd still be going to baseball games more. We'd be watching right. more basketball games. You know, we'd probably be watching more soccer or something like that, right? Like, it would just go to something like that. So, um, that's that's my that's my stance. I was screwing out. I thought you were going to ask me like, who would I snap away from existence? That would have been a much more interesting yeah. question, but I don't want to hit on that one either. Ryan, um, I don't I don't want to hear you talking bad about Michigan fans today, Ryan. So we're gonna John A. One. <laughs> I, I actually have an uncle that's a Michigan fan, and but I would not snap him away. Um, okay. You I've can say all that, but, you know, because you can be specific yeah. with what you're wanting sure. going away. Sure. Yeah. I've noticed Joshua Burnham listed in both defensive end spots. What is his potential at big end? And does he have the tools to be effective at it this year? Or is this depth there not as good as the staff hoped? Well, the depth there is not great. I, I, I personally, Ryan, I don't, I don't quite get this one. I don't get why he's the, the guy you're putting there. I, I think of the Vi- the young Vipers. I think Junior Tuolamaka has the best fit at the big end position of the two. I don't yeah. love either one of them there because – you know, Josh has the length. But does he have the yeah. Does he have the girth to thrive at that position? I'm not sure that that's the not right now. No. You know, and, and and also with the kid that twitchy, do you really want to put him where he's going to have a, a lot of times have a tight end outside of him the whole game where he just can't edge rush as much? I, I don't know that that's utilizing his skill to the maximum degree, in sure. my opinion. Where I think Junior could thrive more in that type of role. Um, uh, if it so, if it came to between the two, I I would have Junior there. I I don't I don't quite get that one to be honest with you. Yeah. 
We're not, not why not like a Tyson Ford or something? Like, I don't know. It's just very right. strange. That's a strange fit. I agree. I don't think yeah. Joshua Burn. I don't I think stylistically he doesn't play like a big end either. So no. like I mean, like I don't know. Body type wise, he doesn't, you know, there's yeah. just a lot of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. All right, let's go to this next one. Here we go. Just your ordinary Joe says, what do you believe are GG's? GG's. Uh, Gino Gadulis. Gino Gadulis, sorry. Gino Gadulis top three developmental goals for Sam Hartman this year. What do you believe they should be? Well, you know, I don't know, Ryan, that that beyond what we've talked about in the past, getting the footwork in for this offense down pat, building timing with the current roster. I don't know that there's a lot of development that Sam Hartman needs outside of, you know, what you can continue to build in the strength and conditioning program. I, you know, I, I think he's always been a pretty good fast processor. There's, I mean, they're all the development things I would say are, are footwork related, timing related, and just further grasp of this particular offense. I don't know that there's a lot more development that can happen with Sam Hartman outside of those things. And they're all more about adjusting to the specifics of Notre Dame and yeah. its offense and personnel as opposed to Wild playing receivers. at Wake Forest. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's not like, hey, your motion needs work. You're, you know, you're, you, you need to get faster. You need to do that. It's, it's not a whole lot of that. But I, I think there's, a, there's still room for – look, I don't think Sam Hartman's a finished product within this system, in my opinion. Yes. I mean, there's, there's still some, some reads that he can still clean up a little bit. There's still timing as good as it's been. So it can get better. Uh, there's still aspects of the offense that, I'm, that, that I know for a fact they haven't really – utilized yet how is he going to execute that stuff those things are part of it but that that's uh that's where my focus would be with uh with sam hartman ryan thoughts on that yeah i, I think that footwork is a consistent thing that we've talked about a ton because it's just a different se- different system different approach in the passing game perspective i think the natural maturation of working with tobias merriweather and jane thomas and deon colsey and it's just a completely different group of receivers than what you had I mean, it's just about the timing and the feel that you have, the connection that you have with those guys, right? I mean, like, that's the everyday type of stuff. More than that, like, the biggest development that I want to continue to grow is that Sam Hartman is the absolute leader on this football team, right? Like, I think he's a leader already. He's a captain. But they continue to develop throughout the year because you're going to need him when the going gets tough, right? Like, when you're down in the fourth or you are in a tie game or you're in a playoff game or whatever that might be. The guy that everyone's going to look at is the quarterback. So continuing to develop that leadership and that, you know, the captaincy, like that stuff I think is big time as well. Yep. Yeah. Let's go to the next question here, Ryan, from John A1. John A1 says, how many big plays plus 25 yards does Notre Dame offense need to make versus NC State to make you feel great about the rest of the season? Part two, what are your what are you taking over under on big plays set at four and a half? Ryan, I'm just not a what happens in this game means this for the next nine. Right. Like, I just – like, let's say Notre Dame goes out and and rips off five big plays and then they get the over. Does that mean that they're going to be – they're going to be able to do that against Ohio State? Look, I'm a big believer, Ryan, that if you do something once, you can do it multiple times physically. But but – when it comes to the level of your team performance, just because you do something once against, let's say, NC State, doesn't mean your team's going to be capable of doing that consistently. Sure. Right? Football is a game of matchups, right? And some teams match up better. Like we have a question about Duke and Clemson. It's not about Duke did this to Clemson. What does that mean about Notre Dame and Duke? It means nothing for Notre Dame and Duke. We've always thought Duke was a challenge. But Duke being a challenge to Notre Dame has to do with how does Duke match up against Notre Dame? not how they match up against Clemson and vice versa. Clemson may not match up well against Duke, but they may match up a lot better against Notre Dame, right? Like that's the reality of how football works. And so, uh, but I will say this to your question, John, I will, I will not have a, this is what this means for the rest of the year take away from this game. But to answer your question, if Notre Dame rips off multiple big plays, like three, four big plays, in the past game, then that's going to tell me something about what this offense is because, you know, we've talked about this, John, because of the quality of the NC State secondary and the corners. Like, you know, Ryan and I have talked about, you know, questions at linebacker outside of Peyton Wilson. They've got some new guys there. And, 
and all these type of things. But what we don't question is that their corners are really good players. So if Notre Dame is able to go out there and thrive against their corners and rip off, you know, four, five, 25 plus yard gains in the pass game, that's going to give me confidence that we can see it again against anybody because I do like this corner tandem. So I will say that would make me feel like I feel good that we're going to see more of this, but I've just got to see it more. I got to see more of it to say, Hey, this is who Notre Dame is now. That's what I would, I would see. What are your thoughts? What are your, as far as the second part, part two, uh, what are you taking over under on big play set at four and a half? Oh boy. I'm, if it's 25 plus yards, I'm going to, I'm going to take the over. I'm going to take the over. I think they're going to rip off some some at least I think they'll 25 yards or more. I'll say at least five. I'll say that. I'll take the over. I don't know that it's going to be way over, but I'll take the over on that particular one. Next question here is from Archer four five two. Which team do you think will end up uh, outperforming their season win total the most, and which one will be will underperform it the most? If you're if you're um boy, if you're looking at preseason like college football, Archer, I. I couldn't tell you, man. It's a, we're one, two games in. I I really don't know that. I, well, I'll give you one. If it, let's take, let's do overreaction. Let's do an overreaction take. So like week one overreactions to answer your question, have some fun with it. Cause I don't want you to ignore it and give you the whole, we need to see more and need to see more. We all know we need to see more, but if I'm going to make a week one overreaction to your question, Colorado's one that pops in my head. Uh, absolutely. As far as what the expectations were for me, and 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 nationally to what they're going to do. I mean, they play like a team that's capable of winning nine games in the opener. So that like that's that's an overreaction to one week. The counter reaction to that is LSU is not going to be as good as people thought that they were going to be. Now, I didn't think they were going to be as good as other people thought that they were, but I still thought they'd be a top fifteen team. Based on one week overreaction, they're going to have a tough time getting to that point because they looked really really bad in the opener. Uh, against Florida State. And even in the early on, the game was competitive. I didn't like what I was seeing from LSU even early on. John A1 asks, which unproven unit of the defense will we find out about the most versus NC State, D-line, linebackers, or safeties? I think D-line, to me, is the one that I'd go there, John. I just think this is a a decent NC State O-line, but not a great one. And if this defensive line is uh, not given the chance to make a lot of plays or they are given the chance and don't do it, it's going to have me concerned about how well the D-line can play in some of the bigger games. I want to see this group be turned loose. And this is a week to do it, in my opinion. Okay, let's go to some others. Coleman Smith uh, says, Brian, if you could go back and play any other position than the ones you did play, what would they be? So I... In my career, I played quarterback, wide receiver, cornerback, and safety. So if I could play any other position besides those, I'd probably won't play a linebacker. Probably be the one that I would, would could play other than those positions. Domer Grizz has two partners. Uh, if I recall, Brian Kelly and or Tommy Reese would always script the perfect look from the scout team to practice offensive plays against so the team didn't know – what to do when opponents gave other looks? Part two, have you seen or heard uh, from sources that this will be is still happening under Marcus Freeman and Jared Parker? I know Marcus Freeman said Jared Parker practiced calling live plays during camp to get used to the process, but that's different. I have actually heard that it is not the way that it used to be, that they are putting the offense in more difficult situations, which is why I think the offense didn't always look as sharp in the practices we saw because they weren't putting them in the the position where it's it's – schemed for success and i don't think that was a tommy reese thing that was a brian kelly thing because that was happening at notre dame before before tommy reese became the offensive coordinator Uh, so yes i would say that was a brian kelly thing and i don't think it's as much of a brian kelly thing based on what we saw so far dj with a question dj asks i contend this game is the simplest context as being able to run the ball and stop the run am i close Stop the run. Uh, yeah, I mean that was my number one key yesterday for the defense of uh, in the defensive breakdown is stop the run, dominate the run, and NC State's gonna have a hard time winning. So yeah, I would say yes if you could make it in the simplest context. And and honestly, DJ, that's true of almost any team you play. Uh, you know, uh, truly, if you can go out there and run the football and stop the run, you're gonna have a chance to win a lot of football games. A lot of football games. Domer since birth asks a question and says, compare the big three, Ohio State, USC, and Clemson on our schedule to the big three of barbecue, St. Louis and Memphis, Texas and North Carolina, cheers. 
Well, let's do the overreaction after week one. Then USC is, to me, Texas. And that's obviously my number one. Ohio State would be my St. Louis and Memphis. I really like a dry rub. Uh, there's no doubt. And some of the sa- sauces that they have on those areas. And then Clemson would definitely be the North Carolina barbecue, which has got a very vinegary, not great flavor in my opinion. So that's the in, in order in which I would do it. Archer 452 says via FanDuel, Notre Dame currently has the ninth best odds to win the title ahead of teams like Tennessee, Washington, Oregon, and LSU. If you set the line, where would you put their odds? I mean, I, I'd say probably anywhere from six to nine would be where I mean, I have to, you know, there's teams that are going to be ahead. Alabama should be ahead of them because they've done it. Uh, you know, uh, Georgia should be ahead of them because they've done it. Ohio State should be ahead of them because they've done it. You know, I'd, I'd probably put USC ahead of them, schedule related. Caleb Williams beat Notre Dame last year. Outside of that, I mean, I'm not putting Texas ahead of them. I'm not putting LSU ahead of them. I'm not putting Oklahoma ahead of them. I'm not putting uh, Florida State ahead of them. Right now, I'm not putting probably six to nine. I'd probably lean towards more of the six spot if it was up to me, just because I think their schedule gives them a little – here's reasons why. I think their schedule gives them a little bit more uh, leeway to have a loss. I think that when I look at this this team, I, I think their, their, their talent is more balanced in certain areas, and they have a quarterback that's um, been effective – uh, in these type of situations. So I would, that's where I would go with that one. Ryan, I had a feeling something was about to happen. Cause you kept going like this. And I was like, Oh, oh dude, this, this big, happen. like this big, just, well, I was like, Oh no. And then I, my lights went off for a good two minutes. And which means that the internet goes off for a couple minutes as well. So it was fun times, man. It was really, really fun times. So, yeah. If anybody's here in South Jersey, man, there is a nasty thunderstorm out there yeah. right now. So everyone's yeah. safe out there, man. <laughs> yep. Ugh. All right. Here we go. Here's uh, one from Salty Virginia Peanuts. Salty getting me back Actually, into we, the we show. Don't have, yeah, yeah. I don't have a – we I, we have no idea of knowing that. So uh, sorry. Okay. I didn't read that one until after I pulled it up. I have no idea. Gotcha. I'm sure someone has. So let's move uh, on to this one. Irish Mills 540. All right. This is a good one. Question. Um, I like what this one. Would, what would be more of a statement performance tomorrow against the state? Hartman th- going for 300 plus with three to four touchdowns or estimate going for 203 touchdowns? Uh, personally, for me, Ryan, it's 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 Hartman going for 300 plus with three Same. to four touchdowns. We Same. know that Notre Dame can have a running back go for 200 yards and three touchdowns. I mean, it would be a quite a statement to do that against NC State. But if Notre Dame's going to throw for 300 yards and three or four touchdowns, that's going to tell me a lot more about how good this team could be, especially against the corners they're going to be going against. One of the questions I was asked, Ryan, uh, before you came back, it was kind of along the lines of of this. And I said, you know, look, it, I, you know, talk about like overreacting about, about certain games to me. Like if Notre Dame's able to go out there, John asked about big plays. And the question was, you know, what's the over-under on big plays? And – and I said, you know, I'd go five, and, and what would that mean for Notre Dame? And my whole thing is if Notre Dame goes out there and rips off like four or five big plays in the pass game against this secondary, that's going to tell me something about this football team that maybe we don't know about this football team yet. And 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 this question is kind of in the similar ballpark. Is uh, We saw what Notre Dame did to Clemson last year. And if Aldrich Estime, if, if Logan Diggs wasn't in that game, Aldrich Estime would have gone for 200 yards. If Lo- yeah. Aldrich, Aldrich Estime wasn't in that game, Logan Diggs would have gone for 200 yards. Like they, somebody was running for 200 yards against Clemson last year. If they were the lead back, that just they were just sure. going to rip it up, right? We know that when Notre Dame's really on, they can do that. That that's not a that's not a thing. If, if you're going to tell me that okay, now Notre Dame has the ability to go out there and just rip a good pass defense up like that, that's going to tell me something that I don't know that we know about this football team. It would answer a lot more yeah. questions. Like here's what. It, Here's what people would say if Notre Dame runs for a bunch of yards on this state. Ah, they're undersized and you're Notre Dame, and this is what you do. You did this to Clemson. Let's see if you can do that to Ohio State. Sure. If Notre Dame goes out there and just rips NC State up throwing a the football, they're going to be like, yo, we we were saying Notre Dame doesn't have any weapons in the pass game. Did you see Chris Tyree go off against NC State? Did you see Tobias Merriweather smoking, you know, Shaheen battle for a touchdown on that post? I mean, well, this Notre Dame team is going to be a problem. Did you see Holden Stace just running by Peyton Wilson on that on that particular over? I mean, Notre Dame's going to be a problem. Because we, they, everybody knows they can run a football. 
right? That's that's how I that's how I take that. That's how I take that. Yeah. I mean, I would also say that I mean, if we're talking about the state of the NC State team, they lost Corey Durden, they lost Drake Thomas, they lost Isaiah Moore. Three of their better run stoppers from last mm-hmm. year, right? If Notre Dame was able to run the ball in them, I could I think a lot of people would chalk it up to they lost some guys, right? Yeah. As far as being run defenders in their front seven. But what they do at bring back to your point is Shaheen Battle and Aiden White are one of the best cornerback duos in college football. I mean, they are. They're mm-hmm. probably what top 10, top 12, top 10 for sure, and definitely part. top three yeah. on the Notre Dame schedule for sure. Yeah, but yeah, I'd say top I mean, 10, a, Ryan. I think that's fair. It's a really yeah. good duo. So if I'm saying Sam Hartman carved them up for 300 plus and threw three to four touchdowns, including one or two of them being against those guys, like. Hello, how are we? Yeah. How are we today? Like, yeah, I think that yeah. would be a much bigger statement in my opinion. This next question is along the same lines, Ryan. At least my answer is going to be along the same lines. So let's go to that one. Irish Gory not. if you could pick one player from all of FBS football who isn't a quarterback to add to Notre Dame, who would it be? Marvin Harrison Jr., easily. I would love to see Sam Hartman throwing to Marvin Harrison Jr. Would love it. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know how you stop this Notre Dame offense if they had a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. throwing in, in the boundary. I just it's very fair. It's I don't fair see fair. how you stop yeah. it. I don't see how you stop yeah. it. He'd be on my short list without question. He's yeah. a really good player, man. I don't even like I'm Brock Bowers be a lot of fun. <laughs> I'd be sure. a lot of fun on this sure. offense. That'd be a whole lot of fun. But because yeah, you could Mark, use him so much differently than how you used Michael Mayer. Like I'm not saying who's better, who's worse, but you could use him almost like a boundary receiver. Like he would have, he would look a lot like Tyler Eifert, how they used him in in 2012 in this offense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think those two guys are the first guys that popped in my head. Like those are, but we're thinking the same thing, right? We both just went immediately with pass catchers, like giving that dynamic pass catcher. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Big body, dynamic pass catcher. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, otherwise, it's like, I, I mean, if you want to give me Jared Verse, take Jared Verse. It sounds great to me. But, like, yeah, I think that that could take the offense over the top, though, to your point. Yeah. So. Right. It's about which position would give you the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. You know, like, does does Marvin Harrison significantly upgrade your receiving core more than Jared Verse recruit your, your improve your D-line? Uh, Harold Perkins yeah. Jr., or somebody like that. Barrett Carter would improve your linebacking core. You know, pick a safety that's really good. And and how would he, you know, the kid from Miami, there's a couple other really good safeties. How would they improve your, you know, your, 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 your uh, safety core. I just think putting a guy like Marvin Harrison jr. On this offense has the biggest upgrade over any other potential upgrade and would make this team really, really hard to defend. Definitely. Absolutely. Yep. Our next question was from Beef Eater ND08. The North Carolina offense coordinator was the Syracuse offense coordinator last year. I thought he called a pretty decent game against us. Any worries about him versus Al Golden tomorrow? No, because I thought Al Golden did a pretty darn good job against him last year. I think he did. So, that was one of Al Golden's better called games, yeah, in my opinion, last year. I agree Syracuse. completely. Yeah. I mean, some of the yeah. stuff that they the some of the stuff that he did that worked, Ryan, was stuff that I don't know that Notre Dame was as prepared for because of it was unique to Carlos Del Rio making some plays off Wilson. script yeah. that I don't yeah, yeah. Car, what did I say yeah Carlos Del Rio Wilson make a plays yeah. off script that that I don't know that Garrett Schrader would have made you they know, also, and, I think I think the offense got into a little bit of of a moment there where they're just like dang we're down by a lot we need to start right. like speeding this up a little take bit some chances I, that's not right. yeah that's a little more out of structure of the offense yes it's still in yeah. structure of the offense but like it's a little more like freelance type of right. feel to the game right I uh, yeah, I agree with you about it. And it was one of Maris Lufau's bat, best games of the year last year. And look, I'm, there was a and it was Brandon off- Joseph's best game by a yeah. landslide. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> he had a second. I was going to say, like, they had another interception in that game that got called back because of an offside penalty that the offside Which was didn't even imp- more impressive than the yes. first one. It was a yes. really nice interception. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The first one, he did his job. He got in the right place, read the quarterback. The quarterback made a dumb throw. The second one was he come off the hash. He plays over the top. They hide load that they high load that receiver perfectly. Benjamin Morrison was underneath the guy. Brandon came over top, picked it off. Maris had a couple big plays in that game. Like to your point, Ryan, I think you nailed it. I think that was one of the best jobs that he did all year. He held that team to 286 yards. I'll tell you something right now. If 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 Syracuse only if NC State only has 286 yards of offense tomorrow. Averages 2.4 yards per per uh, rush and 6.3 yards per pass attempt. This game will look very similar to what last year's game looked like from that final score, but I don't think NC State scores as much as Syracuse yep. did last year. Because the other thing, too, is 
He doesn't have an Aronde Gadsden and a Sean Tucker on this year's team. Does not. He doesn't have a Matthew Bergeron at left tackle on this year's team. He has a better quarterback, in my opinion, no doubt. But the supporting cast, I mean, if you if you could take Brennan Armstrong with Syracuse's supporting cast from last year, I think that presents more problems than Brennan Armstrong with the current NC State supporting cast. That's my opinion. That's fair. That. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one. Here we go. This one is from T- TD Brammy, right? Is how this one is for? I've always kind of gone on. with Todd Brammy, is kind of what I thought Todd it Brammy. was, but I could be wrong okay. on that. Gotcha. If you had a fantasy college football team, what would be your first three picks or maybe a snake draft between your two with quarterback, two wide receivers, two running backs, et cetera? I mean, I would, I would, I would want actually, if I was doing a snake draft and it was like, let's say it was three, four of us in a league or three of us in a league, I'd want the third pick. Cause I feel like, yeah. Cause I feel like if, if we're talking fantasy, I don't really care that Caleb Williams is a better talent than Drake may or Michael Penix. It's about stats, right? And if I could get you know one of those guys, plus then I can get the next best receiver or running back in college football, like something like that. You know, like if I could, let's just say you, I knew that Blake Corum was going to repeat what he did last year. Give me Michael Penix and Blake Corum over Caleb Williams, and then whoever I'm going to get at six. That's how that's how I would look at it. But uh, you know, yeah. I, I would I would take one of those big quarterbacks. You always take a quarterback first if you can in uh, fantasy and after that i mean good again i, I still think marvin harrison is going to put up silly numbers but i might i might consider taking like a like a, a roma dunze or a, a guy from one of the air raid teams that throws the ball a million times i mean that's the thing is we're not talking about who's the best player we're talking about who's going to put up the best numbers yeah so um that's where i would be kind of looking it's also probably a point a ppr league right so like receptions matter mm-hmm. just like the raw yardage yeah. type of thing so some and take some air raid um, guy you know that's going to put up yeah. crazy numbers I, I actually did play in a college football fantasy league one year and so how it kind of works is they only leave it open to power five teams okay. so like you can't go group of five or sure so um, you could like take smu obviously. or i got you yeah. Right. So like I couldn't take like Austin Reed last year, for instance, if I want to take Austin okay. Reed for throwing like four thousand something yards or whatever. But I don't know. I mean I'm I'd just... take a guy at Houston. They're power five now if you had to do that, right? Didn't they have yeah. didn't Nathaniel Dell put up crazy numbers last year? Like for what you know, yeah. yeah. And now he's gone, he correct? And he did he, he, he went pro, gone. correct? But they're he gonna have some gone. kid that's gonna put up silly numbers, you know, this year. Yeah. So I wish I could pick the UTSA crew. They have a couple of reasons I put up stupid numbers, and then Frank Harris yeah. throws for a billion yards. <laughs> yeah, and that's my whole thing is like fantasy wise, unless it's, you know, like give me a Will Rogers who's going to put up a lot of numbers as a lower pick where I can pick a better running back or a better receiver. I think there's like more of a gap between your top five running backs and your, than it is be, in the number 10 running back than there is between the number five quarterback and the number 10 quarterback, which is the way systems sure. are now. Sure. So, you know. It's another reason why I wouldn't really get into fantasy football for college because it's just a different animal. It's like I can't take the best player in the league because he plays in a system that they don't get him the ball as much as this team is going to get over here to his mediocre guy that's going to go undrafted next year but catch 95 passes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like it's yeah. a little different animal. Very different. Yeah. We had a question from John Long who said, mailbag question, please lay out a reasonable stat line for Sam Hartman then lay out a homer stat line for Sam. P.S., Hope Chris Tyree goes off. I love the show. Respect y'all. Appreciate you, John. Ryan, I think what what you and I did this yesterday. I thought, and and I I think I did something like let me let me see. Actually, I think I wrote ours down. I, to be honest with you, I I remember I was nineteen of twenty nine for two seventy eight and two seventy eight and two touchdowns. Yeah, I went twenty one of thirty three for two hundred eighty one yards, three touchdowns and a pick. That's what I went with. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did yesterday. So that's our that's our reasonable stat line. Same as yesterday. Homer stat line. I'm gonna here's the Homer stat line, Ryan. Okay. Total Homer stat line. He goes 18 of 25 for 335 yards and five touchdowns. And he's out of the game pretty early. <laughs> like quarter. Quarter. I mean, because it, it's like yeah. the completions are like bombs. It's just bombs away, right? That's my Homer yeah. stat line. It, yes. He so. threw for four. 407 yards and six touchdowns. Yeah. 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 Yep. 18 to 25 for 355 yards and five touchdowns. How about that? A bunch of fives because three of them are going to go to Tobias Merriweather. That's my, that's my other Homer stat line. How about that? Yeah. 
Yeah. You know? Oh, it's it's like um it's like Randy Moss against um was against Dallas where he had three catches over mm-hmm. 50 yard t- bombs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Three catches, 157, three touchdowns to Bias Merriweather. Write it in ink. Yep, that's our Homer stat line. And and Audric still goes for a buck twenty. So <laughs> Sure. Yeah. But he does so on six carries because he's just right. he's unstoppable force. Four, 14 so. carries. 14 carries is yeah. what he's getting it on. All right. Let's go. Let's keep rolling. Jeff Luke says, Do you think it's better to hold plays in your bag of tricks or use everything and get it on film so teams need to plan for it? We talked about this the other week. I think that it is more beneficial for teams to see it because then it, it's more for them, it's more about I've seen that now. I know that is tangible. I need to make sure I prepare for that than like imagining the unimaginable, right? So I think that getting stuff on film is more beneficial. I'm not saying throw out the kitchen sink necessarily, Jeff, right. but I'm saying don't hold back though if you like a look versus a certain team because then that makes the next team say, oh, it works and now I have to prepare for that. That sucks. That's another thing yeah. I have to add into my practice uh, schedule today. Yep. Uh, Ryan, for me, I'm looking at it like this, man. Um you do what you got to do to win the game. And against Navy and Tennessee State, you can hold some stuff back if you want. I, I'm, I'm with you. General rule, use what you need to use. But I also don't think you do things just to do things in those early games, sure. especially since you're trying to build something. But there's nothing I'm holding back this week against NC State that I think I not, might need to win because I don't want Ohio State to see it. Nothing. Because if I don't win this game, it doesn't matter what we do against Ohio State. I got to win this game. And uh, but yeah, I'm 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 with you. We've talked about this before. I'm definitely a um, let people see it. Make give them a lot more to prepare for. And, and also, there's a there's merit to it. you need to see if this works because there's stuff, Brian. You know this. You'll do stuff in practice. You're like, man, this is plays gonna be great. And then you get into game and you're like, yeah, this didn't work. It didn't work very That's well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Anthony, I Belton, let me hey say, guys. I want to find that out against Tennessee State, Central Michigan, and NC State before I find that out against Ohio State. Is, was my Very last true. point. Sorry. Go ahead. Very true. You're fine. Anthony Bell says, hey, guys, the team can't start looking forward to Ohio State, but we can. What can we look for in the weekend's game that will tell us more about how Notre Dame fare in the Ohio State matchup on September 23rd? I like this one, Ryan. I, I think, number one, if they're very assignment correct in the offensive line, if they're physical and assignment correct, that's going to give me very good vibes that they're going to be able to be physical and assignment correct against Ohio State. Now, Ohio State will present a better physical matchup in the box than NC State will. They'll be bigger. They'll be more athletic. They're going to be better. But if I can handle all the stuff that Tony Gibson's throwing at me from a technical standpoint mm-hmm. and I'm physical, that's going to tell me I can project that to Ohio State. Now, we may not dominate them as much because they're bigger and better, but the the handling the quickness and being able to be assignment correct against these looks will be a very good sign. And if I'm and if I'm if I'm if we're doing things if 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 I'm looking at it from a Notre Dame standpoint, if we're doing things in the pass game, uh, really hurting the corners and hurting the safeties and getting the ball down the field, that's going to make me feel very good about projecting Ohio State for two reasons. Number one, it means we can protect the quarterback against pressures. Number one and number two, it means we can take we can go at with our skill players. We can go out against a talented veteran secondary and do damage. Offensively, those are the two things that I'd say. If you can do that in this game, it doesn't mean you're going to do it against Ohio State. It gives me a greater sense of confidence, however, that those things will translate because of some of the skill and then also schematic things that you're going to see. Ohio State's going to get to those things in a different fashion, but it's still trying to confuse you up front. That's what NC6 will try to do. Create, use your looks and your post-snap movement to create mistakes from your front. Ohio State's going to do something very similar, just out of different you know, structures. And uh, if they can do that, if they can re- – look, if they can out-scheme and out-coach Tony Gibson, it's going to make me think they can do that against anybody. That That's, sure. that's what it boils down to for me. One thing on each side of the ball, I think offensively, if Notre Dame is able to create some big plays in the passing game, that would be a big sign, right? Because I think you're playing against a really a really good cornerback duo. And if you're able to beat Shaheen Battle and Aiden White consistently, I feel good about your chances of beating Denzel Burke and whoever else is at the other side mm-hmm. of the corner for Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Defensively, I want to see the defensive front be able to make a lot of penetration this week because it is a better offensive line than what you've seen the last two weeks. You do have Anthony Bell in the left tackle. You do have Dylan McMahon at center. They're both going to be NFL kids, in my opinion. So you have better quality up front. 
And we know that Ohio State's offensive line is still a work in progress and a lot of question marks, mm-hmm. right? So I think that showing the ability to create pressure is going to be a big thing on the defensive side of the football. I think offensively, if you're able to create some plays in the passing game, some explosive plays, I think that is going to be very translatable to hopefully beating Ohio State. Yep. Good question. Very good question, Anthony. Joel Eaton says, as a coach and or as a player, what was your favorite gadget trick play to run? What types of trick plays tend to be more successful? I mean, it's like with a lot of things, man. It it depends on on your team. You know, there are things you can do with like jet sweeps and reverses. If you've got a Chris Tyree, if you've got a Braden Lindsay, if you've got a guy like that that just doesn't work as well, if you're trying to do it and your best athlete is a Jaden Thomas or, a, you know, you, you, like, like things you can do with Chris Tyree and Braden Lindsay that you're not doing with – like remember in 2017 against Miami when Notre Dame tried to run a reverse to Chase Claypool? Yeah. And you're like, what are you doing? Like that's not going to work against that defense with that guy, right? And what you do it with Braden Lindsay, it's a little bit of a different animal. Right. And then Notre Dame tried to run Jade, Jaden Thomas on jet sweeps last year. You're like, why? Jaden Thomas can do some things really effectively. That ain't it. You're not playing to his strengths as a football player. So um, it just depends. I, I'm not a big g- trick play guy. I, my, what I view as trick plays and gadgets are, are against aggressive coverages and, and something I would use against NC State. Give me some nod and goes. Give me some really hard slant and goes. Like, we really sell the heck out of the slant and go. Yeah. Um, I think those things can can buy you some one on one. Screen and go. Like, yeah. You know, something like that. Post snap yeah. switches yeah. where you're trying to get a, a, a wheel route free with Chris Tyree or a back out of the backfield. Like, if I'm, if I've got Jamer- Jeremiah Love in the game and I feel like I can go with a reduced look, if I, if I feel like I know certain situations where I can get them in man and I can do like a redensed X look. Mm-hmm and run that guy and over to take the corner out, and that's going to get me, Jeremiah Love, isolated against a linebacker, I'm taking that shot at least once in this game, right? Like, right. those to me are, you know, my version of trick plays. Uh, I don't view reverses as trick plays because I'm not calling that's- reverse unless schematically it makes sense. They're overplaying it. We have it built into our game plan every week, and if they're going to overplay and not respect the backside when we run stretch or outside zone, then we're going to come back with a reverse and hurt you with it. Like, that's yeah. not a trick play to me. That's that's no different than running a bootleg to me. Right. And I would coach it that way. Trick plays yeah. to me are throwbacks. I toss a ball. He throws it back to the quarterback. You know, the reverse pa- the pass where I throw it backwards and that guy's got to throw it downfield. Those are trick yeah. plays to me. And honestly, I don't love those. Because I don't remember. Yeah, I mean, those. <laughs> out, but honestly, outside of that game, Ryan, when have we yeah. ever seen that work in a big game? Statue of Liberty, I've never seen it work in a big game. And like yeah. the, the the pass where you're throwing a backwards pass, the guy catches it and throws it down for you. Like when when have I seen that work in a big game? I don't know that I could point to you know, times where I've seen that a whole lot. You know what does work surprisingly decently consistent from my, my viewing at least is uh is um the um the uh, uh shoot, why, why can't I think of it now? Or a wide receiver catches it and then flips it back to a receiver coming under, coming under, coming underneath. Oh, like it's a hook and nuts. ladder type of thing. Like a hook and ladder, yeah. Like a hook yeah. and ladder actually works a decent amount from my experience yeah. watching college football and the NFL. It's just kind of weird, but yeah. we lost the game my last year coaching football. No, we didn't lose the game. We ended up winning the game in overtime, but we were busting this team's butt. And then they came back and they hit a hook and ladder on us for seventy yard touchdown wow. to to tie the game with like. Seven seconds left. It was wow. gross, man. It was gross. That's we were playing, wild. Brian, we were playing cover four. Nothing in behind you. Somehow, for some reason, the corner bit up on this little, like, in cut. And then, yeah, out the back door. It was fantastic. Fantastic. That's um, That'd be a tough way to lose. That'd be a tough yes. way to lose. Oh, we actually ended up winning. But that was a tough way to go to overtime with. It was not great. So, yeah. Ryan, I'm going to read this one because I want to get your answer on it. I've, I've answered this in the past, and I'm very curious to get your answer. This is from Sahil Rai. Hey, Coach and Ryan, could you talk about the difference in the number of reads a high school versus college versus NFL quarterbacks have to make, and is that the most important factor in QB evaluating? Is that the most important factor? No. From a high school level, I wouldn't say the most important factor, no, because – there's a lot of high schoolers that just aren't asked to do as much of this. And it's a very, so there's like such a, this is such a long and nuanced answer to me, right? Because what system am I running? Right. And what, what, what type of 
wide receiver crew am I working with? I mean, there's just so many different types of reads that happen. There's half field reads, there's full field reads, there's high lows. I mean, it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's standardized is basically what I'm trying to say here for me. There's going to be some high school teams like the St. John Bosco's of the world, right? The, the schools that have great coaching staffs that they go through a legitimate read, right? Like one, two, three, check that. But where there's some schools that are just purely based one read offenses or RPO systems where it's like, I'm doing one read and I'm getting the ball out. So, you know, whether it's my hand the ball off, get the ball out that way, or I'm going to go through my reads in, in that specific way. So I think it becomes more prevalent and more important the older you get into college. Cause there's some college systems that are also one read offenses or limited read offenses. NFL is where it really starts to change the narrative because everyone is so much more athletic that you have to legitimately go through those reads consistently to make those plays. So it's nice if a younger player is given that responsibility, but at high school level, like there's just very few teams that I look at and say, that team is going through a full progression. It rarely ever happens. A lot of times it's a half field read more than a full, full, full field read. So it matters, but it matters the more you get older. And players can figure that out and players learn from that as obviously the more experience they get. So I don't think that it's it, from the evaluation perspective from high school to college. I just look at if a, guy, a kid like has a, gen, a, a good understanding of spacing and where things are coming open and getting through the reads that they're asked to get into. I'm not going to hold it against a high school football recruit as a quarterback. If they go through one to two reads on, on every given play, because that's just the offense that they're in. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they can only do at the next level. So it gets more prevalent and more important, the older you get, in my opinion. All right. We had another question from Andrew Kenyu says, if the goal for Notre Dame football is winning championships, do you think it's fair for a football team to hold ourselves to the standard of teams like Georgia and Alabama? No, I don't because you're, you're not recognizing where Notre Dame is in their process to winning a championship. You're, you're, you have to focus on compare them to Georgia and Alabama. Sure. Compare them to where those teams were during their climb to a championship, right? Like Nick Saban didn't just come in in year one and win a title. He won a title in year three. They went seven and six in year one. Pretty good team the next year. Then got embarrassed in their last two games of the season. And they came out the next year and won a championship. Yeah. And and so it's all about the climb. And Notre Dame has certain hurdles it has to clear first before you can start holding it to a standard of Georgia and Alabama. The second part of that, Ryan, is – the problem, if I were to say yes, is I think a lot of fans have an unrealistic expectation of what it means to be like Georgia and Alabama. And here's the perfect example is I've seen people say this week many times, actually, well, Georgia wouldn't be worried about NC State. And I would say, well, no, actually, you're incorrect there. Number one, a team like Notre Dame should never worry about anybody. Being respectful of your opponent is not about worrying about your opponent, number one. Number two, uh, yeah, they should be because of what we've seen. And I've pointed this out. Georgia made their first uh, uh, college football playoff game in 2017. That's when Georgia began their climb. It was in 2017, right? That year, Georgia went on the road and played Auburn and got beat by 23. They got pounded in that game. Now, they came back and got a win later, but they had some rough moments. The next year, Georgia had a pretty good team, but they went out and got their butts kicked by LSU on the road. That was pre-2019 LSU. And then lost a game to Bama where they choked it away and then got beat by Texas in a bowl game. Come out 2019, pretty good Georgia team. Uh, they lost a game at home to a South Carolina team that finished 4-8. and eight. Well, then starting kind of in 2020, you know, they lost to Bama, they lost to Florida, and they really got good in 2021. They won a national championship, went, went really good team, right? They barely beat a Clemson team that was not very good 10-3 to that season. That's it, 10-3. to They went out in some other games, didn't really perform overly great, got blasted by Alabama, but you know what they did? They handled their business. They did what they needed to do. They got payback against Alabama and won a championship. Last year they come out as the defending champions, and they start off kind of well. They play sloppy football against Kent State. They only beat Kent State by 17 points. So Georgia, last year, as the defending national champions, beat Kent State by fewer points than most of you think Notre Dame should beat NC State by. 
right? So uh, if you're next week, you come out the very next week, they beat Missouri by four in a game where Missouri led the most, almost the entire game. Then about a month later, they play Kentucky and have a really ugly 16 to six road win at Kentucky. So Andrew, to answer your question, and I mean this sincerely, if you're going to say, Hey, look, you're Notre Dame, you should evaluate yourself the same way you do Alabama and, and Georgia. I would say big picture wise, yes, that's who Notre Dame should be. But when you get down to the nitty gritty of evaluating who they are week to week, people that say, well, Georgia wouldn't be worried about NC State. And, and my whole point is, yeah, they would respect NC State. And if they didn't, then they would have close games. The other thing is you don't bring your A game every week. Nobody does. Georgia doesn't. Bama doesn't. Ohio State doesn't. I could point to plenty of times that first title team that Alabama had in 2009. They needed two block kicks from Terrence Cody to beat a 7-6 and six Tennessee team 12-10. to 10. Right, so the the issue that I would have is that so many people that say, "Hey, I compare myself to Georgia," then you think in your head, and maybe you're not this way, Andrew. That well, if we're like Georgia, then we should go out there and blow out a team like NC State. What evidence do you have that every time Georgia plays a team like this, they blow them out? Because I have evidence that says the exact opposite. I have evidence that says Georgia doesn't always blow those teams out. Georgia, as I said last year, Kent State, thirty-nine to twenty-two game, Missouri, twenty-six to twenty-two, Kentucky, sixteen to ten. Those are all teams that are on or below NC State's level. So the key to me is the standard is winning. And then as a head coach, as a coach, you evaluate the process. If we if we didn't win a, a, a game with the playing our, our A level, then obviously we still have things to strive for and to work for and to get better at. And those are the things that you continue to build on. But if you're going to talk to me about holding yourself to that standard – we would have to have a conversation about what that standard is. And at the end of the day, that standard is, is how you go about your business on a daily basis. And then also making sure that you're going out there and you're, you're winning games. But this, the, the, too often there's this notion that that standard means that I'm going out there and I'm dominating everybody. That's not Georgia. So if I'm Georgia, I'm dominating everyone, not named Bama and Ohio state, or I'm dominate. And that's just not reality. And I could go through, you know, all the teams that have won championships in recent years, and I'll I'll give you examples. I can absolutely give you examples. I just gave you some about Georgia, and I've said this before. The only non-COVID team I've seen really do that – actually, I haven't seen a non-COVID team do that. And even then, uh, Alabama need only beat a, a four-loss Flor- Georgia, Florida team in the SEC title game by four, six points. That's it. But you look at 2019 LSU. I've talked about this. Um, they beat Texas by a touchdown. That's it. They're 40, a, a, a Texas team that went eight and five. They beat them by a touchdown, 45 to 38. They did not bring their A game that it, it, at all in that game. That same year, they beat a decent Auburn team that went nine and four. That Auburn team lost to LSU, lost to Florida, lost to Georgia, lost to Minnesota in a bowl game. That team beat the LSU, beat them, but it was 23 to 20. They didn't bring their A game, they got it done. Right, 2018 Clemson. That's a one of the best teams of this past decade. They needed a comeback to beat Syracuse that season. They had to come back and beat Syracuse. They went on the road and only beat Texas A&M by two points. That wasn't a great Texas A&M team that year. That Texas A&M team went nine and four. They were okay. They got blown out by Alabama. Got beat by two touchdowns by Mississippi State. Got beat by Auburn. That was not a great football team in my opinion, that season. They're a good football team, but not a great one. And and that team gave Clemson everything that they could handle that season. So I remember Clemson that year going on the road and playing Boston College. They won 27-7, to but it was an ugly game. But they got it done. They did what they needed to do to get it done. So I, I could do this I could do this all day and go back and point to these teams that you're just like, man, that how did that team struggle? I go back to 2001 Miami, if I remember correctly. They had like a really ugly – a uh, really ugly win over, I think it was Boston College, where like Ed Reed returns a fumble for a touchdown, and you're like, man, that, of all the teams you played that year, that team gave you the toughest test. I'm like, okay, that, that's kind of interesting, you know. So uh, you just go through the years. Uh, 2017, uh, Alabama beat Florida State 24 to seven, just a 17 point win. Again, a lot worse, you know, a lot. People expect Notre Dame to beat NC State by a lot more. That Alabama, that Florida State team that year went seven and six. A week after losing to Bama, they lost to North Carolina State. Lost to Boston College that year, 35 to three. And Bama beat them by 17 points. That's it. 
right? So, I mean, we could, we could kind of, I could keep doing, like I said, I could do this all day. The key is having an, a, a realistic ex- expectation of what it means to hold yourself to that standard. And in that regard, then I could say we could have a conversation about it. Going to get to these last few questions. Ryan's power is completely out. Uh, so we're going to get these last few questions and then, and then wrap things up today. We have a super chat here from Corey Flynn. Many fans have had, have hand, had hand sign. Excuse me. Let me try this again. Many fans have hand signs that do that Texas with horns up. How about our fans doing fists up fighting Irish style, like the leprechaun logo, even saying fists up on the video screen thoughts. I don't know that I'd want to do like this. I think that's kind of, I don't know if that would be something to me. Uh, I, I'd be, I'd be up to something like that. I, you know, I, I've never really gotten into the whole horns up, horns down thing. I'm just, I've never, you know, you see all these coaches on recruiting visits doing these like little hand signs with recruits. I mean, I don't really care about that. Like, you know, mine would be this. We're, we're Notre Dame. We're the best team out there. So um, I, I, that's not really my thing, Corey. But if, you know, if Notre Dame, if, 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 um, like if the players, if, if the program came up with something cool like that and, and, and it was the kids adopted it, I'd, I'd be fine with that. It just, you wouldn't like see me doing it, but that, that'd still be fun to be fun to kind of have something unique. So like part of me, like I, I, I appreciate the uniqueness of it, but it's still just not my thing. I'm, I'm old. So it's still not, still not kind of my thing. I'll get down to a couple questions here. I want to, uh, I did want to address. Uh, this is one from Anthony Bell. He said, there's much commentary that Notre Dame shouldn't have a full vote in the ACC. Aside from the reality that Notre Dame is one of the biggest powers in the ACC, do you personally feel it should have a full vote? They should absolutely have a full vote for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's what the ACC agreed to to even get Notre Dame in the league. If they didn't agree to that, then Notre Dame wouldn't have joined the league. This notion that, well, you know, ACC saved Notre Dame. Guys, Notre Dame did as much for the ACC in 2020 as the ACC did for Notre Dame. Uh, number three is having Notre Dame in your league has been a huge benefit to the ACC. And, you know, this notion that, well, they shouldn't have a full vote, right? That's just silly. And the last thing is, is it benefits Notre Dame that the ACC be effective and be successful. And so why would you not want a team? They, 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 they're doing things for your best interest. I saw a silly article today that I just thought made no sense and just like dismissed Notre Dame's role in bringing in Cal and Stanford and SMU. And I'm like, this is why the ACC is dying because there's too many people that believe this about the ACC. That's just utter nonsense in my opinion and uh, not really helpful or, or productive. And it just, it shows a pettiness and a lack of understanding of the current landscape and doesn't really address, you know, some potential issues that could be there. I think there's a, some certain reasons to kind of have some beef with that. But the reality is, is you all agreed to that when you brought Notre Dame in. So why are you crying about it now? Uh, and if you want to play that game and say, okay, cool, take Notre Dame's vote away. But here's what you do. Let Notre Dame out of the ACC contract. Go for it. And then see what happens to your league when you when, when Notre Dame removes. Because if you don't let Notre Dame have a full vote, then guess what, folks? Notre Dame's going to leave. And you don't want that. That would not be good for the ACC. That would not be good at all. If Notre Dame doesn't play NC State this year, does anybody nationally give a crap about who NC State plays? Does anybody care about any game on NC State's schedule other than this one from a national standpoint? No, they don't. So um, here's a thought. Get better. Use Notre Dame as a standard to say, hey, we're gonna, we've are gonna we got to get better, and if we can start beating Notre Dame consistently, then our league's going to be really flipping good. And focus on that instead of crying about, you know, about Notre Dame. I just think it's – petty and childish and just speaks to why the ACC is just a really just a dying league in my opinion. So they just need, they need some tougher people in chart and position of power. And that's something I actually like what Jim Phillips has done. There's just too many media people and some school presidents that are just very weak minded in my opinion. And that holds the ACC back a little bit. So anyway, that's going to do it for today's show. Everybody, we've got someone out here apparently doing some yard work outside my parents' house and it's very loud. So we're going to go ahead and wrap things up there. We will be back tomorrow for our post-game show. Vince and Ryan will start things off, and then I'll join when I get back from the stadium. So we'll have that after the Notre Dame game. We'll probably go live about 10 or 15 minutes at the conclusion of the Notre Dame game, so definitely be ready for that. Vince and I will probably have our upon further review on Sunday night. That's the plan as of right now. I mean, sometimes things happen, but that's our plan as of right now is to go live at 8 o'clock on Sunday night, breaking things down after we've been able to – 
dive into the film a little bit. So definitely be ready to check that out. But uh, for the rest of the day, y'all just get on the message board. Let's keep this conversation going. I'm going to hit the road, start traveling, heading down to uh, good old Raleigh and be ready for tomorrow's noon kickoff between Notre Dame and NC State. So before you leave, folks, do me a favor. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Share this podcast. If you're listening to a uh, us via podcast platform, we would greatly appreciate a five-star review. And, of course, if you have not done so already, sign up for the message boards at boars.arsbreakdown.com. I'm telling you, you will not regret it. Talk to you all very soon. Thanks for joining us on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.